kind of a peace do I mean and what kind of a peace do we seek? Not merely peace in our time. Peace, peace in all time. <clears throat> to our video creators. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to this Peace Tech Summit, Engineering a Durable Peace. We've got a rich and a full day, chock full of many of my personal heroes in this field. So I'm going to be very short to get us started here. I'm Sheldon Himmelfarb. Yes, that's my real name, Sheldon Himmelfarb. And I manage USIP's Peace Tech work, which that means our efforts to use media, tech, and data for conflict management and peace building. And as you're going to hear in a few minutes from our chairman, this has become a priority area for USIP because it cuts right across everything everybody in this organization does. There is not a single problem that we work on in this building, whether it's preventing election violence or inter-ethnic dialogue or land and water disputes, you name it. There's not a single issue that we're not seeing efforts to inflect it using new media and technology. But the results, as you saw very clearly from that video, the results have been mixed. I'll be presenting some data later on about the lack of impact to date and why that is. Because we at USIP, we have a responsibility, indeed a, char a charge from Congress to ask the question, why is that? Why are we not having the impact that we could from this brave new world of peace tech? More to the point, what can we be doing to improve the results and save more lives? And that's what today is all about. And we're honored to have as our partners in this, searching for answers with us, the National Academy of Engineering, which is celebrating its 50th year anniversary this year, its 50th anniversary this year, and whose members have made the most extraordinary contributions to humanity around the globe. We in peace building, have much to learn from their unrelenting drive for solutions to complex problems. We've already learned a lot in our partnership over the last few years. And we'll hear more of their insights today from several of the Academy members who will be speaking. OK, in a moment, I'm going to turn the podium over to leaders of both USIP and the, and the Academy. But first, a little bit of housekeeping. We are live webcasting across the globe on USIP.org. So to those of you in our online audience, lean in. Remember, you can ask questions and interact with the panelists um, and each other on Twitter at hashtag PeaceTech. Secondly, for those of you who are spending the day with us here, Please don't ask, don't hesitate to ask any of the USIP staff that you see floating around to help you with anything that will make your day more valuable. Quiet corners to make phone calls, directions to restrooms, local bars, whatever it is. We know how hard it is for you to get time out of your busy schedules to come here and spend this, this day with us. Um, I used to say that we wanted the day that you spent with us to be at least as productive as the day you spend in your own office. And then somebody came up to me and said, Sheldon, that's really not a very high bar <laughs> to, be, to be setting. So let us help you make it even more productive. OK, last piece of housekeeping, buckle your seatbelts. After the remarks of our leaders, you're going to have um, the wonderful Nancy Payne of the Peace Tech Initiative is going to jump up and take this podium. And she's going to take us straight into a lightning round of 13 fast presentations on technologies you should know about because they're having great promise in the countries where we work. This is not going to be a dull day, I promise you. And with that, remember how I mentioned at the start my personal heroes in the peace building field a few minutes ago? Well, it's my truly great pleasure right now to turn the podium over to one of them, someone who has not only served on USIP's board three different occasions in our 30-year history, but also served as National Security Advisor. Please welcome USIP's Chairman of the Board, Steve Hadley.
Good morning, everybody. We're just delighted that you all took, as Sheldon said, time from your day to be here, and I think uh, it is going to turn out to be time well spent. Um, on behalf of the United States Institute of Peace, therefore, I want to welcome you not only on behalf of the Institute, but also on behalf of our invaluable partner in this effort, the National Academy of Engineering. Uh, this uh, Peace Tech Summit grows out of a unique collaboration uh, and a unique partnership with the Academy over the last several years called the Roundtable on Technology, Science, and Peacebuilding. This is an interagency, interdisciplinary, public-private partnership that has been addressing many of the issues that we will be discussing today. And in a moment, I will introduce the president of the Academy, Dan Mote, who will offer his thoughts on the summit and say a bit more about the theme for today, Engineering Durable Peace. But first, let me say that I am pleased to be here, not only as the official representative of the host organization, but also because I believe so strongly that our peace take emphasis must be a component of all our peace building efforts here at the Institute. As the video made clear, our world is ablaze with serious conflicts playing out virtually all over the globe. It is also being transformed by the spread of cell phones and social media, the strategic positioning of networks and data, and the growing competition between those who would exploit these media to empower people and advance freedom, and those who would use them to oppress people and to maintain state control. I believe that we cannot prevent or reduce deadly conflict or construct durable institutions of peace in the 21st century without enlisting these new technologies to the task. But in the same way that these tools can be both agents of liberation and agents of oppression, we need to recognize that these various capabilities can both mitigate violent conflict, but also can encourage violent conflict. And our task is to develop strategies to accomplish the more peaceful outcomes. For these reasons, the peace tech emphasis has been fully embraced by USIP, both by supporting the programs of the peace tech group itself and by encouraging ways in which all aspects of USIP's work can be enabled by these tools and technologies. In fact, the USIP Board of Directors believes so strongly in this effort that we voted at our July meeting to approve the creation of a new Peace Tech Laboratory, a spin-off from the Institute that will be centered in one of the two buildings on Navy Hill uh, behind the USIP headquarters. The lab will operationalize the same cross-disciplinary collaboration that the USIP National Academy's Roundtable has represented. A place where engineers, technologists, and data scientists work alongside USIP's experts in conflict and peace building to address conflicts and save lives. Sheldon Himmelfarb will give a fuller outline of this strategy and this uh, proposal and the plans for the labs at the end of the summit. But this is one very concrete example of how important we think these initiatives will be. Let me turn the podium over now to our partner for the summit, the president of the National Academy of Engineering, Dan Mote. Dan assumed this position in July of last year after serving for 12 years as president of the University of Maryland, where he remains on leave as Regents Professor. Dan, welcome.
Well, thank you very much, Steve, for that uh, very generous uh, introduction, and thank you for your applause. I always like getting applause before I speak. That, that way it ensures you get some. Anyway, uh, and, uh, and Sheldon, thank you very much for, for not just your presentation today and, and all your work putting this together, but for putting your soul into this so, so deeply, and that's what it takes to make these work. It's really my pleasure to join uh, uh, you, Steve, and, uh, and all of you today in this Peace Tech Summit. Um, we, we have really chosen this theme uh, of the summit, uh, Engineering a Durable Peace, really with careful deliberation. Uh, it's, a, it's, central, it's the central premise uh, to that of the roundtable that engineering science and derivative uh, technologies can bring valuable assets to this peace building process. And I think that's probably directly uh, apparent to all of you, in fact. Really, to appreciate the nature of these assets, we really need to understand what they are, uh, how they were created, and possibly the roles that science and engineering play in them. The essence of science is discovery and understanding of the world around us. Science is all about getting understanding right. The essence of engineering is creating solutions to problems of people in society. Engineering is all about getting solutions that work. Technology, as is commonly used today, is a catch-all term used to describe the technical outcome derived from many areas, including engineering and science, among others. Engineering is a human endeavor that creates solutions that meet the needs and wants of people in society. Many people think of engineering as in terms of things, artifacts, computers, cell phones, and other electronic devices, or aircraft, water treatment plants, power generation systems, pharmaceuticals, and so forth. However, we should look at these as solutions to human problems, not just things. The things are the pathway. The problems are the destination. Engineering solves problems using whatever it takes to do so. Science, ingenuity, imagination, guesswork, empiricism, experiments, experience, modeling, trial and error, whatever it takes. Science, scientific knowledge is very important when it exists. However, often it doesn't cover all that is needed to solve the problems when it does. If the Egyptians had waited for science, they never would have built pyramids. An important element of engineering problem solving is systems thinking and analysis. Through experience and by training, engineers learn how to break down the elements of complex problems, examining their interrelationships and their relations with other kind of socio-technical issues. You can think of them in terms of building blocks of systems. Peace building is a natural domain for systems thinking, given the complex interplays of the building blocks, stakeholders, human and material resources, technological infrastructures, politics, cultures, and so forth. Engineering is problem solving. Technology is a technical outcome from wherever it derives. Science is understanding the world around us. Although technology, engineering, and science have not been thought of as first order tools for building peace, they cannot be avoided as a matter of fact. Indeed, over the past few years, the Roundtable has validated important contributions of engineering to peace building in several areas. Through workshops and other activities, we have brought together engineers, computer scientists, social scientists, and peace builders to tackle significant challenges and opportunities. We have advised the design of data sharing systems to create more effective coordination in conflict zones and to promote the participation of federal agencies and non-federal organizations in peace building. We have identified opportunities to use information technologies creatively to sense emerging and ongoing conflicts and provide better information and analysis that can be used to prevent violent, violent and deadly conflicts. And we have illustrated how systems engineering can enable more effective planning, coordination, management, and evaluation of peace building activities through a structured development process that identifies needs, functionality, and requirements for success as stakeholders proceed from concept to design to operation. In short, the objective of this collaboration is to help make peace building a more strategic, systematic, and technical enterprise in keeping with the human core of the problems that we address. After all, engineering solutions serve people, so this should be no revelation to anybody. In the process, through increased focus on 
global grand societal challenges such as energy, sustainability, security, and peace building, and through the curricula of our engineering schools in this country and abroad, and through organizations just like Engineers Without Borders, which is one of my all-time favorites, we hope to energize new generations of dedicated engineers around the globe in this peace building process. So congratulations on, on, this, on the efforts so far and, and, and best wishes for this summit and what's going forward. Sheldon and all of you, together, all of us together, I'd say thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Mote uh, and Mr. Hadley. Uh, thank, and glad to see all of you here. It's a good room full of energized and engaged people because that's really what this next session is all about. We're going to show you, as Sheldon said, a, a range of applications, ideas, capabilities that really capture the energy and the innovation that engineering and, and technology can bring to the, the peace building field. So we want you to use this session to really kickstart your own creativity. Um, we definitely have a room full of, of innovators and smart thinkers here, so, so start uh, thinking of your own ideas as you start to hear these different presentations. They're going to give you a sense of what's new, um, and we also want them to plant the seed for uh, what might be um, new ways and better ways to be able to leverage peace tech for conflict prevention. So this lightning round format is really rapid fire. Uh, brevity is, is a virtue uh, here. So to all of our speakers, um, we are going to have 13. These are going to go really fast. Um, they have a, they're on a timer. Um, they've got five minutes each. So please don't think us rude if, uh, if you hear us uh, call out or, or ring a bell um, uh, when, when the time is to go off the stage. Um, but two broad themes. You're going to hear two broad themes in this. One is the power of data for decision making. And the other one is uh, innovation um, through engagement at the local level. Those are two really critical uh, components of this whole idea around peace tech. Um, you're, you've got the full list of, uh, list of speakers um, and their topics on your agenda, and there's also bios available. So I think all of you probably picked them up, so you're going to hear a little bit, uh, so you can read a little bit more about them. Um, and as the song and my boss, Sheldon Himmelfarb, always says, we've got a long way to go and a short time to get there. So let's get started. And we're going to start with um, Call of Lee Teru, uh, and he's going to be talking about GDELT. Isn't it funny? We all call them clickers. <laughs> there you go. Thank you. And it should be. Ah, there we go. Awesome. Excellent. All right, so I'm going to cover a lot of ground really fast, so, so hang on. Um, so anyway, so this is, my, this is my, there we go. So this is my dream, a single room that fuses a dashboard of global human society, that fuses all available information around the world into a single room. Let's just observe the world. Um, and this is taking the first steps towards reality. Uh, this is actually, this is not a Photoshopped image. This is an actual photograph of a floating sphere showing protests and violence around the world by day over the last 35 years, showing world history right in front of your very eyes. But how can we catalog human society? You know, how do we make a list of, of every protest around the world each day, a violence around the world each day? Uh, well, the goal of this project, the GDOM project, is really about monitoring all open information, news, social, academic literature, anything that's open around the world, codify that by computer so we can translate the news each day, the textual news, uh, into an actual map that we can, uh, that we can understand, visualize, analyze. Um, so it does two things. One is to take a textual news article. Um, so basically a textual, you know, a, a description here, actually codify that and make that into a quantitative database entry. So you go from text, a description that Iraqi leaders are criticizing Turkey for bombing bombing Kurdish militants, and this becomes database entries that we can then transform, we can map. This is actually a, a map actually of Egypt um, when it destabilized again last year. We can actually watch in real time uh, through the eyes of, of all available open media what's happening in a country moment by moment. We can combine that then with the people, organization, groups, and views that are behind the news each day. Um, this map on the left here, this was Ukraine the day the president fled. And you can see Crimea lighting up, all kinds of things happening there. T uh, massively pro-Russian uh, sentiment, massively uh, turning against uh, the government camp, really, really lighting up. 
Um, and, and then this map actually was very interesting because at the time period, I got a lot of reaction to this map. This can't possibly be the case. The president just signed a peace deal with the protesters. Uh, you know, the country is at peace now. Um, and of course, you know, we all know what really happened. So to me, data is not perfect. There is no perfect record of everything happening in society each day. But this can play devil's advocate for us. Same thing in countries like Nigeria. We can actually watch, uh, animate it second by second. Um, what's happening, what, at least through the eyes of open information? Uh, what's happening in the country? What are the ebbs and flows uh, going back decades in the country? We can make reports that show us at a glance what are some of the major trends? What are areas of countries that are destabilizing or restabilizing across the world? Uh, we can make influencer graphs. These are actually ground truth influencer graphs. You can go in and say, you know, the oil and gas industry in Nigeria, the agricultural uh, industry uh, in South Africa. Um, who are the influencers in those? Business leaders, uh, po politicians, um, external influencers within that. You actually get back lists of who are sort of the controlling interests. So if you're trying to do peace building, if you're trying to interact, you know, you have the people you're interacting with, but how do you sort of, how do you enter new areas? How do you understand what that landscape looks like? Um, how can we track out uh, global leaders over time? Actually make a, pop a real time population, uh, a real time popularity and stability index for the world's leaders. So understand what are the areas of, of greatest emerging instability that we might not be seeing at this moment? How can we take terror and criminal groups and actually make real time footprints of them second by second um, through the eyes of the world? Someone, you know, some border town says, you know, hey, you know, we've been seeing more and more drug trafficking trucks going by uh, the last few weeks, uh, you know, much more than usual. How do we observe that and map that and, and basically flag areas for others to look at. Um, how can we essentially take every person mentioned in the world in a large fraction of the world's news media uh, and make a single network diagram that shows how all the world is interconnected uh, at a moment? Um, this is an enormous uh, for, uh, next step. You actually are, this is um, uh, just debuted this past week. Um, taking all of JSTOR, all of DTIC, on class, D class, and all of the Internet Archives holdings uh, of, the, of the open web since 1996. How do we process all that for anything that's academic literature on Africa and the Middle East? Codify all that so you can drill down and say, uh, in this particular area, what's known about that area? What are the conflicts in other areas there? Uh, and again, being able to inform, you know, if you're working with local peace bills in the area, what are the rest of the world saying about this? Uh, you know, how do, we how do we map out global protest activity over time and see that, yes, post-Arab Spring, at least through the eyes of the world's news media, protest activity is dramatically increasing, but compared to the, you know, to the fall of the Soviet Union, very calm. How do we drill in uh, and see a country like Ukraine and actually watch and say, what's happening now is compared to the, to the past? The support of U.S. Institute of Peace. How do we make a, a large map, essentially, real time? What are the major uh, events, the major conflict that's occurring around the world, and how is it spreading through the eyes of the news media? Um, how do we undercover the underlying trends of the global society? How do we actually get at the mathematical formulas that actually show us, at least through the eyes of the news media, um, what are, what are, what, what's happening around the world? What are the patterns there? And how do we use this to forecast the future? Uh, and through the support of the National Academies, uh, Keck Futures Initiative, how do we actually then take this to decision makers? Take all these fancy, all this fancy data and actually put that in front of policy makers so they can make more informed decisions. Uh, and again, going back to, to my vision, essentially bringing all this together, allowing us to take all the world's information, open information, fuse that together in ways that are actionable and can inform policy. Thank you very much. All right, nice. Thank you, Carl. Next up, we've got uh, Anyai Ayala Aichi from Internews. Ani, take it away, please. I'm trying to figure out, oh, here. Hi, so um, what I want to be talking about today is uh, uh, something much more related with uh, what Internews does, which is normally uh, media development and uh, sometimes also humanitarian information, and how by chance we ended up also doing a peace building project. So uh, the first thing that I want to explain is uh, a concept that journalists are very familiar with, which is the concept of a third place. A third place in journalism is a public place where people hang out. It's, a, it's part of the daily life. It's, it's part of, you know, for example, going to a bus stop. That's a third place. You find a lot of people there. They hang out. They talk about different things. They're not there because they want to meet each other, but they meet each other in this place. This is an example of a third place. This is how people were recharging phones during the Gaza war. It was during using batteries from their cars, and they would hang out and be all around the car and chat and discuss about what was going on. 
A second concept I want to explain is the concept of white spaces. Now, this is a concept that is more related to business. And a white space is normally considered a place within a company or in a startup where people can interact and think in a different ways because there are less rules they have to abide to. So normally authority is very fuzzy, there's no rules, people can think in a different way, and that's the reason why, for example, a lot of startup companies are trying to build their own spaces as white spaces so that people can think in a different way and be more innovative. Now, this is an example of a white space, and uh, the reason why this is a white space is that this is uh, a radio studio uh, that we have set up in Ramallah, where journalists are talking about uh, the needs of the population in Gaza, and I will explain to you later why this is a white space where normally it wouldn't be. So, of course, this is uh, Gaza, as it looks like right now, um, and the reason why I'm talking about Gaza, why I'm talking about all of these different concepts is also the same reason why I'm really jet-lagged, which is that I just flew back from Ramallah, where Internews has been doing this project, specifically looking at the humanitarian crisis. Now, one of the things that is really important to understand about the conflict that happened in Gaza, which, by the way, this war is the third war in a span of five years, is that this is not necessarily only a conflict about politics, it's not only a conflict about resources, it's a conflict about identity. The identity of the two groups involved in this conflict is threatened by the very existence of the other group. This also creates a situation where the narrative within each group is only and can only be one. If you have a different narrative within your own group, you're threatening your own existence and the existence of your community. What this means is that the narrative that is being built is the only one that you can adopt as part of that group. And this is valid both in Israel and in Palestine. You cannot have a different narrative than us versus them, because if you have a different narrative than that, then you're threatening your own existence. Now, when Internews went to um, Gaza to start implementing this project, we were not interested in talking about the conflict. We were interested in talking about the humanitarian crisis, which means that we started focusing on something that it's not in my slides. <laughs> That's good, perfect, I'll go on anyway. So we started focusing on the, um, on the needs of the, uh, of the population, which means that we started asking people, what is that you actually need? Do you need water? Do you need food? Where can you go to find all of these things? And when we started focusing on that, narrative, we suddenly realized that when we started building an ecosystem that had Facebook and Twitter and SMS, we suddenly started seeing a different type of conversation. People were not talking anymore about us versus them. People started talking about what do we need? How do we build a better future? What's, what's out there? What can, we, what can we do? And so suddenly we realized that the space that we had created, the virtual space, especially on social media, was a third place. People wanted to hang out there because it was nice, because they didn't have to be us versus them. They could just be themselves. And some of our journalists came to us and said, this is the first time in our life where we can actually be journalists without having to choose in between being a journalist and being a Palestinian. And so the question I, I want to leave you with is, can we use the internet and specifically can we use social media to create a space that allows people to create a different narrative within a conflict? Okay. Thanks, 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 It is not technology without a glitch. I apologize for that. Uh, Rachel Brown from Cincinnati Niamani. That's me. Um, great. So today I want to talk to you all about a case study in building local level resilience to incitement. Um, I'm going to talk about Sisi Niamani, which is an organization that I founded and ran in Kenya from 2010 to 2014. And the organization was founded in the aftermath of Kenya's 2007-2008 post-election violence. Um, Election-related violence was not unusual or new in Kenya, but the breadth, the geographical spread, and the duration of violence was something very new. It lasted more than a month, it took the lives of over 1,000 people, and killed hundreds of thousands. And a lot of things uh, contributed to this, and a lot of factors were in play. Um, and one thing that played a really big role was mobile phones. Mobile phones really changed the way that communication around conflict was happening in Kenya. 
Um, they allowed people to communicate faster. They allowed people to communicate over a wider geographical spread from cities to rural areas about what was happening. And they were used to spread rumors, to incite people to violence, and even to actually organize for people to gather in specific places for weapons distribution and for attacks. Sisini Amani was founded with the recognition that communication was being used very effectively by violent actors to incite violence, and that violent actors had really understood and capitalized on this new entry of mobile phones into the communication ecosystem. Um, we asked ourselves that if we knew that communication was inciting violence, could we instead use that same tool and empower local community activists to use that same tool to instead create peace? And what we did is we used a two-pronged approach. We started at the most basic level by working with community partners, and we built and designed all of the programs in partnership with local community leaders. And rather than beginning with the technology, um, the foundation of our programming was, um, was more traditional programming, in-person interactions, which included face-to-face -face outreach and branding of the initiative, local forums, policy debates. And then we complemented this with a new tool, a subscription-based SMS platform, um, which enabled local community members to subscribe with their phone numbers and let us send targeted information based on their demographic information, such as um, their location and the language that they wanted to receive messages in. And we were able to send these targeted messages um, about civic education, to poll communities about their needs, and to send messages that encouraged peace and also that disrupted violence and tensions. Um, the partnership and interaction between that in, these, this in-person um, traditional mediums and the text messaging was really important because it was the in-person um, interaction that let us build credibility, trust, and community investment, and let us build really on existing social capital and behaviors in the community. And then that meant that when we uh, used this SMS platform, which let us communicate rapidly and directly with community members, we had that trust and credibility, and people listened to us. By the time of the March 2013 elections, we worked with uh, more than 50 local partner organizations to, dis to subscribe over 65,000 users to our platform in target areas in Nairobi and the Rift Valley. And in just the weeks surrounding the election, we sent over 680,000 messages out. Um, we were able to then, because we had our subscribers' numbers in our database, we were able to ask them for their opinions and about their experience with our platform. 92% of 7,350 subscribers who answered a poll um, believed that the text messages that we sent had a positive impact on preventing violence in their community. And subscribers also reported that they interacted with uh, this medium and with, uh, with the messages that we were sending. This was important to us because we know that when people get messages inciting violence or spreading rumors from their neighbors or their friends, they're interacting with that information. They're going out and talking about it and sending it to others. Um, 75% of the 7,350 subscribers surveyed spent their own money at least once to forward a message. And 85% had a conversation at least once. These are a couple quick quotes from subscribers from uh, phone interviews that we later did to learn more about their interaction with the platform. This subscriber was from an area with low level of conflict. The messages made me relax even in the midst of the violence that was happening. I still felt like someone was in control and watching, and I knew things would be okay in the end. The second quote is a subscriber talking about rumors. If people were scared or spread rumors, tensions would rise. SMS were useful to make people strong, and when I saw them, they made a huge difference. He also said he shared them with other people, and it helped them relax. And finally, um, this subscriber said that the messages gave her the courage to preach peace. So we could see that the messages we were sending were actually disrupting the communications around conflict. And that was my last slide. So um, I just conclude. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Rachel. Next, we have uh, Cara Andrade from Ashoka. And you need. Right there. Okay. I'm going to test the technology first. Okay, good. Um, so, good morning. Uh, my name is Cara Andrade. I'm the co founder of a nonprofit that's called Alba Centro. Uh, and here's my contact information. And Alba Centro. Uh, 
is a, we're both a non-profit and a for-profit, and we've been working the last few years in Central America in particular, but we also work with Latin America. And what we've been focusing on is, is like looking at technology strategies and solutions for uh, you know, getting people to participate, to create public spheres, to create deliberative spaces, third spaces, what Anaï referred to, um, and to get people also to like have access to economic opportunities uh, through tools and information. And, these websites are sites, uh, they're citizen journalism websites that we've created in partnership with different local organizations in each of these countries. So we have um, communities in Costa Rica, El Salvador, Venezuela, Honduras, Guatemala, where I'm from. Um, and so what's, what's happened is that we've created this network of citizen journalism um, hubs. And they're all run by volunteers, mostly young people. I think like one of like our youngest was like 14 years old when he started. Um, you know, posting to Alba Costa Rica. And the contributors share and they discuss information. Uh, a lot of the platforms also have the ability to be localized so they can uh, include different indigenous languages. Uh, anyone can contribute via like cell phone, email to web and directly on the website. And here's what some of the applications also look like on our actual, our phones, which and they're all Android based. Um, and they're all free too. But I want to start with, with essentially like how someone like me, uh, you know, like a, a concerned citizen and someone trained in journalism goes from like, you know, being in her pajamas one evening to like creating this like, you know, this network of citizen journalism websites. And it all started with Honduras. Uh, there was a coup, I'm going to say that in quotes, because coup, it's still debated among some circles that if what happened under us actually was a coup. Um, on January 28, 2009, uh, then President Manuel Zelaya was ousted by the Honduran go government, and he was ousted because he was trying to extend the constitution so he would stay uh, like as president a little bit longer. Um, and so the Supreme Court uh, from Honduras, like, ousted him in his pajamas as well to like Costa Rica and a lot of the Costa Ricans, I'm sorry, to, uh, yeah, to Costa Rica and a lot of the endurance who supported him were not happy that he was ousted. And so there was a lot of like protests and, and different manifestations and obviously there's also like some ensuing violence um, and then just a lot of violations of human rights. And none of this was being covered in like international media or like even local media because there's obviously some, some very clear stakeholders um, that were keeping that that coverage from getting out. And so they contacted me on June 28th. Uh, they'd heard that I'd set up similar site, sites like Albaguate, and they said it was a group of like 15, 20 students, activists, and they were like, could you help us set up a website like what you did before? Because we want to tell our stories. We want to tell what is happening on the ground. And it really got to like something very fundamental about how in a democratic society, you really need informed citizens, right? Informed citizens can govern, and they can also serve as watchdogs. So while, like, you, th you know, like we're taught as journalists, eventually we'll become like, you know, citizens. And you know, I think like the idea is also to teach citizens the skills that journalists have, so that they have access to, you know, accurate, reliable, timely, relevant information. And that's the recipe we often use for news and what's newsworthy, right? They have access to tools to get what they need. Um, and to also like connect to the information and economic opportunities to sustain themselves. And all of our tools that we've created, we created in partnership. Uh, we have different developers that work with me and also the community organizers, and these are all requested. We don't come up with a single technology that a community like, that we work with says, hey, you know, we really need this. And so here's some of the, I'm gonna just run through some of these. And like we have the, the websites that you've seen, we've had simple blogs, these are all super lightweight, made to work in developing countries, um, are pretty unhackable, uh, I would say, and probably like, I'm sitting with engineers, so you could probably hack it right now. Uh, so <laughs> it's tightly integrated with Facebook and Twitter, there's like full support for our SMSs, and we also have a similar one for young people, so when they actually wanna start covering elections. Um, here's our text messaging platform, where people could actually set up their own text messaging hub. Um, and this is the way it works, so it's very nodal, um, and it's like easily expandable to more regions and countries. Um, and some of the lessons that we've learned, because I have 30 seconds, is you know, really the most important thing is to build community, right? Don't give people tools unless they really need them and they're cost effective, and that they're also uh, relevant to the work that they're doing already, okay? So, uh, and the last thing I wanna say is like, strategy is really important. Like the tool should be last. So like, you shouldn't start with like the technology first. You have to always, get people to, to talk about, two seconds, to talk about like audience and like who they're trying to reach because in the end, technology is made of people. And double brownie points if you can tell me what movie that's from. Soiling Green, okay. Oh, nice. <laughs>
All right, thanks, Kara. Next, we have uh, Mohammed Najam from Social Media Exchange. Yes, thank you. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Mohammed Najam. Uh, from Social Media Exchange Beirut, and I'm here with my partner, Jessica. Uh, we founded Social Media Exchange in 2008, and we work on digital rights and training. Um, today, I won't be talking on... Is this the one? Yeah. Okay. There we go. Okay. Today I won't be talking about internet governance, even though I would love to talk about it maybe at lunch or something. But today I'm going to be talking about three of our projects that we did in the last two years, uh, technology related, and what are the challenges that we had. The first project we had is NuWeb, which is a list of legislators. It's a basic, simple contact of the deputies that exist in Lebanon. Uh, how to contact them through email, social media. Uh, it's been on GitHub. We put this on GitHub, and uh, it's a way for constituents to contact their deputies, because the Lebanese website of the parliament had mostly ha had a maximum nine contacts of the deputies from 128. Most of the contacts exist is around uh, their background, the, their wife's name, their kid's name, so there's really no direct contact. One of the challenges that we have on this project is uh, our donor didn't think it's innovative enough. And that's really a challenge, because what's really innovative in the region, in the Arab region, is really might be somehow old-fashioned here, but it's really related to the context, and that's really essential, how the technology can solve the problem. And this is open for any developer as well to come and build on top of it to solve different problems as well. The second project that we're doing is uh, called Tasharuk. It's a, it's a collaborative knowledge base for netizens. And it's an online library that exists in English and Arabic, of course, uh, targeting Arab region. And this had came uh, after the trainings that we've been doing around um, online media for social change in the Arab region. Many people, many trainers come to us and ask us, how can we access content? How can we access materials to train our people? So what we did, we aggregate all the open source material that exists from our part and from different organizations that they are already building materials. And we put them on this library. Uh, this will be launched on September 30, which is in a few days. Uh, but you can check it now, it's open. And the, the idea is uh, not only to put the materials for people to access, but also to map what already exists in terms of materials, to see who's doing what, and to know how we can collaborate all, all of us together in the Arab region to really move forward in building new materials and not only duplicate on specific topics. For example, we can find a lot of materials now around digital security, but there's not enough on many different topics. <clears throat> uh, the challenge on this project is uh, usability. Usability was one of the challenges, like how the software developer can really help us in building this. Uh, there's also a challenge in uh, uh, really working on a specific wireframe. Uh, all, uh, all, all these software that we're showing you now is uh, built by Arab uh, software developers. So uh, I'm just mentioning now some challenges we had. The third project is uh, nithawal.com which is we transform. Uh, this is also an online course, online learning course that's focusing on community building plus on in, the, uh, in this age of digital. So the training that we've been also giving since 2008, we started by building one course uh, and it focused on community building and uh, online. Uh, this is an eight-week course. We had a very good feedback from the participants. Uh, the challenge, the main challenge that we really had is convincing donors to give us more money to do that. Uh, while, uh, while this was very exciting for many people in the Arab region, the donors seems not to be very uh, uh, want to fund this kind of project. Uh, so the challenge that I mentioned are three. Uh, the donors need to be thinking about innovation from the context in the Arab region and not from the context from DC. 
uh, there, there is a need to uh, building capacity for software developer for civil society groups from the local communities. You, you, donors should work with local communities more to really understand the context, the language, the problem that really exists, and not really bringing solution to already existing problem that will really not solve anything. Uh, and thank you very much. And if you want to get in touch, we can talk about all these topics. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Mohammed. Uh, next up, we have uh, Kalsoum Lakani, and she is from Invest to Innovate. Hi, everyone. Uh, first, let's do a quick poll in the room. How many people already know what crowdfunding is? Yeah, wow, amazing. How many people have actually donated on a Kickstarter, Indiegogo, one of those platforms? Wow. Majority of the room, this is awesome. Um, I'm Kulsum Lakani, I'm the founder and CEO of a company called Invest to Innovate, or Eye to Eye, where we believe that entrepreneurs have the power to change the world, particularly in frontier and emerging markets where, um, where it, the ecosystem is a lot more nascent, it's really hard for entrepreneurs to really get the support they need to turn those ideas into reality. What Invest to Innovate does is that we provide the support that entrepreneurs need to get there. Um, we've been operating in Pakistan since 2011. I actually Actually just got off a plane from there two days ago so forgive me if I'm a little bit out of it um, but what we do in Pakistan is that we actually run a startup accelerator program where we identify young entrepreneurs um, who have really incredible ideas to change the environment around them. And in a place like Pakistan, there's no greater need than entrepreneurial solutions to affect change. Um, so we've been running this accelerator for the last three years, um, where these entrepreneurs not only get business support, they get access to amazing mentors. Um, and we currently, actually two weeks ago, just launched um, our third class of the accelerator program. Um, we have five companies, seven entrepreneurs, four of whom are women, which is really awesome. But the reason I bring that up and the reason why I'm here talking to you about crowdfunding, aside from the fact that I've done crowdfunding myself and I've trained on it, is the fact that a lot of these entrepreneurs in these markets, um, one of the biggest issues that they have is access to capital. Um, a lack of trust exists in these environments. Um, it's really difficult for them to raise investment for their businesses. And so crowdfunding can actually act as a really amazing solution to really bridge that gap when it comes to capital. And the reason is this. Crowdfunding really provides a sense of transparency, particularly when information is not always readily available, where people don't necessarily trust the information that they get. The type of crowdfunding portals and platforms that we've seen really give a sense of transparency to the cause that you're donating to, the cause that you're supporting. Not only getting to see where your money is going, but also, um, also getting to see the, you know, the progress of that, what happens afterwards. Um, crowdfunding is also really great to be able to raise small amounts of money from a large group of people. It's a really great way to mobilize and build community around your cause, around your business. Um, and it's such a great, uh, these environments are so great for that, it's so right. Um, the reason why we see crowdfunding really take off in these markets, sorry, Oh, I skipped ahead, okay, is because it is painless. It's really easy for you to go on a Kickstarter campaign and click and donate $10 and get a t-shirt to get to be part of a movie um, and be, basically get a perk for just basically sitting in your pajamas and donating to a cause that you believe in. Um, so while this is really great, crowdfunding, particularly in Pakistan, uh, but in a lot of these emerging markets, tends to be a little bit uh, restrictive, um, but particularly when it comes to these mainstream crowdfunding platforms that we've seen, the Kickstarter, Indiegogo. We've actually often seen um, causes in Pakistan um, really been unsuccessful on Indiegogo and, and all these platforms, and mainly because um, PayPal doesn't work. We don't actually have PayPal in a lot of these markets. We don't actually have a lot of ways that people are actually donating for things online. Um, what's often the case in the culture of these markets is that you actually do more cash on delivery than actually putting your credit card online. So when we see these traditional crowdfunding platforms, they don't tend to work um, or you know there's a lot of restrictions involved when it comes to it so a great example that's something that's actually going on right now you should actually donate to it if you like what I'm talking about um, it's a friend of ours sorry I'm not here to do shameless plugging but um, it's a company or an organization called T2F the second floor they're an amazing space in Karachi that's really brought together people over the creative arts um, around dialogue brought together filmmakers and what Sabine Mahmood who's one of the um, founders of T2F did was that she didn't want to necessarily put it on a crowdfunding platform because she realized that most of the supporters were in Pakistan. They weren't necessarily going to be able to donate online. But what she did instead was that
that she basically created her own crowdfunding um, website. And so she had really amazing people that were supporters. Amin Gulji is a famous artist that, um, and basically people that were adding this sense of credibility, the sense of transparency uh, to the cause. Um, and what they did was, uh, basically giving people really easy ways to do it. We're actually their partners on PayPal, which is how people overseas can actually do that. But what we're working on right now with Invest to Innovate, while this is a really great solution, you can see the dropping off cash, why are you transferring your contribution, contributing via like four steps on TCS, which is like RUPS, um, actually adds these levels of complexity. So what we're working on in Invest to Innovate right now, which I'd love to talk to you guys about after and during the break, is actually doing using design thinking as a methodology to figure out how crowdfunding um, can, uh, we can actually create a platform that works in these markets. Can we use mobile technology? Can we use other platforms that currently exist? So thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Hudson. All right. Next up, we have Jay Olfelder. Uh, I'm going to mess up your name. Olfelder from the U.S. Holocaust Memorial Museum. Hi, um, I'm Jay Olfelder, and I'm going to talk to you about the Early Warning Project. This is a new system for routinely assessing uh, risks of mass atrocities around the world. Um, this project's been in the works for a couple of years now. It's actually a collaboration between the Holocaust Museum Center for the Prevention of Genocide and Dartmouth College's Dickey Center and Dolly Lab. Uh, I get, there we go. The premise of the project's simple. Um, Better early warning can enable better preventive action. Obviously, early warning isn't sufficient for prevention, but we think it can create more opportunities for it, and that's really what this project is about. Uh, if you talk to people who work in the field, you sometimes hear, you know, early warning's already being done, we've got that covered, that's not really an issue. Um, in fact, a lot of what we call early warning now in this area are sort of like this guy's uh, Stone's weather forecast. <laughs> It's more that we get alerts uh, about violence that's already occurring. We think we can do better by building a system that, first of all, um, focuses specifically on mass atrocities, not conflict writ large. Um, second, uh, that really forecasts, that tries to look as far into the future as we can. Um, third, that does that using the best available methods that are specifically about forecasting. Uh, and last uh, and not least, it makes the results of that available to the general public for free so that anybody with a motivation to get involved in preventive action can take advantage of them. There are two main parts to the system. Um, the first are statistical assessments of the risk of onsets of state-led mass killing in countries around the world. Uh, and here what we're really trying to do is see the surprises, cases where the assessed risk is substantially higher or maybe lower uh, then the conventional wisdom has it, to try to get conversations, uh, deeper looks going on those cases. We're doing this with uh, a multi-model ensemble, or what you might call a model of models, that draws on a number of ideas about the risk factors and origins of mass atrocities. Um, this is the sort of standard practice in the world of applied forecasting nowadays because it produces more accurate results. So, of course, we've adopted that approach here. What uh, visitors to our site will be able to do are explore maps and charts that compare risks uh, across cases or within cases across the models uh, or over time. Um, we're also looking to make this interactive so that users will be able to sort of tweak the inputs to the models to explore the implications of different uh, possible future scenarios. Uh, that won't be part of the initial bill, but we think we'll be able to add that in the next year or so. We're also sharing all the data and code we use to generate those assessments on GitHub. Um, we're hoping that interested researchers will dig around in there and help us think about ways to do this even better. That's live now. Okay, so the statistics are the first part. The second main part of the system uh, is a wisdom of expert crowd system. Um, we know from prior research that individual experts usually aren't very good at forecasting events like these, but it turns out that crowds of experts, even relatively small ones, can do a very good job of it. So we're taking advantage of that principle with something called an opinion pool. Um, if you've seen or heard of or maybe participated in a prediction market at some point, this is the same basic idea, except here it, without the trading part. So uh, in this, um, registered experts log into the system, find questions where they think they can add some value, 
and simply tell us how likely they think the event is by setting a slider like you can see on the picture there. But the key part is uh, they can update those forecasts anytime. So when they see or read or hear something that changes their mind about how likely the event is, they can go back in and update and the aggregate, uh, aggregate forecast updates immediately with it. Then what the public will get to see is for each of those open questions, a chart like this one that shows what the current average forecast is and how that's been trending over time. Um, we've got about 115 people in the pool right now. It's been up and running for several months. Um, but the bigger and more diverse that pool gets, the better this will work. So we're uh, looking to make a big recruiting push over the next year or so and hope some of you all can help us with that. We're also running a blog and we'll have a social media feed to call out interesting changes in the forecasts, uh, relevant events, that sort of thing. An interim version of the blog is up now on WordPress. That's what you see here. And we're migrating that content over the site now. Uh, and last, um, we're hoping to see the site become kind of a hub for conversation about early warning and prevention as well. So there will be a discussion forum built in that will be open, uh, open to the general public as well. Uh, so that's the early warning project. Um, the site I've been talking about is almost ready. It should be up within the next several weeks and go live in October. When that happens, I hope you'll take a look and put it to good use. Thank you very much. Next up, we have Dilshad Oakman from the ISC project. Good morning, everyone. Uh, well, I'm here to talk about uh, the experience of using technology in Syria during the conflict or at the beginning of the conflict. Uh, well, at the beginning of the of the conflict in Syria, Syrians used uh, social network very heavily in a heavy way, so they can cover uh, the news and what's going on in the ground. And Facebook actually was the main way for Syrians so they can verify news or verify images that they are coming from specific, specific areas in, in the country. Also, we have to know that the government tried uh, their best and they're still trying to, to put a block uh, on, on access for media on specific parts of Syria. Uh, unfortunately, that uh, using the technology in Syria or specifically focusing on social network to cover news was uh, actually, now it's actually cracking down because of the policy of the social network, because uh, as Mohammed mentioned, now uh, policies that they are running in DC, they are totally different than the policy that they are running on spaces like Syria. And recently Facebook cracked down a lot of social network pages because of violence of uh, agreements uh, of the user community. Um, Recently, we found that Syrians, they are moving to the VK, which is the Russian social network, because they are less restricted uh, with the policy. Um, while Syrians, they use technology or using, they use Facebook to cover their own uh, in news and uh, to cover their own media, that was uh, the solution actually that the government used and other, other parties actually they used is uh, just shutting down the communication. And that was the largest problem in Syria. Uh, my city is offline. Uh, where I'm from, is offline since March 2013, and there is no mobile coverage or internet there. So the people, they found a very good way, actually. So it's using VSAT system, and they build uh, cafe nets in each street. So at the same time, they build a lot of Wi-Fi hotspots. So now, even with the low bandwidth, but still people, they can get access to the internet by using VSAT systems. Uh, this is one of, because of the government also cracked down a lot of websites and they are shutting down pages, they are trying to limit access to the information. A uh, group of Syrians, they found something called the freedom of SMS. So they were sending SMS to, in, to people, public SMS, pushing them to go out for demonstration, pushing them to, to participate in, for example, at that SMS, they are asking people to participate in, uh, participate in uh, strike. Uh, that was actually at the beginning of the, of the conflict. Syrian government uh, put a block on specific words. So the solution was actually sending, uh, the solution what people they used, actually they were sending recorded voice messages to these people. Even with that, they were, they were, blocking, uh, they were blocking the voice call to go inside the country. Uh, one of the largest problems also Syrian people faced is the SCOD missiles. As a former Syrian officer in the, in the army, uh, Syria has a lot of SCOD missiles, and SCOD missiles are dumb, huge SCOD missiles. And Syria launched at least 175 SCOD missiles on their own people. 
So with the help of some friends, I built EMTA. EMTA means in Arabic when. It's a scout missile warning system. Uh, usually the base where the scout missiles were launched from is uh, nearly around Damascus. And it takes up to eight, eight minutes to nine minutes to reach the north of Syria or Raqqa or Aleppo. So we built our new warning system based on spotters on the ground. They were reporting the XYZ and the timing of launching the scout missiles because it's huge. They can't see it and they can't follow it. And they will add that to the system. And the system automatically will figure out the targeted areas and send SMS uh, and, e and emails to the people warning them that they have seven minutes or six minutes to go. Unfortunately, that wasn't that much successful because of accessibility to the network. Everything was shut down, so it wasn't working that much. Uh, so this is the image of how EMTA works. Uh, launching the scout missiles from south of Syria because this is the area where government is taking control. And I can easily find, uh, uh, put the time, actually find the time and the XYZ and automatically the system will calculate. And it's, it will also, so, uh, also it's going to show like a virtual effect showing the muscle, missile is moving on the map. That gives the people a lot of trust also in the system. So we had more than 6,000 subscribers in the first two days on the system. Uh, accessibility was uh, our main problem, and it's still our main problem. There are a lot of solutions, there are a lot of creative solutions on the ground, but network, there is no access to, access to the internet, and that was one of the uh, main problem, and it's still. Thank you so much. Great job. Thanks, Ashad. Uh, next up, we have Anna Levy from Social Impact Lab. Just figure out how this thing works. There oh, we go. There we go. Okay, we got it. So, as some, as a number of, ah, there we go. As a number of the folks who have uh, spoken up here already have talked a lot about SMS, uh, and it's the business that we're in, it's the work that we've been doing at Social Impact Lab for the past eight years. Uh, back in 2012, there were more than six billion people in the world uh, that had access to a cell phone, mostly to SMS, and, and just over nine trillion text messages were sent in the same year. <clears throat> I'm gonna skip that one. Uh, this is a different presentation. Oh, boy. <laughs> I'm actually not going to use the presentation. I'm just going to talk a little bit. Okay. Um, right. So I guess I'll start here. Why SMS? Uh, the reason that we use, the reason that we've been so focused on SMS for the past, uh, for the past few years is you can be a researcher, you can be a journalist, uh, you can be a service provider, <clears throat> you can be here without access to the internet, and, uh, okay, totally different. You know what, can I actually yeah. come back on a little bit later and just grab the right presentation? You know what, um, yeah, give us, why don't we, we're just gonna take a quick pause. Hold on one second. Um, and I'm gonna ask for our, uh, to see if we've got this teed up. I'm looking in our, have the, the right one ready to go. All right, why don't we actually, if we can skip to, so while we kind of fix be. this, if we can skip to Bill. Bill, are you ready? <laughs> now, and the real question is, are we ready for Bill? <laughs> See if we can skip down to the next one on Esri. Sorry about that. No, Bill. no worries at all. We'll get this. We are, uh, no, it's, it's not a conference until the technology starts <laughs> to break. That's, well, hey, that's why we work with SMS. <laughs> I'll, 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 I'll put your five minutes. <laughs> Thank you use. so much. <laughs> and we'll swap it out. Are we ready? Do we think? There we go. Bill's ready. All right, Bill Sheridan from Esri. We're, we're close. We're close. So good morning. I'm Bill Sheridan with Esri. I want to talk about GIS, GIS technology and mapping technology and how it pertains to the peace building process. Um, you know, every time you say GIS or GI geographic information systems, mapping technology is a common voice in the peace building process. Core GIS technology brings information together in, in ways that help characterize activity, prepare our resources, and even predict events. 
I'd like to highlight on how our ArcGIS users are using technology in order to um, support the different facets of the peace building process. Okay. All right. GIS and mapping technology is often used to uncover patterns and trends in data, much like this CAPS product, analyzing conflict information. This valuable research enables uh, us to better understand the drivers of conflict as social, economic, and environmental um, data is integrated. Dr. Kate Weaver is actually going to talk a little bit more about the CAPS project in a few minutes. Furthermore, non-governmental organizations such as Human Rights Watch use um, use GIS and mapping technology to capture information and report incidents out to the public. In these examples, you can see they provide a detailed assessment of, of damage to buildings in both South Sudan as well as Fallujah, Iraq. Maps are often the first tool used in a humanitarian response to manage coordination efforts. Having data stored in a GIS allows information to be tailored quickly in, in order to meet local needs. Uh, these are just a few examples of different maps at, 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 at certainly different scales used in the uh, earthquake response in Haiti. Nearly all UN political, peace building, and peacekeeping missions have a GIS department, which stresses the importance of this technology in the peace building process. And GIS technology allows peace, peacekeeping mission maps like this one to be updated continuously as local events on the ground change and, and assets are reallocated. And finally, the everyday operations of the Security Council and peacekeeping forces require maps and geographic analysis. But in order to move forward in the peace building process, we need to meet people's most basic needs. In this example, our user is collecting data on clean water, on clean water samples in the field using a highly accurate GPS. This map depicts the World Resource Institute system called Aqueduct for analyzing water scarcity. World Vision uses GIS to collect data on sanitation and hygiene, also known as WASH, as well as other food security issues. It's hard to achieve peace building when basic health and nutrition are not provided, stable and healthy communities are certainly essential. And finally, both CGIAR and Harvest Choice, which is supported by the Gates Foundation, use this technology to analyze crop information in support of food security. Food and water scarcity inhibit the peace building process. GISs have been progressively introduced to Rwanda over the past 10 years. This proved to be especially valuable in context of the nation's Vision 2020 program or 2020 initiative to become an information, communication, and technology literate society. And building and protecting peace is critical. Having an integrated system um, that, that creates an environment where information can be shared, allowing faster, more structured coordination and response when incidents do occur. And I mentioned Esri on the first slide. Um, you know, we were, we're a company that was founded in 1969. We've grown from a very small research group to a large uh, global company with over 350,000 organization, uh, organizational users worldwide. Many uh, NGOs, governments, international partners use our technology. We developed the GIS and mapping uh, software. We focus on growing GIS and its applications, and we provide education, support, and services to our users. And finally, I hope you note that, that Esri is a, is a global company. We have locally owned offices in over 130 countries around the world. Um, you know, this provides our customers local language, local context, and, and certainly um, local access to staff, because geography matters. Thank you. Thanks, Bill. Uh, next up, we have Katherine Weaver from uh, University of Texas at Austin. Okay, thank you. Good morning. So my name is Kate Weaver. I'm a professor at the University of Texas in Austin. I'm pleased to be part of a program called the uh, Climate Change and African Political Stability Project, um, which is funded by U.S. Department of Defense Minerva Initiative. And in the sum, the CCAPS program is designed to bring the social science ACADs to the high-tech world. And what we really try to do is bring social science knowledge about conflict, climate change, and aid, and use GIS technology 
in order to be able to harness the power of spatial information in order to get greater analytical leverage on questions we care about. So, how does this work? There. So we look at uh, gathering and mapping very complex data on climate change vulnerability, conflict patterns across the continent, and subnational uh, very granular information on aid. And this doesn't seem to be working very well. There we go. Do I need to point it up? Point towards the booth. Okay, I will point to the sky. So in our conflict acts in particular, what you see here is work done by the Armed Conflict Location Event data set by my colleague out of the University of Sussex in England, and the Social Conflict in Africa data set, which collects real-time information on conflict events across the continent. Puts it on maps in such a way that you can interact with the data to drill down and get real-time information about who are the, the actors in the conflict, what's the scale or nature of the conflict itself, and also you can do temporal or time series analysis to better study <coughs> conflict patterns as they're changing. So as Bill showed you already, this is one of our shots from our CCAPS dashboard, which is an interactive dashboard that allows you to go in and interact with the conflict data, but also to overlay it over um, other maps. So in this case, what you're seeing is conflict patterns over climate change vulnerability, which is helping us to ask and answer essential questions about what is the relationship between climate change and conflict in Africa. Is climate change creating risks that exacerbate conflict or not? We can also look and do time series analysis to see how conflict patterns are changing. The example here shows the, the spread of the Lord's Resistance Army from northern Uganda into the neighboring areas in the DRC and South Sudan. We can also overlap the same information over climate change vulnerability and start to see where the spread of the conflict may be exacerbated by underlying risks of, due to climate change. The area of the CCAS program that I work on in particular is also integrating really granular subnational information on aid flows, particularly in the most aid-dependent countries in Africa. The innovation here is we've gone from knowledge where we knew how much USAID was giving for all agricultural programs in countries like Malawi, to now knowing exactly what agricultural activities are being funded by USAID through which implementing partners, at which parish level, at what time, and with what amount of money. We can then put that also over things like climate change maps and start to ask, is that $100 billion pledged by the UNFCCC and Copenhagen in 2009 actually translating into real money being provided for aid to developing countries for climate change adaptation? The question I think is most relevant here is how do we use this data to ask and answer questions about peace building? So one of my colleagues, Mike Finley, and I are working on these questions of whether or not aid uh, particularly aid-dependent countries, whether or not that aid actually exacerbates conflict by providing resources to rebel groups, or whether or not aid does what it's supposed to do, which is alleviate the underlying conditions of poverty and uh, actually reduce the risk of conflict. The spatial data actually allows us to get at these questions in a much more effective manner. So we're using spatial econometrics to do this. Also, what we started to do very, very recently is apply these questions in this data to peace-building evaluation. So now what we can do is go in and we can actually use spatial data on conflict patterns and other indicators on top of uh, the UN Peace Building Fund um, activity locations. And we're starting to do some very nerdy things, some quasi and full experimental impact evaluations for the UN Peace Building Fund in Burundi and soon to be Colombia. Finally, where are we going next? Asia. So the U.S. Department of Defense has generously given us another Minerva grant, and so we're extending this research to look at climate change vulnerability and complex emergencies in South Asia and Southeast Asia, trying to identify where it is that climate change may exacerbate underlying conflict risks so that conflict turns into actually full-scale complex emergencies, and also using these geolocated um, aid data to better understand where resources are being mobilized to address those risks. Thank you very much. Thanks, Catherine. Um, next up, we've got Benson Wilder from the uh, U.S. Department of State. Hi. Uh, I'm also going to apologize in advance. I have a terrible head cold, and if someone could use big data to explain why that always happens when I have a public speaking event, <laughs> that would really be helpful. 
So the Humanitarian Information Unit is an interagency unit housed in the Department of State. We have staff working for USAID, National Geospatial Intelligence Agency, Department of Defense, Army Civil Affairs. Uh, we have been around for more than 10 years and have generally been focused on small data, operational data, uh, trying to be in a node in a large network and support uh, multiple international partners, UN agencies, NGOs, some of whom work directly with the US government, many of whom do not. Um, that's our mission, but our focus, we are in the office of the geographer of the State Department, so our, we, uh, Bill and Catherine have done a good job explaining the importance of geography and the importance of place in understanding co complex emergencies, so save me a little time. Uh, so our privilege is geospatial data, although it's not always limited to that. Uh, this is one of our earlier uh, flagship initiatives, uh, providing U.S. government data on destroyed and damaged villages in Darfur over the course of many years, uh, which was useful in documenting what was happening, but also was uh, used by multiple operational agencies to better understand the context, to engage in planning, um, and, uh, et cetera. We've done many things along those lines in other cases at varying scales since then. Uh, this is a more recent example during the Jonglei crisis in South Sudan last year before the larger conflagration. <clears throat> uh, UNISAT, the operational satellite program of the UN, is also a key partner. So we provide data based on US government analysis whenever possible, but we also try to push data out so other independent agencies can do their own analysis. Uh, we are able to use the ability, the US government's purchase of large amounts of commercial satellite imagery, leverage that, share that with partners doing their own work uh, and for a variety of human security applications. And this goes back many years. Uh, so that's both for conflict damage assessment as well as humanitarian needs. I felt badly not putting a Human Rights Watch slide on, but Bill included that, so I appreciate that. There also, the Malakal work in South Sudan was used, uh, using imagery that was supplied under the same license. Uh, I'm an Africa guy, but we do a lot in Syria and Iraq and many other places in the world, so I did want to mention that. And we're also uh, in, very involved in the creation of open geographic data, particularly with an emphasis on the baseline. Uh, none of, there's ama amazing sources of information you're going to hear more and more about today. Uh, we really believe strongly that without understanding that baseline, the localized context of place and the interaction between people and their environment at various scales, uh, you lose a lot of that uh, information. So we are working with the Humanitarian Open Street Map team, uh, who has already been leveraging OpenStreetMap, a free and open editable map of the world for a variety of human security applications. We use the same license. We've worked through the policy and the technology uh, hurdles to be able to share imagery, and in certain cases, uh, to allow digital volunteers to trace over that imagery, which is what you're seeing here, create baseline data, which goes into this open map of the world. And that's an example of how that's used in a variety, in one of many emergency preparedness contexts. So that has also evolved and given launch to what we call the MapGive initiative, mapgive.state.gov. So the imagery is important, uh, working with local communities and giving them access uh, to that data and building communities around open data and open mapping is more important. Uh, and also the volunteers who are working around the world to create that baseline data to empower communities um, is perhaps the limiting reagent. So MapGive is about getting the word out, lowering the bar to entry for digital volunteers, working with universities here and around the world, other student groups, other stakeholders. Uh, we have a set of tools for training and learning online. Uh, and we're, um, when we engage in mapping activities, we also use social media to uh, recruit and mobilize volunteers. You can follow us at MapGive. Uh, at MapGive. We've been very involved in the Ebola response as of late. Finally, we're a node in a large network, but nodes can also be bottlenecks. So we're trying to apply the principles of open data as well as open source development uh, with, D with DOD OSD funding. Uh, we've just concluded a two-year joint cap capability technology demonstration called, now it's called GeoShape. Basically, this is about Everyone's going to have their different stores of data, but let's have an architecture that allows people to share as much information as possible when they can, when they want to, and also protect the information that they have to, which is obviously very important in, in protection uh, and human security and peace building contexts. Uh, and just to mention that this also works in hand in hand with our work with the Humanitarian OpenStreetMap team and the data that are created there. And this final slide, you can see 
uh, updates made in real time within the OSM database. Very good. All right, now change up. We're gonna have Anna come back, and I think we are set. Oh, wait a minute. Hold on, one more second. Okay. That kind of looks like are we? <laughs> this is the point in the conference where yeah. where we reiterate that technology is is just never gonna substitute human beings. <laughs> <laughs> so the team working very very quickly and efficiently back there to to get the right the right thing going. Um, are we ready? Let's see. Am I going to get a, a hand up from someone? Yeah, I think you are. Oh, somewhere okay. up in the booth. Back there in the... Oh, we had it. This would also be a good plug for, for SimLab. Everyone's in suspense now and wants, who are we? What do we do? <laughs> are we a black box? <laughs> Top secret technology. <laughs> Soon to be unveiled. We good? Oh, we've got one minute. Sorry, it looks right. like we're switching computers. I think that's the problem. Get in here. Yeah? I think this gives everybody a minute to absorb everything that just came at them very, very quickly. Think about it. Think about what your questions are, and hopefully maybe you've got some ideas to be able to share and exchange uh, at the upcoming break. The good news is that I was going to talk a lot about SMS, uh, which is what many people have already talked about. Um, I can start by just talking about two, two or three of the examples. It's, it is a lot more interesting if I show it to you up here. Give me a, give me a hand if, if it ends up that it's going to be working. Okay. Um, oh, so sorry. I said the good news is that um, you know it would be a lot more interesting if I had the slides. I'll go through a few examples of the work that we do. Uh, we work mostly with SMS. We're expanding a little bit now. There we go. There we go. All right. Okay, perfect. So I had just gotten to here. Um, I'm Anna, I'm from Social Impact Lab. In 2012, as you see up here, and as I said before, six billion people around the world had access uh, to mobile phones. Most of them used SMS uh, with that access. About 9.4, little over, between nine and 10 million, uh, 10 trillion, sorry, text messages were sent, and that number is much higher now. The reason that SMS is more popular than anything really after radio as a communications channel is because it's extremely cheap, pennies on the dollar. Uh, it, it functions where electricity grids don't reach uh, and absolutely where internet operations break down as the gentleman who went before me said before in Syria, internet kind of collapsed or was shut down. SMS often still works in those situations. So we have one example here. Oop. We have an example here. This gentleman over here on the right is Hendrik. Um, <clears throat> he's the head of a palm oil cooperative in uh, West Kalimantan, Indonesia. He started a citizen journalism network uh, to use in negotiations with the palm oil companies operating in the area. He would mobilize support, uh, basically do community organizing through SMS to get information from community members, from people in the cooperative to mobilize documentation through SMS to use uh, in his conversations with the company. This got carried or picked up, actually we did some work on this also with Internews. Um, I forgot her name, but one woman spoke about it before over here. Uh, and this actually got picked up by a local media network called Ruai TV, who started covering and reporting on the negotiations using the SMS content. There we go, all right. What we have here is, is a poster that was put in various areas uh, in 2011 post-flood in Pakistan. On the left over here, you have a numbering system, one through 10, um, and each of these was a number indicating, so instead of saying, uh, I don't have access to food or my child can't use a certain kind of stairs or doesn't have access, you know, has special needs of some sort, Posters were sent all over the place in several different languages saying, 
text number one to this number, and as you see on the right, sort of explaining both pictorially and, and using language what people should do, where they should text information, what they needed uh, during the relief efforts. So text number one, if you, if you need something related to food, text two, if it's related to shelter. Uh, I forgot what three is. Uh, four is conflict. Five, six, and seven have to do with reports that you want to make about the organizations or the people who are sort of distributing, distributing services, distributing goods. Uh, text eight, if, if, you have some, if you have an issue with women or children. Text nine, if you have an issue with someone who is handicapped or has special needs. Uh, and text zero, if you want to say thank you in some way. And after you text that number, what happens is an auto reply would come back trying to sort out what exactly that person's need or interest is. And a, a back and forth would take place until hopefully, not in all cases of course, it's extremely complicated and chaotic, uh, but a lot more people were serviced this way and it was direct to the individual rather than always going through intermediary organizations. Yep. Right now we're actively working on a project, uh, again with Internews and an environmental journalism organization called Info Amazonia, working in and around the Amazon basin. They cover environmental degradation in the region uh, in all the countries that are contiguous to and touching the Amazon. And, and it's a little bit different. Normally when we think about text messaging, you think, so I'm going to text you to see what time we're meeting tonight. Uh, you know, my mom texted me this morning and said, happy Friday. Uh, and this is actually a case where we've attached text messaging capabilities to a very low cost sensor that registers environmental matter, particulate matter in the air and in the water in and around the Amazon basin. So it's a, low cost, it's a low cost messaging system to send environmental information. The second innovative part, it's not such a new idea, but the second uh, sort of innovative part is that that information gets triggered via SMS to governments, to journalists, and to local communities at the same time. Uh, and many of those communities are indigenous communities. So why SMS, and this is the slide that came up before, because this person right here, as I started to say, could be a reporter, they could be a researcher, they could be a service provider, they could be a civilian. They could send information, run service programs, uh, access services that they need through this platform right here, which looks and acts like an email inbox. Uh, does most of the same things, except for that it all functions, <coughs> excuse me, offline. You don't need to have the internet, you don't need to be by the internet in order to organize information through the system. Where we are right now at Social Impact Lab uh, is here. We're, we're now trying to understand how and where technologies that serve the needs of low income and often very vulnerable populations in transition or otherwise, uh, how that works on a network scale. We have a lot of programs now running. We're, we're doing a lot more work to support early warning systems, mobile money networks, uh, national health programs. And we actually heard about a month ago that, that some folks started using using the software to organize their wedding. So you can't see what that says, but it says, as of last year, we were very excited. Uh, the software reached 200,000 downloads in more than 135 countries around the world. Um, and we're trying to figure out how to move that, how to move beyond that scale of organization to person, from organization to organization, organization to government, and, and eventually transnational, where, where SMS and, and low-end technologies fit in. Thank you. Thank you. Very good. Thank you. All right. And, and hopefully uh, this will round us out with no glitches. Um, our own Peace Tech Initiatives and we'll take over from USIP. And I have a head cold and I can't walk, so I'm going to use the podium here. <laughs> we'll see how this works. Um, What's that? We're switching. Okay. <coughs> Top button here, is that? Or the left and right? Left and right. Left and right, got it. So I'm here to talk about the Open Situation Room Exchange. Uh, this is a web-based collaboration and data sharing platform. And the idea is really to help uh, people in conflict zones have better access to conflict data. And to be able to do something with that. To be able to find, collect, analyze, visualize and publish the conflict zone data to really help people harness and marshal the information in the world around them 
to be able to improve their decision making and strategies on the ground. Wow, that's a cool slide, it's not mine. <laughs> Neither is that. <laughs> yeah? It's upside down. Other way, got it. <laughs> Left. Uh, <laughs> there we go. This is the one I'm looking for. So the first step of this is, is really looking at the find phase and, and seeing what open data sets are available. And so many of the systems we see we can describe as almost a data for Superman type approach where if I can just get these really important people on the left side of the uh, slide, all the information they need, they'll find this magic button they press and the, the problems of northern Nigeria will start to be solved, right? But if, if you see the possibilities for peace is more about the local population thinking about their future and taking different actions to do nonviolent means of resolving conflict, then it's these folks on the right side who are the ones we really want to you know, ramp up and engage their decision making. It's the local peace builders that are going to make a difference. Oh. And so in looking at that, what are they using? They're using what we might refer to as local data. It's a lot of different formats, but the interesting question is because so many of these large data sets are sort of from an outsider's perspective, it's an open question to see what they're going to find value of when they're the ones asking the questions. But really, we can't even start doing this um, you know, connection until we're part of this trusted network. Because this is really where uh, local data is exchanged, this is why we made the core of our platform collaboration engagement, and then we layer the data on top. And so we're doing this in a place where information security is at a premium. So while we want to put as much information as possible out in the open, it's clear there's a need to have private secure spaces where just the folks that they want to work together are able to do so. And they're probably not using 24-inch monitors you know, to see 3D visualizations. They're working in partially connected environments, and they probably want an alert from their cell phone when the information they care about is changing. And so um, how do they start working with this data? So often we see cases where people go into conflict zones they engage a great group of stakeholders on an assessment process. And then they leave and do the analysis. And then they show back up with the answer, right? This is a classic, let me give you a fish. And until these folks, the local peace builders are the ones asking the questions, they're really not going to be data driven in the sense that we, we're, we're talking about here. And so the first phase, the spine, what are we trying to do? Well, the idea is if we can just draw a polygon around a plot of land and give back people the information they care about, be it Twitter, conflict data, environmental stressor information, and let them to start interacting with it, we really think this is the first step to start with. And so to do this, um, oh, that's this chart here. To, to get that, uh, what we started with is a series of data sets. So GDALT is one that we've worked with. Uh, there's a number of other ones. If you go to the Open uh, Situation Room homepage, there's a wonderful map that you can start working with. But really the idea is to start building this tech for social good ecosystem where we give the local peace builders all that great stuff that, that you know, the, that left side of the chart is giving Superman. Um, you know, information about their environment, uh, peace building topics like how do you do gender-based violence, but also the technologists and data folks that they can connect to. And if we give them these resources, maybe they can learn how to fly too, right? And so the idea, because this is long term, you really need boots on the ground in this sense. And what we're talking about is finding an awesome technologist from the region, um, bringing them back to the lab, learn about data analysis and visualization, but also conflict analysis and mediation and facilitation skills, and have them go back to the conflict zone. This isn't to scale, but I think you sort of see what we're talking about. Bringing in local peace builders over a period of time, you know, putting maps in the wall, giving them handouts so they can really start thinking about their data profile. And so where are we going? A lot of development to do. The main point is it's going to stay open source. There's going to be no proprietary code. There's going to be no USG code. And the development is really going to be based on participation and use. So we are really now at a place where we need you to come and join us. Come to osrx.org, start participating, share it with your folks. This is prototyping. It's going to be a long-term effort, but uh, the water's fine. Come on in. <laughs> Thanks, Noel, and thanks to all of the presenters. And thank you, uh, our, our participants in the day, for ha uh, hanging in there. And, and I hope this was a really stimulating uh, set of issues. And I think now is the perfect time 
to absorb all of this again, go out, find the presenters that were here, ask them questions. We're going to take about a 15 minute break. Um, so want everybody back in here in, in about 15 minutes time, but meantime, please go out, enjoy some snacks and coffee and water and whatever you need. Thanks. Ya la cagamos. Aunque esté antes, por favor.
All right, can we make sure we bring in all the coffee drinkers now so we get started? Great, keep coming in. Plenty of seats down here. All right, let's get going here. I was really glad to hear at the break how many folks found that last session valuable. And now we're gonna shift gears a little bit in the program to focus on the secret sauce, if you will, that gets the innovations that you saw in that last session, gets those innovations to scale, and that is really entrepreneurship. And I don't know anyone better to introduce this than Bernard Amade who we asked to kick the session off. Um, not only is Bernard a distinguished engineer, member of the National Academy of Engineering, but he founded Engineers Without Borders. He serves as the Secretary of State's Science Envoy to Pakistan and Nepal. And most importantly, he honestly is one of my heroes in this field, working at the nexus of peace building and technology. So with that, let me turn it to Bernard Amade. Thank you, Sheldon. Good morning, everyone. I was asked to give a, a short introduction for before the next session that deals with livelihood, entrepreneurship, and peace building. Um, so there's no doubt, obviously, that entrepreneurship has a critical role to play in uh, human development and economic development. The question that uh, we need to ask is, uh, what kind of entrepreneurship do we want to promote around the world, especially uh, in the developing world, which has been of interest of mine for the past 15, 20 years, where we have about four to five billion people whose job is to try to stay alive by the end of the day. When I ask about what kind of entrepreneurship, I'm talking about essentially uh, the entrepreneurship that um, is respectful of uh, cultures, or respectful of society, that promotes equitability and uh, stability, and also that provides long-term benefits to uh, various um, constituents and society in general. So that's the sustainability aspect of, um, of entrepreneurship. Over the past 15 years, I've been really interested in, uh, as I mentioned, in the link between engineering, science, and also entrepreneurship, uh, mostly in uh, the field in the developing world, and mostly what I would call, uh, what is called social entrepreneurship. Now, social entrepreneurship is um, the best way of describing it is using a quote from Benjamin Franklin, which is essentially best described by, as doing well by doing good. Essentially, it's double bottom line where uh, profit is part of the equation, but it's not just profit, how that profit can be reintegrated into society and improve essentially livelihood and improve 
essentially communities. Uh, my own experience over the, uh, the past 10, 15 years as a, a founding president of Engineers Without Borders, and also as a US science envoy, is that you know, out of four to five billion people in the world, you have a lot of young people in the developing world who really want to make the world a better place, who really want to see in, uh, in a, an increase, an improvement of, of livelihood, who want to step out of, um, of poverty. Um, the image that uh, when I talk about entrepreneurship, uh, it's not just about profit, as I mentioned. It's not about uh, giving people a fish. It's not about teaching them how to fish. It's about creating an entire fishing industry and a market around that um, fishing industry. Think about all the various uh, disciplines that are involved in entrepreneurship uh, in creating that fishing industry. Not only do you need water and clean water, and you need fish in a river, you also need uh, the fisherman and the entrepreneur to be able to go to the river. That's the whole field of security. You have to make sure that the entrepreneur is also healthy. That's the field of public health. You also need to understand that to be a successful entrepreneur, you need equipment. That's the whole field of technology and engineering and science. And also, that entrepreneur needs to be trained to be an entrepreneur. And that's the whole field of management, marketing, and so on. And you need a market. Not only you need a, a fishing, um, uh, industry, but you also need a market, otherwise you're going to be stuck with a lot of dirty fish that you won't be able to sell. <laughs> so um, as a science envoy over the past uh, two years, I was uh, asked to look at um, science, technology, and engineering in Pakistan and in Nepal. Uh, a few words about Pakistan and Nepal. First, Pakistan, country of 190 million people. This is a country where two-thirds of the people make less than two dollars a day. Two-thirds of 190 million people, that's 120 million people. Two-thirds of the people in Pakistan are below the age of 30. I had the chance as a science envoy to meet with some young entrepreneurs and some young people in Pakistan, and I believe that uh, I can tell you that the excitement among those young people is the same ex excitement that we heard this morning. There are many opportunities. That's something I have seen in the developing world. A lot of young people want to step out of poverty. They have passion. They have vision. They don't have high degrees. They don't have PhDs and master's degrees and so on. And some of them probably make even less than a dollar a day. But they have passion. I think it is an obligation of ours to tap into that passion and create essentially opportunities for those young people to make the world a better place and step out of poverty. Imagine. The role of entrepreneurship, if we could bring, there are one billion people on this planet who make less than a dollar a day. Imagine what would happen to this planet if we were to promote science, technology, engineering, and entrepreneurship so that those one billion people make two dollars a day instead of one dollar a day. Can we do that? If we can make five dollars a day, ten dollars a day, that would be even better. The world would be completely different. So, in Nepal, Nepal loses every day 1,500 young people who go to work in the Gulf. That makes no sense. Why? Because there are no opportunities in Nepal or in Pakistan for young people to develop enterprises. They want to create enterprises. We had a workshop of 42 people over a period of one week. We trained them, seven of us trained them to go from an idea to innovation. Out of those 42 people, three groups, essentially three companies, received, or oh, are planning to receive $15,000. The funding comes from USAID, NSF, and the State Department. Next year, we're going to select one of those three companies, and they're going to get $100,000 to make that company a reality. There are huge opportunities today in the developing world for young people to step out of poverty. We need to give, to give them a chance. I recommend two books, essentially, which is going to be a segue to the session here, that I do believe emphasize the role of entrepreneurship in making the world a better place. One is by Benjamin Franklin, published in 1758. If you have not read it, it's called The Way to Wealth. I know it's a bit uh, old, but it's still up to date. We will talk about, in there, you will see the concept of doing well by doing good. Benjamin Franklin was talking about social entrepreneurship more than 200 years ago. And the other one is by Chris Schroeder. So Chris is in good company with Benjamin Franklin. He wrote an excellent book 
that applies to the world today. It's called Startup Rising, the Entrepreneurship Revolution, Remaking of the Middle East. And in his book, Chris talks about how we can tap into that passion and vision of the youth today. And how do we, tra how do we transform essentially society so that society gets out of poverty and has a better future. Chris? Great. Thank you very, very much. It is an honor to be here. It is an honor, Sheldon, to be with you and the team of what you're building and announcing today. It's a particular honor to be with you. It's mostly an honor to be with all of you because we're entering a very new era now. And the very fact that you're here indicates your willingness to think about this new era and to think differently. I'd love to start before I introduce the panel right now, uh, you know, in Washington, D.C., we're here in Washington, D.C., people love a good cocktail party conversation. So I wanted to share with you a few fun facts that you can take to your next cocktail party overall. And I think it frames the discussion that we're about to have. So if I were to ask you to name the largest per capita consumer of YouTube on Earth, the largest per capita consumer of YouTube on Earth, how many of you would guess Saudi Arabia? How many of you would then know that the largest demographic watching YouTube in Saudi Arabia are women? And the largest content category they're watching is education. If I were to ask you what is the largest mobile payment country on earth, cash moving through mobile phones, in aggregate, not per capita, some of you would know, but some will be surprised, that it is Kenya. If I were to ask you to describe an African country who in the last two years has an amazing battle of corruption going on. As a friend of mine at Google said, that in much of Africa, for every $10 that goes into development or investment, nine of it tends to disappear. But in this country, $9 is not only accounted for, but is actually reported online, and the $1 is in jail. If I were to describe this same country and tell you that they are committed to skip over 3G and 4G for mobile connectivity and have LTE within the next two years, if I were to tell you this country is guaranteed that in the next two years, everyone under 21 will have a tablet computer, how many of us would guess that I'm describing? Rwanda. Rwanda. When I was in business school in the 90s, there were three absolutes. Absolute one was that Japan will win it all. Absolute two is India is a basket case with no future. Basket three was China could not have economic growth without political liberalism. I could tell you five years after that, no one was saying any of it. Can I ask for a show of hands, how many people know who Jack Ma is? Every one of you should know who Jack Ma is because he's now about to become the richest man on earth. His company is called Alibaba. It is an e-commerce company that will be the largest IPO, initial public offering uh, in the world. And it's happening as I'm speaking to you right now. It'll be over $160 billion. This is a Chinese company that has spent almost no time trying to convince the West or the United States to participate in it. And it is one of several multi-billion dollar country companies, tech companies in China, which is doing its job in other markets other than the United States. Oh, and by the way, this summer a company called Souk.com, which is effectively the Alibaba or the Amazon of the Middle East, raised capital for over half a billion dollars. And that's because it's a market of 400 million people with greater per capita income of China or India. Guys, I cannot predict to you what's going to happen in some of the great conflict zones in the next three years. But I can tell you with 100% certainty that two-thirds of humanity are going to have a smartphone. And a smartphone is not simply a better, better phone with better features. But this means two-thirds of humanity are walking around the planet with the equivalent of a supercomputer in their pocket. This means unprecedented access to how we can see how each other lives. We can connect with everyone. We can collaborate, engage, sell, and learn. It means that billions of people will essentially have all of the world's knowledge at their fingertips essentially for free. It will be as ubiquitous as water. And let me promise you that we're not just talking about high-flying Silicon Valley stuff. We're talking simply about people who use tools can make their lives better. I have met craftswomen in Egypt who two years ago would never be able to sell a product more than to their neighbors, who are now selling in different parts of Cairo, in different parts of Egypt, in different parts of the Middle East, and in the global market because of this access. Hundreds of thousands or more are taking their economic voices into their own hands because they can. I have seen no economic scenario on how traditional business and government alone will employ this amazing youth bottle in many countries, as many of you know, 
as much as 40 to 50 percent of a population under 30, which does not allow the opportunities that can come from the people who are going to talk right now. There's something big going on, and these guys are as interesting on these subjects as anyone as I know. Ovi manages several global and regional entrepreneurship programs, such as ReConnect, focused on South Central Asia, and the GIST Initiative, which is a global enterprise that builds amazing entrepreneurial ecosystems in 54 countries across the Middle East, Turkey, Africa, and Southeast Asia. Millions of dollars have been raised and invested in startups around conflict zones and emerging markets because of Ovi and the work that he has done overall. And Ovi, I want to go right at you right now and to start macro, because the word entrepreneurship is actually bantied about, and I think a lot of people sort of blend over not knowing what it means. And I'd love you just to talk a little bit of what you see it mean in these amazing markets around the world, and, and candidly, why does it matter? Uh, thanks a lot, Chris, and thanks, Sheldon, for inviting me. Uh, it's always humbling when you attend events like this and all the presentations we saw. Uh, you see the tremendous amounts of efforts that everyone is doing to address specific problems that the world has. Um, of course, I know that everyone has their own definition of entrepreneurship. In my own take, I think I will call it that entrepreneurship is when someone anywhere in the world is the architect of its own destiny and the architect of the destiny of the community. So what we have seen is actually in many places around the world, people don't have the time to wait for someone to provide help or aid or anything. They actually look around and they want to think how can they improve their lives and the lives of their community. So we have some uh, very specific examples that tie well into what you just mentioned. Uh, for example, Nermeen Saad from uh, Jordan. Uh, who uh, she created a platform similar with Odesk that uh, allows uh, female Arab uh, engineers to get jobs and work from the comfort of their home. So basically bypassing all the cultural uh, uh, limitations there and they are able to be activated. What you just mentioned is actually who consumes educational content, females from Saudi Arabia and the Middle East. So she found a way of bridging uh, their skills and expertise with the need for that talent. So, and she recently was named uh, number 47 on the top of uh, most powerful Arab women. This is just one example. Second example, surprisingly or not, is from Kenya. Uh, so, uh, Chris uh, Asego from Kenya uh, with the NISA education. So, he is himself, he came out of the second largest uh, slum from Sub Saharan Africa. And his uh, company works very hard on uh, using mobile technology to provide education. So 65% uh, talking about numbers now, students abandon school after failing primary school. Uh, so basically what he has done, he has found a system of using the mobile technology to provide education. He started in his own community. He recruited three co-founders and then they built up a group of 30 people and then now they reach, a, they train 180,000 students by using his own technology. So these are just two examples and uh, we can talk a little bit later connection to your uh, Alibaba because we also have examples of entrepreneurs on, on that tangent. So it, uh, who is not, and that is not talking just about helping the community uh, through education uh, or platforms but also generating prosperity for the entire community. Because what Jack Ma has done, he has established uh, uh, an example, not just for China, but also for other countries that actually see that this can be done. So it's interesting, I mean, in DC in particular, but I've seen this in other capitals, is often people will say, you know, like, is this really, I mean, does it matter? I mean, you're talking, usually these companies need small dollars of investment, and compared to the budgets that USAID or other big organizations give where they want to allocate to aid $100 million at a time, $200 million at a time, and, and, and so they'll, they'll literally turn to me and say, is, is this affecting the GDP? I mean, there, there's this very top-down macro view, and I wonder, like, how should one make sense of that? So I, I think there are a kind of two directions. One is basically, uh, at least in our work, on, in our work we have a dual approach. One, when we go and work with countries, we identify the companies that already have very, very strong potential to grow. In their in, uh, DNA, they already proved something on the ground. They have a product, they have a service, but they need the support that actually doesn't exist in terms of expertise on the ground. And what we do is actually, we work with them to help them scale up. Case in point, 
to, uh, to uh, add to what you said, uh, Ticket.com from Indonesia. They won uh, one of our large, the co global competition, Tekai, in 2012 in Dubai. They were at 1 million in revenue. And uh, right now, they are 75 million in revenue, and they may go to 100 till the end of the year. And they may be very well on track to be the first Indonesian IPO uh, that may IPO in US. And I know you're very familiar with Aramex, uh, the Fadi Gandur, that was the first Arab technology company that uh, IPO'd on NASDAQ. So what I see there is a very good potential if uh, we provide this sort of support on entrepreneurship and there are very good technologies that are applicable for this fast growing emerging markets, we will not only have Alibaba in China, uh, Ticket.com in Indonesia, a good number of these markets will have their own champions that will actually uh, will prove the models for the immediate fast followers that come after them, and which is a pipeline of entrepreneurs that we are nurturing. And in some of the, okay, you mentioned about the capital raise, uh, what we provided with the support of the GIST initiative, just a little bit of, of grant funding, uh, but we provided with, it was the validation or basically, and the expertise. Uh, after the uh, entrepreneurs uh, attend our events and they are selected by very successful entrepreneurs uh, like the founder of Priceline or founder of Atari Games plus local entrepreneurs, uh, they get the validation and they get home and they raise capital. Our entrepreneurs raise about 21 million in funding and generate about 800 jobs. Uh, yeah, so those are like some of the numbers, but the most powerful thing is the example that this can be done locally, uh, which actually inspires other entrepreneurs to follow. It's a flywheel of success. Yeah. Success breeds success. If I can see someone like me do it, I'm going to do it, and it spins off in that way so powerfully. Ramez is the CEO of Flat Six Labs, which is, I think, perhaps the biggest and best regional startup accelerator program I've seen anywhere. It started uh, in Egypt helping bright and passionate entrepreneurs to really come up with their ideas and execute them. They've now opened in Jeddah in Saudi Arabia and, and just opened in Abu Dhabi. And Nina Curley is here who's going to be running that operation, which I think is wonderful overall. Um, can you just explain to folks, you know, what is an accelerator and why that matters? Because it's going to be very relevant to Sheldon's announcement right later today. But on the ground, as, as Ovi points out, the bottom-up aspect of this is so important. Why is what you've built becoming such an important thing to the ecosystem in Egypt and beyond? Yeah, absolutely. Thanks so much, Chris, for inviting me, and thank you, everyone, for coming. Um, an accelerator is mainly a, like a new term for incubators. So uh, it's mainly like a program-based incubator where you have an office space where you host a group of entrepreneurs or startups so they can work, start like working on their products and accessing the market, getting in touch with investors, raising another round of funding. So it's mainly like a facilitation um, environment for uh, entrepreneurs and startups to be able to get funded uh, after they build their product. And when we started in Egypt in 2011, actually the whole project was supposed to start 2010 and it was announced 2010, just a few days before the revolution and it was uh, delayed because of the events back then. Um, we started like, you know, asking the entrepreneurs, we brought like 20 entrepreneurs in one room and asked them, what do you need exactly if we are building such an environment or such an incubator and accelerator for you? Like we didn't put any terms or labels on it. Just like we said that we'll be doing like an entrepreneurial lab, bringing people starting like to work on their products and we'll offer them all the support they need to be able to go to the market and present their companies to investors. And all of them, they said, um, we need the funding, we need the office space, we need the mentorship, we need, we need the education. And this was like the set of services that we started Flat Six Labs with. We partnered with American University in Cairo to provide business education for them because like, you know, most of the public schools in Egypt and around the region, they don't provide the business education needed for anyone to start their businesses. So most of the entrepreneurs or most of the tickets in, in the region, they, um, they have learned all this stuff by their own. And um, the amazing part that we, when we start Flat Six Labs, we thought that these are all the services that we provide. Maybe we'll enhance them by the time, maybe we'll increase the funding, maybe we'll just increase the equity and like stuff like this. But a few months ago, I was just like I was sitting with an entrepreneur who, like of ours, who said that the amazing thing about Flat Six Labs is that you created for us first of all the opportunity or the chance to start. That if I have an idea and I don't know where to go to, I know that I can apply to an accelerator. I get an equal chance with everyone else. Just like apply online, get accepted, join the accelerator, build my business, and be in the market. And this wasn't there before we started. This wasn't the, just like most of the people were either like bootstrapping or mm -hmm. getting small funding from their friends or family. 
And just being out there telling entrepreneurs that you can start, you can quit your jobs, you can start building your dream, it's, it's something really important to them. And the second thing is that Plastic Labs has emerged to be like a support system for them. So uh, just being accredited or just being affiliated with Plastic Labs, it gives them a lot of credit when they go and talk to either like, you know, big corporates to do business with them or investors to raise funding from. Before that, they were telling me like there's a huge difference between us being just on our own and then joining Plastic Labs. Like one of the, one of like the corporate, that one of the entrepreneurs I was talking to, he asked me, are you affiliated with any entity that we just can't trust them or something, like something like Plastic Labs? And he happened to be one of our entrepreneurs. So he said, yes, of course, I'm a Plastic Labs entrepreneur. And it was something really important to me, like this support system that we have created for them after three years. I can remember in the middle of one of the worst protest times in December a year ago, where hell was breaking loose in Egypt. And if you watch CN CNN, you really sort of felt everything was going to hell in a handbag. And I got, I, it may have even been you, who tweeted me that they were at a TEDx Cairo, TED being the great gathering of thought leaders around the world. Thousands of people were at the same time were American University Cairo talking about startups, flat six labs, and entrepreneurship, and 50,000 people in Egypt were watching it at the same time streaming. How can we think from here when we see one narrative about areas of conflict over and over again, how can we absorb and think about that in fact more than one narrative is present concurrently? Of course, it's really important. I think like, yeah, we need more than one narrative. We need the more than the narrative that you see on CNN mm -hmm. or any of the media outlets here or anywhere in the world. I think the Middle East has a lot to offer. I think uh, our entrepreneurs are trying very hard just to build their dreams and I think many people should start uh, helping them out. And just like, yeah, think about it. Like in the past three years and all the events in Egypt and everything happened, just like two revolutions, whatever you call it. And we have never stopped doing anything at Plastic Labs. We have never canceled an event. We have never postponed the demo day or like, you know, uh, a session or anything, we just kept running. Can you tell them what Greek campus is and what's about to happen in October? Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, Plastic Labs, just the background of Plastic Labs, Plastic Labs is started by Sawari Ventures, which is the venture capital firm in Egypt, started by Ahmed Alfi and Hanis Sumbati. And Ahmed Alfi, basically, he is like, you know, the godfather of the uh, Egyptian entrepreneurship ecosystem, and he decided that he will take over the old, uh, the American University in Cairo campus, downtown, right, just behind Tahrir Square and transform it into like, you know, a tech valley to host more than 100 startups there. And um, they started last year and now they have more than 35 companies and uh, hopefully reach by tar their target by the end of uh, next year. And Rise Egypt? Rise Egypt is like one of the biggest entrepreneurship summits in the region, I'd say, and um, where it's happening this year on October 13th and 14th at the Greek campus. We're expecting more than 3,000 people to show up. Last year we had 2,000 people. And the thing about Rise Up Summit, it doesn't have like a, an organizer or like it does not like, uh, it's mainly a crowd uh, sourced summit by the different partners, the different stakeholders in the Egyptian ecosystem. Everyone just came together and said, and, and they said that we'd like to have something to showcase the Egyptian ecosystem and the regional ecosystem and what's happening over here. Asma is a Palestinian American entrepreneur and human rights activist having this double bottom line in a way almost uh, in her DNA, which she talked about before. Uh, she recently graduated from the Kennedy School where she co-founded with her partner who is here also uh, a company called Pivot, which is a multi-platform app that's connecting locations around the world with its history. So imagine being in Palestine and not only being there now, but actually seeing maps and photographs throughout its history. It's a very, very powerful thing overall, recognized and funded by Harvard Idea Lab, among others. Um, you're amazing, and I'd love you to talk a little bit more about why you're doing what you're doing now. And, and though you're, you're here for the moment, um, talk a little bit, because there's an unbelievable ecosystem, not only in Palestine, but there's about to be a startup weekend in Gaza. I don't get it. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it's, a, it's a great topic, and thank you so much for having me That's and for awesome, having man. us and, and, and doing this. Um, so, so my uh, startup is very much, it's a, it's a personal story. It started off I did not even think it was going to be a startup. It started up with growing up Palestinian in South Carolina, rural South Carolina. So imagine that for a second. Um, it was great, it was great, and I grew up very connected to our history with stories after stories from, uh, from my father, from my mother, and I always had an imagination, what was Palestine like when my father was there? I wanna know what it was like. So the first time I went back, actually, after he, it was very personal, after he passed away, I didn't have him there to tell me what was where and what it used to look like and what the places, the history of the specific places. So I said, let me head to the Harvard Innovation Lab. Uh, I was a graduate student at the time. 
and let me see how they can help me. So I pitched, and, and here I am now building this company and doing this, uh, which is great. So the story's a deeply um, personal one of growing up in the diaspora and uh, dispossession and really being connected to uh, my ancestral roots. And so now um, we are doing this currently out of the Harvard Innovation Lab. And it really allows people to look at a place through a tunnel of time, is what I like to say. So you're here. What was USIP 10, 30, 50 years ago? Um, and what's really great is I've been connected with the Palestinian entrepreneurship ecosystem in Palestine. And that's been phenomenal. There are people who are doing things um, you know, from, from the West Bank, from Nablus in the north, to Ramallah, to Gaza. So there's, um, there's startup weekends in Gaza. There's the Gaza Sky Geeks, and that's the first sort of startup accelerator in, in Gaza, um, a heavy focus on females as well. And you have companies coming out of Palestine that are overcoming so many obstacles um, to do what they're doing, whether they're working in mobile technology uh, in an area where there's no 3G, 4G, or LTE in the West Bank. And so you have, you know, I like to highlight this example, you have companies that are sort of being intrapreneurs, I guess is the word, and coming up with internet bundling packages to overcome the obstacle of, of not having 3G due to limitations, uh, Israeli limitations of uh, frequency uh, for data, mobile data. So this is phenomenal that you have these ideas still coming to life despite obstacles. Um, and then, you know, and just to highlight the Paltel, Palestinian Telecommunications Company, it was actually started by a Palestinian American who lived in Ohio, and you know, role model, he's one of our advisors now, Sam Bahur, and he was one of the founding businessmen of Paltel, and so he went back in 1990s after the Oslo Peace Accords and said, I want to contribute to the economic sector of this new, uh, at that time, uh, what they thought was going to be a Palestinian state. So, so that was you know, a very high time, and he stayed there, and he's still working, he's still advising entrepreneurs now, um, and he is, you know, really building up, helping amongst many other people in the West Bank and Gaza, um, and in Palestine slash Israel in general, uh, you know, Palestinians. So you're, you're suggesting something I think is very important, sometimes we don't think a lot about, which is the idea, which Ovi underscored, which is completely right, which is these phenomena are bottom up. If you don't understand what people need on the ground on their terms and what's going on there, that's a problem. At the same time, yep. there seems to be, if I'm hearing you correctly, an amazing opportunity with the diaspora communities, and that we should be thinking about it holistically in that. Could you, any more that you'd want to add to that, or is that a fair way to sum it up? Uh, yeah, I, I think that there, there are many initiatives, and I think maybe Egypt is, is familiar with, with them as well. So there are, uh, you know, there is NEGMA, for instance. There is this Egyptian uh, organization that's really concerned about social economic development and a focus on entrepreneurship between Egyptian Americans and Egyptians in Egypt, um, and many other initiatives. For instance, there's uh, an organization in Palestine called Leaders that's bringing Palestinian entrepreneurs to Silicon Valley in something called the Palestinian House in Silicon Valley, and also bringing American entrepreneurs to Palestine to discuss entrepreneurship and to really give advice. So I think that uh, relationship is very important. You find many people, I'm, I'm one of them, so I speak for myself, and and my uh, friends and colleagues who grew up in the diaspora and want to help and contribute. And so there are increasingly more ways to do that. Ovi? I would like to, to add to what you just mentioned. I really love history and I love traveling. And yes. I think what you are building is a tool for immersion, even if you don't need to travel. But the power and connectivity, what we just mentioned before, and you mentioned some examples, uh, taking people to their places of origin and building a kind of sense of identity or of, uh, encouraging them to give back and channeling those sorts of resources to people that are vetted on the ground, like organizations like Flat Six Labs that also is a partner of the, the GIST initiative. So you see the different roles that each organization and each technology can play in bridging and connecting the people on the ground that try to change the lives of their communities. They take the initiative, they're entrepreneurs, they look whatever they have nearby, they take it to the, this level and then they connect with Flat Six Labs. Yeah. And then they come, maybe internationally, they go for more resources, they go to investors, connect with people like you, Chris. So all of these pieces of the ecosystem, they can function really well uh, together to actually support entrepreneurs that uh, can later on become role models. So 
wanted to connect the, the, a little bit the pieces. Uh, Perfect. Yeah. yeah. Look, I, I'm going to ask you, I could ask any of you this question, but I'm going to ask you uh, this, Ramez. What's the average age of a startup in your, uh, in flat six? Would you guess? Of uh, the founders? Yeah. 24. 24 years old. 24 years old. All right. Wow. Every, follow, yeah, just following up on the, like, the last question, the last yeah. point, like two of our youngest entrepreneurs, Omar and Mottas, they just graduated Cairn University two years ago. And uh, they started Instabug. I'm not sure if you heard about it before. Yeah, so they moved to Silicon Valley like around uh, last year, and um, they launched Instabug there. And now they have millions of developers and users using their platform. One of them is ePay, Marks and Spencer, Stanford University, and like many other customers using their applications. Just like they graduated school in Egypt two years ago, and they're 24 years old. Is a, but are you giving the message that people should come to Silicon Valley? Not, not necessarily, but their product is designed and developed for Silicon Valley. So they are talking mobile app developers. It's a, it's a platform for testing mobile applications. So their market is in Silicon Valley. The question I wanted to ask you about age, and any of you can react to this overall, because I've struck this every emerging market I've been to, in conflict or otherwise, that there is a fundamentally different outlook mm -hmm. among people under the age of 30 and people my age or older. The way they view the world, the way they view the problems. I mean, it's amazing. People my age and older are still, even if they really weren't there, they still are very Cold War thinking. They're very top-down thinking. They very much think everything's been tried before. Government institutions have to solve everything. And, and what strikes me is when I meet young people everywhere, they just kind of look at a problem and say, we're not going to wait a generation to fix it. We're going to do it now. And now we have the tools to do it. Almost every problem becomes a software problem. And can you just talk a little bit about what's I, changing so much in the mindset? I think, yeah, it's a changing in their mindset of like how, how they grew up. Like these, yeah. these entrepreneurs, for example, they grew up like reading TechCrunch and Mashable and just following the news of all the big IPOs and success stories. And just like, they always think, why wouldn't we do it? Like, why wouldn't we have the same success story ourselves and just start something and see how it will go? And this is the whole idea of what we're doing actually in Egypt, trying to motivate them, trying to get them excited about starting their businesses. And like speaking about like, you know, the elder uh, age group, like we are open for any like, you know, entrepreneur, like our oldest entrepreneur was like 45 years old or something. And I don't see like there's a huge difference between dealing with entrepreneurs in different ages at Flat Six Labs, but I would say definitely like the younger are more like, you know, open to, um, to learn. They're so eager to learn and improve their skills and to go out there and discover new things. And Egyptians by nature, like Middle Eastern, they, they don't like to go outside of their comfort zone. Just like we lived in a comfort zone in Egypt for like 60 years or something. And just going out there and discovering new things, it's something very big actually for Egyptians. And the thing that I have noticed about the new generation, they don't care. They just like, they would do it. They will go, they talk to people, they have no problem at all just like, you know, going and introducing themselves to like someone who's really high profile or something and just like, talk to them about their company. And this is what we do every, every week, actually, at Plastics Labs, trying to engage like all the business executives and uh, bigger entrepreneurs, actual older entrepreneurs, to come to Plastics Labs and meet the younger generation. So yeah, this is me. Yeah. As my even, even, even our Raza. I'd love to, yeah, I'd love to add um, a, a couple of things. So I think with the, you talk about this a lot in your book, Startup Rising, uh, the, the proliferation of mobile tech, right? And, and, and we think about how that transgresses boundaries and borders and things that otherwise in the older generation really couldn't be transgressed and you couldn't go from place to place or, or transfer mm -hmm. ideas so easily. So that's a big, a huge part of it. Uh, I, I think in terms of speaking, like, so look, from a diaspora perspective, I grew up, so I'm, you know, first generation who was born and raised here. My, uh, my father was born in Palestine and he grew up in a very mentality of, it was survivalist. That was what was, especially because of the migration here. So. I'm now in this generation where I do have more opportunities, but I'm also, I, I can think outside the box. So there's a, you know, there's sort of an element of, he always grew up under, you know, repressive regimes. And there's this element of now being liberated, but also being able to, to have the freedom, the economic freedom to, to do what I want. You know, within bounds, I still have to feed myself, but yes. Obi. Yeah, I would like to add that I think also the increased availability of, of very practical educational materials, like all the MOOC uh, programs and... Define an MOOC, most people know, but to tell them. Massive, online, I, I always... Courses, but, but, but it's effectively... It's effectively, yeah. it's uh, education that is, uh, it's, has been designed and it's available online uh, to access it. Whoever has access to internet, they can access the, the, the materials. MIT started with the open courseware and then a lot of other universities started. 
So you have people, and we have examples from our global network that basically they, they learn on TED, uh, they use this uh, MOOC classes, they connect with alumni via diaspora, so they no longer have the patience to wait for their governments yeah. to solve their problems, to your earlier point. Yeah. So you have now, and with all the tools for visualization that we saw here at uh, USIP and there are other organizations, the problems have become very, very visible to everyone. So that's not an issue right now. So question is what you are doing about it. And there's an increased pressure, I think, that's being built at the uh, population level, at the entrepreneur's level, for more uh, transparency and also for more accountability from the government. Uh, but on the one direction. On the other direction, you have people that actually take the initiative. They don't wait for the governments and they are making whatever they can find and build companies, connect with the flat six labs and other accelerators mm -hmm. around the world and make things happen. Uh, so, and I think on our end, on the GIST initiative and the other programs, our role is finding these people and providing as much support, uh, connectivity with, uh, with people like you, Chris, and some other experts that we have that have built companies that know what it takes to uh, not just initiate a venture, but scale it up, take it to IPO, uh, so that actually you have the role models and more of the 24 year old, they will think, why not me? I think that's, a, that's a, a circle that you kind of you see all the elements coming together. I'm going to open it to the audience if they've got any questions, and I think we may have a few on Twitter as well in a second. But I just, if I could run as call you out, can you tell these folks what NAFHAM is, please? Yeah, NAFHAM, it's now it's like the biggest uh, educational platform in Egypt, started in Plastics Labs in 2012. And basically, it's an online education platform where everyone can put like a 10 to 15 minute video explaining a lesson in, in Egyptian schools. And it's mainly targeting the public or like the governmental schools in Egypt from the first grade up to like the last grade. And now they have more than 15,000 videos online and uh, being watched by more than 3 million viewers actually. And they have expanded in like to the Syrian uh, curriculum as well. So for all like the Syrians around the world after the conflict in Syria, they can uh, teach their kids like um, anything on Nafham based on the Syrian curriculum. Same for Saudi and same for Algeria as well. So yeah, this is not. Oh. Uh, to add, one of the things we have started on our program is called GIST Tech Connect where basically we are using the infrastructure from here from DC and we are inviting very successful entrepreneurs, including diaspora entrepreneurs. And we, connecting, we are connecting these entrepreneurs on very practical entrepreneurial topics from raising capital to bootstrapping, selling, uh, with uh, entrepreneurial hubs around the world. And two days ago we did one uh, on the topic from lab to market. Mm -hmm where we had uh, 25 viewing sites from around the world. People from Jakarta uh, to Cote d'Ivoire, uh, uh, even uh, where else we had uh, Pakistan, Egypt, Ethiopia, Latin America. So we had hubs of entrepreneurs connecting and asking live questions from our uh, entrepreneurs in the studio. Uh, and we have done a series of them. We always produce a visual summaries of everything that has been discussed and we share it and translate it as a way to actually bridge the know-how and experience that there is in US and other parts of the world. We had guest speakers also from Egypt, uh, an Egyptian entrepreneur that raised on Kickstarter 80,000 US dollars. Actually, I forgot to tell you about this story, yeah. like uh, about the age and like, you know, their uh, openness to go on. Uh, so like this, this company are saying it's, a, it's one of ours actually, yeah. it's called Integrate. And uh, the CEO is, yeah, Amr. Amr, he came to me and said that we, um, we are going to TechCrunch uh, Disrupt in Berlin, like the conference, the first time mm -hmm. TechCrunch does the conference in Europe. And uh, he said, I'm mainly going there to get featured on TechCrunch. And he's basically paying like two, two or three thousand euros just like as flight, as, a, as the event ticket, just to go and get got featured on like TechCrunch and told him, are you sure you want to do this? Like you don't have that much money just like to go and it's a, like a strike of luck if you get featured in TechCrunch. So they went and they were voted as like, you know, the choice audience and he pitched on, on the stage. He delivered an amazing pitch actually. Everyone loved it. Yosef Arge was there and like he loved the uh, pitch. And after that they launched their Kickstarter campaign. They were raising $10,000. And yeah. they reached the target in six hours. And by the end of the campaign, which was 30 days, they raised around $85,000, which wow. is like 800% yeah. their, tar yeah, their target. 85,000 hoping to raise 10. Yeah. yeah. Wow. And uh, they manufactured the product in China. They went to China. And they delivered more than 2,000 units in the past month. 
and by the end of the year they're expecting to deliver more than 5,000 units. To build, to build on the story, on the Reconnect program, we have a partnership with TechCrunch where we'll, we'll bring three of the entrepreneurs from South and Central Asia to this edition in London. So we'll have either from India, Pakistan, from the South and Central Asia, they will have the chance to participate in this year occasion of this partnership with TechCrunch. And, and we, uh, go ahead, and just on a macro perspective, yeah. one last thing is you, you, mentioned, uh, you mentioned Gaza, I didn't ad address it, but what's great is that in the headlines in the Middle East, at least, all we see is, you know, conflict, ISIS, Gaza, et cetera. And it's, it's true that the, the region is in turmoil, turmoil, it is in transition. But I think it's really, it's really powerful to, to note this resilience and this continued persistence of pursuing one's dreams and this, you know, architecting your own dream. And, and I, I love looking at that, just even, even a you know, headline of listening to people in Gaza saying, you know, when will we, we be selected for the next incubator? When is our next chance to pitch? When is our, there is a quest for now more than ever this desire. And I, I will say the national security experts will say, and the numbers get thrown around, there's seven to 10,000 people in ISIS. They must be taken very seriously. They're very well funded. But the last startup competition I judged in Beirut had 14,000 uh, people participating. So we should wow. keep numeracy involved as we think about this. I think I saw a question here, please. Yes. Grab the mic if you don't, if I could bother you. Hi, Linda Staley. I want to just do a plug for Ovi's um, Tech Connect. Uh, it's an amazing uh, program, one of many that just puts out. And I find as a person that's trying to be entrepreneurial, it's been extremely helpful. Um, two areas of questions. One, we talked about young people. And um, I'd like to know uh, how you see the next generation below 24, the teens, preteens, and what you see that generation doing in, globally. Um, we started a teensdreamnet.net initiative to get teens to dream globally and our website was created by a 13 year old here in Arlington. Um, so I'd love to see what you have to say about that generation. And the next question is, um, how do you deal with collaboration and building collaboratories among your, um, your, your communities? Um, that's one of the hardest things is to get people to actually collaborate. And I think the next generation, younger uh, teens are, are more collaborative than competitive, but I'd like your thoughts on that. Thanks. Would you like to take a crack at one and then Ovi? Uh, getting, I mean, uh, getting people to collaborate, I can just touch on that real quick. Um, we're, you know, uh, if you're talking about different stakeholders, I think, I think speaking a mutual uh, language is also, if you're talking about, you know, for instance, I'm trying to collaborate with many archival programs, and what does the value add to them? Why would they, why would they want this? Well, that's, that's sort of where you, you, you frame what you're doing and you, you kind of negotiate how can we both benefit from this program. Um, that's sort of my experience in the past two months because I've been um, underground in archives, kind of negotiating with these archival programs. Uh, but with, in terms of, I think, the ecosystem in general, you guys can, can speak to that a little bit more. Uh, yeah, I mean about like uh, engaging the younger uh, generation. Um, so like a few months ago, like last year, sorry, um, like around three or four, uh, 14 years old guys, they knocked on the doors of Flat Six Labs in Cairo. I wasn't there, actually, I was traveling. And one of my colleagues, uh, he received them and just like said, what, what do you want? They said that we love you so much, we love Flat Six Labs, we love what we are doing and would like to be part of it. Can you please accept us? Can we apply to Flat Six Labs? And of course, like legally we can't take them, we can't like establish or register a company for like someone younger than 21 years old. And still like they're in school. And so I, when I came back to Egypt, I, I met with them actually, I called them and I met with them and the guys are brilliant. They started like a competition, a tech competition in their school and they, they made it open to like the schools around them and they started like teaching them how to develop using .NET or like mobile application technology and stuff and they had more than 100 something people showing up at their events and I like them so much so I like, I said like, come here, I'll give you like a desk, work from there for like three or four months during summer and just be around. Be around to meet with the entrepreneurs, be around like to meet with the startups and people who visit Plastic Slabs in general on our accelerator. And it went very well actually. They started like a program called Next Juniors or something. And uh, now it's like you know a school program where they can go around and teach uh, programming in different schools. And uh, definitely I think one day they will join Plastic Slabs and start uh, a very successful company. Of anything uh, to build on the collaboration part, I think uh, also on the ecosystem build up. Uh, it, it's a critical uh, skill 
uh, if you partner with the organization, the way we, we did with the GIST initiative, we look at finding organizations that have similar missions with what we want to do on the ground. And basically, when you have that sense of alignment between the mission, as you work very closely together by leveraging each other's strengths. Mm -hmm. uh, or secondly, uh, globally, uh, because you cannot be present in all the countries. So what we have done is we created a, a social uh, network. Of, we have about 240,000 people on Facebook now across all the countries where people share information. Uh, they find ways, they ask questions about how did you solve this, how did you solve that. And the third way is actually you bridge together the people that come across, like a generation of from a, uh, from Flat Six Labs, connecting with other uh, uh, entrepreneurs from other accelerators. So because the problems are different, but they are so similar as well. So if you build those bridges of communication and collaboration be between organizations, they can help each other much more effectively than waiting for someone to help them. You have a question up here, please. Yeah. Hi, uh, my name is Ivana, and a little background myself is that um, I am an entrepreneur. Um, I just my company just got acquired by a Silicon Valley tech company, and we were doing work in the Middle East and Africa. And, and because of uh, my work in the Middle East and Africa, I'm, a, I'm also a mentor to tech incubators in Kabul, Afghanistan, uh, Kenya, and uh, and Tunisia. And so my question for you is a lot of the startups that I've seen and I've had mentored and you know and I've also done one too is is usually about the application of existing technology already. So tying it back to the Peace Tech Summit, you know, we're using SMS, for example, to do some really creative and, in, and innovative things. But at the same time, there isn't that sort of that technological breakthrough, um, perhaps mixed dimensions from Jordan, which does 3D modeling um, and printing, perhaps they're sort of on, you know, on the edge of that technology breakthrough. But I kind of want to um, hear your opinions on why that is. Why is it that a lot of these startups in conflict zones focus so much on the application of existing technology rather than creating something different in artificial, you know, um, intelligent life, etc. I'm actually going to add something to that one, but anyone would like to talk about, you know, innovation and, and it, does innovation in emerging markets mean the next, Silicon Valley, it's always the next shiny new thing. Maybe it means something else in conflict zones or emerging markets. I mean, how should we be thinking about her question? I, I think uh, when I look at our entrepreneurs, you also see, like for example, we have, of course, everyone knows Hint Hobeka from, uh, from Lebanon. So she came up with a device that you attach it to your swimming goggles that allows uh, swimmers to track their uh, progress in swimming. Nowhere in the West there was a device like that invented. Of course, you have the things for wearables on the go, so on and so forth, but it does not apply for swimming. We brought her to the Consumer Electronics Show in 2013, and she got the CES uh, Consumer Innovation Design Award. So this is an example of uh, the innovation from the Middle East that was recognized on the global scale with global applicability as well. Another one we brought from uh, Croatia, Teddy the Guardian, is a teddy bear that actually has uh, sensors incorporated that can also allow uh, parents to take the, the different uh, uh, health signs from the kids, also featured in Time Magazine, so on and so forth. Of course, the most number of, of, of uh, companies will be applications of already existing technologies, but there are also examples of innovative products that have global applicability. I had a conversation with a great entrepreneur named Sami Tukan, who founded what was effectively the Yahoo of the Middle East, and we talked about this subject. Um, and he said, he said, just put yourself in our market's mind for a second. Pretend it's 2005, and a young kid comes home to his parents and he says, you know, I'm dropping out of college because I'm going to build this new thing called a social network. And trust me, 600 million people are going to come to it, and it's going to be very successful, I'm going to be a billionaire. He said, you know, his parents would have thrown him out of the house, his friends would have mocked him, mm -hmm. the teachers would have berated him. And so one of the things, you know, Ivana, that I've seen in this kind of a thing is, is twofold. One is that the flywheel of success, breeding success is incredibly powerful. Because of Sami Tukan, because Yahoo bought that company, there is going to be other people who follow on with existing technologies, but other people will experiment. Because so many of these regions, as you know so well, they're mobile countries first. They never knew landlines. So it's pretty clear that at some point there's going to be a mind-boggling innovation that's going to come from places that we never think about it overall. But sometimes I think we need to check our definition of innovation. 
because for a society that never had a smartphone and has now 70% smartphone penetrations, that is innovation. And from that, I think very, very powerful things will come with a flywheel that will be very, very powerful. It's a staging thing I think we've seen. I mean, again, think about what just happened to Alibaba. I mean, there's nothing new in Alibaba, but I sure wish I invested in it five years ago. <laughs> Thanks very much. Um, my name yeah, is Andrew I'm Reynolds. I work at the Department of State, your neighbor across the street. Uh, this is a peace tech summit in engineering durable peace, by definition, by, by title. I wonder if we might ask the entrepreneurs. Uh, you know, the internet and this mobile technology is not an inalienable right of man. It is an infrastructure, and it's populated, and it's built on the, the shoulders of giants, to use old paraphrasing. You're talking about use and users and applications. I wonder if some of your entrepreneurs in your experience are also looking at off-grid technologies to provide electricity, especially in rural settings. Because we're in an urbanizing world where rural populations are moving quickly in the urban environments without infrastructure. And similarly, the rural environments do not have steady sources and reliable sources of electricity to harness the mobile technologies. So are your entrepreneurs in your experience, also working in the engineering fields, in electrical, civil, and mechanical engineering fields, to in fact harness such technologies so you might have a reliable off-grid system. Thanks. So yeah, I think I'll, I'll answer this question. Um, yes. The short answer is yes. Um, and finally, enough, when we started Plastics Labs, just like going through the applications, we thought that we'd focus on mobile applications, social networks, when we started. And last cycle, we had company doing recycling. So just like it emerged from social networks and mobile applications up to recycling. And now we are mainly innovation driven uh, accelerator, not just focusing on tech or technology. And um, answering the question about like engineering, yes, one of our companies is actually doing exactly the same. It's called Sanergy. Uh, it's, it provides solar energy solutions for off the grid market. And they have developed like a solar lantern actually for, uh, for all like, you know, the off grid. Uh, communities in Egypt and they are working with uh, local NGOs to finance uh, these lanterns for the of, the of the grid communities as well. And something else, for example, is not like engineering, but it's an e-commerce for handicrafts called Yadawaya, which in Arabic means handicrafts. Um, mm -hmm. It's a website mainly f to take, like you were mentioning the handicrafts and uh, that woman, and basically it takes all the handicrafts that these uh, women creates from all over the societies around Egypt and they put them online and they sell them all over the world, like through Aramix and other uh, couriers, they can send them anywhere. And they have like more than 70 items uh, sales per day on the other way now. And also, for example, there's Khubz, which is, um, they are manufacturing the first bread uh, baking machine in Egypt for the Egyptian bread. The Egyptian bread is called Baladi bread, which is really difficult actually to do any innovation actually in it. And it has been the same process for like 7,000 years or something. And, um, and they basically, they, they have examined the whole process and they've decided that we'll create a machine that will take like the, the flour from like as an input and just to produce like the, the bread. And they're almost there. They are, um, they're almost done with the prototype and um, they have like five or six pre-orders now for uh, big bakers in Egypt. And this is one of the biggest problems that we have, for example. Were you going to add over here? Yes. Uh, I was thinking about the same example with the solar-based lantern. Uh, the second one is a company that was not in the just initiative, but Promethean Power, uh, MIT originated. Basically, they are uh, able to provide solar-based refrigeration that helps uh, with the transportation of food. A lot of the food, in, and they are doing the piloting in India, a lot of the food uh, gets bad, the perishable food during the transportation. So basically, they found a way uh, to design uh, something that allows uh, them to capture solar energy so that they preserve the, the, the food uh, in India. And the second one is together with the US State Department, we'll be organizing next week actually a, a boot camp in Morocco, uh, focus on uh, green and renewable technologies where we'll have entrepreneurs from Morocco and from Tunisia. So I'll be able to give more examples by email desalinization, uh, fresh food, all these kinds of things I've seen a lot too. And also, I mean, it's so interesting how we think about innovation and technology. There's a guy I got to know pretty well who runs one of the largest mobile providers in Africa who discovered that a couple of years ago, because of the distance with which they put cell towers, they of course have to have their own independent energy source. And what they found out is they had much more energy than they could ever use. And all of a sudden a guy from the town would show up and say, can I take some of that? 
and they would sell some of it to him, and all of a sudden their town had electricity, whether it was in lanterns, or actually most of his business was charging mobile phones. So it's, it's just amazing, amazing where we live in. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah. I just saw another example of reviewing uh, now the recent application from South and Central Asia. There's a, a backpack to actually capture energy to recharge your mobile phone. Yeah. yeah from uh, oh. Bangladesh. Just by walking around with it effectively you, or you, solar? Uh, you, you leave it there in the sun, it, it charges and then you plug your, your mobile phone into the solar base, but also you can have it while you travel on your back. Yeah, no, no, there was, I was actually just reading an article uh, recently about how there are so many uh, you know, incubators popping up, but in, um, in Palestine slash Israel, there, well, there, there aren't as many for agribusiness incubators in the West Bank and actually I wanted to write to the author of that article because my friend who just finished her MBA here in the US is going back there leaving a you know a cushy a job to go back there and to start one of the first agribusiness incubators um, in the West Bank so I think these things are always you know ask a couple weeks later there's going to be something emerging I could keep you here for two hours and there's so many amazing things that are coming and, and folks need to be fed yeah, yeah, but I want to ask you, each of you if I could a wrap-up question uh, which I think is going to be very important for the audience. I mean, the way you talk about this, it seems such a raging no-brainer and opportunity. And yet, governments and many institutions seem not to absorb it. And you're dealing here with an audience who I think by definition does absorb it and understands it and are thinking about it in very interesting ways. But could you just express why do you think folks are having such trouble understanding this opportunity, and as importantly, if, if everyone here could walk away with one thing they're going to remember you by, about what they can take back into their perspectives to be more helpful with this going forward, what would you have them, what would you have them understand? Uh, I, I think one uh, is a question of packaging and marketing, whatever has been done so far. There are already very specific examples of how this has worked. Uh, both with like sort of global, local and regional programs. So capturing a way to go, a different approach to this uh, problem, I think it's a very critical point. Second, uh, the first one will inform the second one. I think one of the areas that needs a lot of improvement is when designing the blueprint for the uh, foreign aid development programs. Uh, many of the programs, what I saw, it's they're not all the time in sync with the needs, with the kind of in the way they are designed. Maybe they are in sync at the very broad level, uh, but what is needed is actually a, a much more um, uh, uh, an approach that understands what it takes to actually translate those programs into very practical uh, tools or vehicles or programs that will help the entrepreneurs on the ground. Uh, and th that is a very critical point because if you don't get the blueprint right, that will tend to re you will replicate the sort of incomplete or the wrong uh, blueprint. And what the way you can develop a better blueprint by actually partnering with people on the ground that have a very in-depth understanding of what is needed, and also talking to the entrepreneurs and to the people who are actually the beneficiary of those programs. Uh, and I think there's a lot of pressure right now on the governments here as well, but around the world as well, to come up with new solutions and also f uh, finding funding mechanisms for the entrepreneurs that already took their venture to a certain level. Yeah, speaking of the government, especially like the ones in the Middle East, I'm sure they're basically busy with many other things now, so like they are not, uh, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> especially in Egypt, for example, like that we have many problems for the government to solve. Regardless, they're still trying to do something in, in the space for entrepreneurship and technology and they're very active in it. They have been active actually even before the revolution with different programs. But the thing is, like when we started Flat6 Labs, I remember um, one of the founders of Flat6 Labs, he was talking to the telecom, telecommunications minister in Egypt and like explaining the model of uh, Flat6 Labs to him. And uh, he was really excited about this thing and, and he, I, he, said, he told him, you are very lucky because you can fail. You can go, like as a private sector, you can just go and have any startup or entrepreneur and they can fail and you are fine with it. I can't fail. I can't get any startup to join any of my programs as a government and fail. This would be something really bad for us as a government. And from that actually stemmed the whole idea of our uh, support to the entrepreneurs. Our first tagline of Flat6 Labs was entrepreneurship through natural selection. So we do believe in natural selection. We do believe that we just give the space for these entrepreneurs just like to innovate, grow, and or even fail. And we never say that we are responsible for their success or failure because it's totally up to them. If they have succeeded, it's mainly because they want to succeed. If they have failed, because they have failed and they weren't lucky with their venture. So this is mainly how we think about like you know 
the whole how we run plastics labs and how we deal with the government. We'd love extra support for sure from different governments in the region and our partners actually with the government in the UAE for example and they do support uh, startups in different ways but still it's mainly a private sector job to start the, these kinds of programs and engage the entrepreneurs, grow these programs and uh, create more success stories. Yeah, I think wrapping it up, what, what, um, what you two said was, was spot on. And for US government or international organizations, being aware of the political and economic context in which these entrepreneurs work, uh, whether that's an economic sector that's largely uh, in the hands of state or you know, elitist control, uh, or the political context, whatever uh, that may be. And then also um, encouraging education through not just you know, rote memorization, but in, in very much critical thinking, hands-on, um, these kinds of programs that are being supported now across the region, but continuing to do that. And then on the ground, increasing cooperation between institutions um, and then others working in business development, entrepreneurship, and education. There's a remarkable Egyptian woman who I met who's an expert in co corporate social responsibility in Egypt named Dina Sharif, and she's now mm -hmm. consultant with governments. Many of you know her. She said something to me when I was reporting that, that blew me away. It seemed so simple at one level, and I'd never had it framed this way. And she said, you know, top-down institutions mean well. I mean, they really do for the most part. But top-down institutions think about poverty and conflict and people in those circumstances as problems to be solved. We here in Washington, we here in whatever capital, we'll fix your problem from here. The top-down world, the world that we're going to, views people as assets, not problems, but assets. And I think we are opening into an era, because of tools and technology, of unprecedented unleashing of individuals on the ground, as you pointed out, Ovi, who want to solve their own problems because if nothing else, they have the greatest stake in the outcome as well as the greatest knowledge. And maybe that would be one of the most powerful things that we could think about in a very different mindset. You guys are unbelievable. It's been an honor to be with you, and thank you all for listening. Thank you. Thank you. Wow. Uh, thank you to Chris Schroeder author of uh, uh, Startup Rising. He did this, Chris did this, because this is his passion. And so let's give him a round of applause. <laughs> and what a panel to be putting together of incredible entrepreneurs. You guys are amazing, and it is so clear. Um, good ideas are just that, just good ideas without the entrepreneurs that help us realize them. So thank you very much. All right, we're going to break for lunch. Please join us for lunch out there. Um, before we go, let me just tell you the plans we've got for the rest of the day very quickly, because it rocks. What's coming up rocks. Um, we've got a lunchtime speech by Secretary Al Schaefer from the Department of Defense, and he is a key player in that part of DOD where technology really lives. Um, AT&L, uh, the Research and Engineering Division that's given us DARPA. So that should be awesome. Uh, then we have what can only be described as an extraordinary colloquy between two extraordinary people. Vin Cerf, who you know is a uh, founder of the internet and well, one of those who, who helped to create it. Um, along with Jane Hall Lute, who has worn two hats, both at the uh, Homeland Security as an undersecretary and at the UN as well. So that's an extraordinary colloquy between two people who are really um, talents, huge talents in this town. Um, after that, I will talk to you about the Peace Tech Lab. I'll just kind of bring us home. So much of what we've heard all day ties together in what we're trying to do in the Peace Tech Lab. So I'll bring us home with that um, after that colloquy. So look forward to having you all back here. But now, let's join us for lunch in the uh, outside here.
Ladies and gentlemen, the f we actually have bento boxes underneath the uh, archways here. So if you can help yourself to a lunch and join the table. Thank you.
So good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Good afternoon. Can you hear me all the way in the back here? You, yes, you can. All right, they got some thumbs up here. Very good. Please continue to eat. Uh, you don't even have to turn your chairs around until the speaker comes. But eat while you, uh, uh, while you can here. Uh, my name is Bill Taylor. Uh, I'm the acting uh, executive vice president here at the Institute of Peace, and I'm very pleased to welcome you to, uh, to this building, uh, this summit. Uh, we were just talking about the, both the diversity and the average age in this room, um, which is an order of magnitude below the Pentagon, which we were talking about. <laughs> So welcome to the Institute, we're glad to, glad to be here. We are, this Institute is federally funded, um, it's nonpartisan. Um, we are committed to the prevention, mitigation and resolution of violent disputes around the world. So this is why we're here and you are here to help us with that mission and we, we really appreciate your contribution. The other appreciation I want to give to, uh, for his contribution is Assistant Secretary Alan Schaefer, um, who is uh, going to speak to you as your luncheon speaker, and it's great to have him come across the river. Um, he, is a, he is the head of the uh, Department of Research and Engineering in, in, the, in the Pentagon's Division of Acquisitions, Technology, and Logistics. Uh, you all know as at and <coughs> close collaborator here uh, with us uh, at the Institute of Peace. On matters of technology and peace building, at &L is a key part of DOD uh, to join us for this Peace Tech Summit, for your Peace Tech Summit. Um, it's a great collaboration. Not only does it contain DARPA, that everybody is very familiar with, the internet and these kinds of things that we have uh, represented around this table and in this room, but at &L continues to be the technology hub, the supporter and partner for allied governments and militaries, for private companies, for non-governmental organizations, and a host of other beneficiaries for conflict prevention and humanitarian assistance. Again, uh, that's, that gets to our mission. In short, at &L is an originator and purveyor of peace tech in its own right. Assistant Secretary Alan Schaefer has devoted his career to making science and technology a key pillar of national defense, both in his current role and in the Air Force before that. Today's summit grows out of a similar commitment through a unique cross-discipline partnership with the National Academy of Engineering as represented by the Roundtable on Technology, Science and Peacebuilding. That roundtable convenes government, businesses, NGOs, and others to promote more strategic applications of technology to conflict prevention. And again, you can see the connection, the theme here. at &L has been a strong supporter and participant in the work of that roundtable. And for that, we are particularly grateful for the visionary leadership of Deputy Assistant Secretary Earl Wyatt uh, and his colleague, Elmer Roman. So thank you both very much for all, all your work. I'm glad you could come across as well. at &L has also supported efforts to expand the data sharing capabilities of the peace building field through the Open Situation Room Exchange, a key component of the Peace Tech Lab that Sheldon uh, Himmelfarb is going to talk to you about later on this afternoon. Every day we see the, the impact that technology has, that innovation has on conflict, good and bad, help mitigate conflict, but also help drive conflict. So this, is a, this, this conference today is a, is a great opportunity to explore that. We need the strategic focus on innovation, cross-discipline collaboration, and entrepreneurship that this summit is highlighting. So with that, I'm very pleased to welcome a strong collaborator, Assistant Secretary Alan Schaefer. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, it's probably a little strange for you all to have someone from the Pentagon come over and talk about the Institute for Peace. And I am really happy to be here today. And I want to I want to start out by saying, uh, as the ambassador said, 38 years I've been around the Department of Defense. Nobody detests armed conflict as much as the professional military man or woman. We bear the burden of it, we see the impact of it. So it is a very, very 
um, strong commitment. And Earl, why don't you go ahead and, and raise your hand, and Elmer. So we have a dis Deputy Assistant Secretary, Earl Wyatt. And, and his, his deputy for humanitarian assistance, disaster relief operations, Elmer Roman. The, these two people are pushing on the department to get involved with the, more, more deeply with the Institute for Peace. So I'm really particularly pleased to be here this afternoon to talk to you a little bit about how we see the role of science and technology. Uh, but I was sitting over here at the table and we got a summary and a recap of this morning and it sounds fascinating. Some of the things that you're doing, use, uses of commercial technology to go ahead and spread out information to start to get to some of the underlying causes of conflict. Today the Academy and the Institute have asked me to provide kind of our perception of where we are. And it's a particularly interesting time right now in the department. So you here are talking today about peace, and yet we have very, very serious armed conflict going on around the world right now. As you're all, we're all aware of Afghanistan, we're all aware of ISIS and ISIL and Ukraine. There's conflict in, in Thailand, there's conflict in South Sudan. And all of these are troublesome to the Department of Defense and they're troublesome to the nation. So how do we start to relieve some of these? We see growing tensions through the conflux of transnational criminal organizations with terrorists and how those things work back and forth leading to additional armed conflict. So we're really looking at how do we, how do we start to employ technology. What makes it particularly interesting right now is in addition to all the backdrop of terrorist operations and, and that type of thing, we're now starting to see some other nations advance their military capabilities very, very rapidly and very quickly. And very advanced high-end military uh, capabilities. We're coming out of a period where the United States had the, uh, the dominant military capability worldwide for about a 35 year period. I think that's a good thing because of the things that the United States tries to, to stand for. But there are other nations now that are coming on, coming on board with very advanced uh, high-end weapon systems. That poses a challenge because that increases the chance of conflict. So we have to pay attention to where the department is going. About two years ago, the Department of Defense published a new defense strategy. And it was a remarkable document. It's about 12 to 15 pages long. It was written by then Secretary of Defense Leon Panetta with Chairman Dempsey, uh, Under Secretary for Policy Jim Miller, and a few other people uh, over the holiday break season, the end of December, early January. They wrote it in about two weeks. and. Unlike most things in D.C. where you go into extensive staffing and bureaucracy waters down the product, this did not have that. It was written by the secretary and the chairman. They wrote it together. It was their product. I very much encourage people to go take a look at it because it really is a blueprint for a wonderful, wonderful world where we're trying to bring in peace. If you look at it, it does not look like a military document. It looks for, it looks like a stability document. And there are about four, five key principles. I'll talk about four of them. First, the military of the future will be much smaller, agile, leaner, and capable of respond, uh, response. And that response can take the place of, or uh, can take the form of humanitarian assistance, disaster relief, more so than it can take the, the uh, position of armed conflict. Second uh, principle, the DOD is working on building partnerships around the world and strengthening our key alliances and partnerships. And I'll, I'll talk about that a little bit with our International Science and Technology Program. But partnership and partnering is the key word. And when you have partnerships and partnering, you reduce the chance of armed conflict, I contend. 
we're rebalancing our global posture and looking at uh, emphasizing a the Asia Pacific region. Why are we doing that? Asia Pacific region is the region now that's economically driving the world. Uh, I was in Singapore earlier this year. I always tell this story because it's fascinating to me. There are more shipping containers that go through the port of Singapore each year than go through all the ports in the United States. Think about the economic power that's going through the Asian region and why it's so incredibly important to have a presence there for stability. And then finally, the, the fourth bullet was protect and prioritize key investments in science and technology to develop new capabilities. And I'll talk about some of the capabilities we've developed in areas that may be a surprise to some of you. So if you look at that, we're starting to see a shift in momentum for the Department of Defense to much smaller operations, things that can deploy, things that can go in and de-escalate situations. And we're looking at packages to de-escalate armed conflict and, and de-escalate uh, conflict before it happens. I'd like to go ahead and focus on three, initi or three or four initiatives that are pertinent to this conference. The first is something uh, we call the Minerva Initiative. Second, International S&T. And then third, some of the support we're doing through Mr. Wyatt and uh, Mr. Roman to support the United Nations. So Minerva, how many folks out here have heard of the Minerva program? Excellent. Would one of you want to come up and talk about it? <laughs> um, we have currently funded, Minerva is a fairly small program, but it, it is the department's outreach to primarily the socio sociologist, anthropologist community to start to understand the base roots of armed conflict and, and um, violence. Minerva is looking at th things as disparate as large data sets to look for signals early in the, early in, you know, it's like the Arab Spring, to try to pick out the precursors. We're looking for large data sets to understand some of the flow of commerce, but our flow of uh, money from transnational criminal uh, organizations and terrorist organizations. And there's an amazing correlation between the trans, transnational criminal organizations and the transnational terrorist organizations, and they feed off of each other. And that continues to perpetuate violence. Within the Minerva pro uh, Project, we're looking at mapping terrorist organizations. How do you understand the spread and what, what incentivizes terrorist organizations? If you start to understand some of the base root causes of some of these uh, activities, then you can start to go ahead and uh, treat the symptom rather than the event. And that's really the whole point of Minerva. How do you treat the symptom? We're also looking at uh, things through the Santa Fe Institute in Minerva of studying the root cause of energy and environment disruption as a precursor to violence and armed conflict. How are things like climate change and the battle for resources going to affect us in the future? And how do we think about that as a department of alleviating some of those problems? And as a nation, and it's really it becomes a national problem. But the future, the future battle over the rare resources of water and that type of thing caused by climate change will fundamentally increase in some regions the potential for violence. So what do we do about that? How do we think about that? And some of the solutions, and I'll talk about some of Mr. Roman's uh, uh, programs later, but some of the solutions for dealing with climate change are very similar to dealing with humanitarian assistance. Can you create potable drinking water out of non-potable non -drink, non drinking water or any other type of liquid? And yes, in fact, you can. Uh, Elmer's fielded systems that are deploy, have deployed in such places as Haiti, in Japan, after the, uh, the, the uh, 
tsunami that creates fresh drinking water locally. That's a huge deal. That's a huge deal for preventing and de-escalating conflict. Um, so I think, I think that as we look forward and go forward, initiatives like the Minerva Initiative, where we're trying to understand at the base root the sociological causes of armed conflict, violence, terrorism, will become very important to the Department of Defense. Okay, international science and technology. The Department of Defense currently has university grants with uh, researchers in 57 nations. Think about that. Our DOD is a global enterprise fu for funding research and development and research in universities. We have research grants in com countries such as Ethiopia, Vietnam, China, and Jordan, just to name four. Those are not places you would normally think of the DOD operating. But we believe very strongly that one of the best ways to reduce the potential for armed conflict is through understanding, through mutual understanding. We have a very strong global S&T outreach program because science and technology is one of the easiest areas for our government to interoperate. We can go in and fund research grants through the Office of Naval Research or for, through the Air Force Research Laboratory and start to build some of those relationships at the science level. 57 nations, that's a lot of grants and it's very important to our future. But in addition, we have a series of strong multilateral, bilateral and multilateral engagements around the world. We have long-standing existing relationships with Singapore, United Kingdom, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, but now we're growing our international relations, science and technology cooperation with countries like India. Um, the department recently announced the Defense Trade and Technology Initiative uh, to go ahead and work with the Indian government in both weapons capabilities and science and technology. Why are we so interested in India? Well, I was there recently and President Modi, who's going to be in town next week, has a real, real challenge. He's got to create a million jobs a month for the foreseeable future. If we don't, if he is not successful in creating that level of jobs coming up, you will have a tremendous increase in unemployment, especially among the young people, and you all know what that does to the probability of violence and armed conflict. There's already growing violence in India. There's already growing uh, disputes. A million jobs a month. How would you like to be President Modi? That is a real issue. So part of this whole initiative of the Defense Te Trade and Technology Initiative started by uh, Secretary um, Hagel was to help bring in stability into India by helping create technologies and create opportunities and jobs. And that is a way of getting at some of the root causes of armed conflict. Think about it, a million jobs a month. Okay, the final area I'd like to talk about are some of the, the types of technologies we have developed and deployed. And I'm, I'm making this fairly short because I really want to open it up to questions. I want questions or comments that you may have. Um, but again, under Mr. Roman, he has developed a series of, and they're called Joint Capability Technology Demonstration Programs, to increase deployable packages for information technology. So the Rapid Open Geospatial User Enterprise, don't you love these names? I could, honest to God, they, they put words together so you get something like the rogue JCTD. What rogue is, is a deployable package that will go out with 
ISR assets, unmanned aerial vehicles, with communications capabilities, with power and energy capabilities, so that when you have some type of natural disaster, we have a deployable package that will allow the humanitarian assistance disaster relief people on the ground to have the best possible information awareness. Where, where are their problems? Where are their opportunities? How can we map the area for greater uh, numbers of helicopter landings and airplane landings to bring in supplies? That's not always a given after a, after a disaster, after an earthquake. The more situational awareness you can give to the people who are in charge on the ground, the more quickly you can return operations and life to as near to normal as you can. That is a big deal. Part of the JCTD, and it's, this is another one of these, I gotta I got read the names because I, you can't make this stuff up. Prepositioned ex Expeditionary Assistance Kits. The peak JCTD. Um, there's nothing you can say about it. We, how many folks here are from Washington? Oh, we see, you all know this already. I mean, the first, the first trick in getting a program sold is come up with a catchy acronym. Um, but PEAK actually goes in with small deployable water generators and power generators, again, to be able to bring those necessary elements for normal life where it's needed, when it's needed. And then finally, Elmer's fielded a number uh, of small communication systems that allow you to uh, allow the responders to be able to communicate and understand what the situation is on the ground. Um, DARPA has developed and fielded a number of technologies, uh, mostly in the communications area. How do we apply small cellular, cellular towers to restore communications locally? How do we understand uh, what the precursors are to armed conflict. So are there, by going through large data sets, can we identify precursor events to increases in violence and conflict? So finally I'd like to close with what I think is one of the more exciting things uh, that we're doing. And uh, it again involves Mr. Wyatt and Mr. Roman and his support to UN peacekeeping operations. So these guys are the people in the department working with policy, but these guys are the folks who bring in the material acquisition solutions and capabilities to support the UN when the UN is deploying. So the UN is deploying some, some force to South Sudan. Uh, hmm? So, oh, Central Africa Republic, I'm sorry. Um, so Elmer went out and worked with the Army to find deployable tentage and deployable conditions so that we can actually go in and stabilize the situation, create almost a mini village. It, it's terrible, it's a refugee village, but it's still much safer than what the people are involved in anyways. So for that, guys, I gotta say my hat's off to you. Working, the Department of Defense, working with the UN to provide equipment is where we're heading for the future. And I think it's a big deal. And I think that that is gonna be increasingly where the Department of Defense will be. So with that, I'm looking at the clock. I have uh, about another 10 minutes. So I'd really like to say thank you to you all for what you're doing here today. Thank you for working with the department, even if you don't know you're doing it, to create stability and to, to minimize armed conflict around the world. Because as a career military guy, I started off by saying this, no one detests armed conflict more than a military professional. Help us, help us help the next generation so we don't have to deploy young men and women around the world to, to places with armed conflict and violence. Questions? Sir. The disaster packages that you uh, outlined here, are they available to USAID and other government agencies and, and uh, is there an outreach effort to train people up on how to use these? So 
are they on the GSA schedule yet? Or? Yep. So the short answer is yes, they're on the GSA schedule. We have other ways to, to get it. But again, Elmer, stand up. Mm -hmm. So Elmer's the program manager who did this. He'll be here this afternoon. Talk to Elmer and find out what's the right way to do it. You know, we make our stuff available for disaster relief operations around the world. We're certainly available to USAID. We'll, we'll just go around the room. Yes, ma'am. Does your international research um, fund both U.S. and overseas scientists together from universities in the U.S.? So the answer, yes. So the answer is, it, it depends, but yes. And, it, and the reason I'm giving you the qualifier, uh, yes, we do do stuff with both collaborative U.S. and overseas researchers. If it's a straight single investigator grant, obviously the answer is no. But we have all kinds of different basic science and basic research programs that involve multiple universities. So, yeah. Do you encourage that sort of international collaboration? Yes, absolutely. I mean, so the world is getting smaller. You know, Thomas Friedman kind of had it right. Um, the more that we work together and the more we understand each other, the better chance for starting to relieve some of the tensions. We always want to work with the researchers in other countries. Well, American science is great soft power. It is, absolutely right. Yeah, I'm Cole Cartledge. Uh, I'm an attorney, but also a retired military myself. And thank you for your service, sir, and your talk. Uh, my, I'm a, I was with the uh, 352 Civil Affairs Command, uh, not far from here, uh, as an international legal officer. I'm curious about how some of what you're talking about might be pushed forward and, and worked with, um, with the civil affairs community because they really do have a, a worldwide mission for a lot of these similar uh, uh, instances. I don't think I have a good answer for you. I mean, so, and the reason I don't have a good answer for you is I'm not aware of what the impediments are. I don't think that there are any legal, uh, maybe with the exception of some of the ITAR restrictions, but we tend not to get into those types of, of things for peacekeeping and, and humanitarian assistance. I think we just push on the envelope and find out where the boundary is. I do not know the answer to the question. Guys, do you know? Uh, the civil affairs community. So uh, at this stage, we're in that process of, of uh, looking at what the civil, uh, civil affairs uh, side of the house is looking in terms of capabilities, and, and then working through Department of State, kind of bring together the ideas and, and identify a way forward. So uh, so there's a dialogue already started. Uh, uh, Dr. Lee Schwartz, uh, the, the Department of State geographer, uh, he's engaging with us as well, and, and some of the capabilities Mr. Uh, Schaefer discussed uh, are being considered for those kind of efforts. But, and, and, and thank you, Elmer, but, uh, and I will say this because, you know, I, I, I feel compelled to say it every time I go out and talk. It's too easy to get a bureaucratic no so people don't try to push the envelope. Push as hard as you can, go as hard as you can, as far as you can, and make people come up with no, but make people come up with no based on statute, not opinion. Yes, sir. Uh, regarding your uh, outreach to the humanitarian community and disaster response, do you have uh, a media strategy or an outreach strategy to deal with uh, actors who may be skeptical of receiving aid or help from the Department of Defense? Could, could you repeat the question? There's a little bit of echo. Uh, certainly. Uh, regarding uh, your uh, outreach to the humanitarian community and right. disaster response, do you have a strategy for dealing with actors or countries who may be initially skeptical of receiving aid from the Department of Defense? Um, so, I think the answer is yes, but the answer is yes because we work very closely with our State Department and our overseas embassies. I mean, we obviously don't go to any country until Department of State says we're welcome. So we work with Department of State and our deployed, forward deployed ambassadors and their teams to uh, get the, and, and you know, at the end of the day, if a country says no, we don't go. But. Most people don't say no when the U.S. is coming in offering to provide assistance. 
Yes, sir. Uh, Lloyd Solis, University of Maryland. You made mention of Singapore as one of the busiest sea lanes in the whole world. And uh, considering the rise of China as a potential superpower in the future, is there any possibility that um, a U.S. military base will be revived in the Philippines or any Southeast Asian country for that matter, yeah. be it naval base or uh, air base? Thank you. Um, I think we're looking at our options right now for forward basing. Um, and, and you mentioned China. Uh, China has remilitarized incredibly rapidly. Um, but right now, so is, so is Japan. And we have North Korea and South Korea. So we look at the Asia Pacific region, and although there's no conflict there now, there are a number of potential flashpoints. So we're working through what's the best response intergovernmental for the, for the United States between state uh, aid, Department of Defense. What's our best, best uh, footing for relieving some of the conflict and some of the tension? And some, of the, some of the tensions there, I've spent a little bit of time in Asia recently, some of the long-standing uh, tensions between those nations are very, very deep. And, you know, I worry about unintended consequences spilling over into armed conflict. Um, I think the U.S. presence there is a stabilizing influence, and I think that we will have an increasing presence. That's it. No, one more question? Okay. Oh, well, we do have one more question. I'm, please, sir, yeah. Yeah, my name is Franklin. I actually came from Nigeria, you know, to witness what is going on here today. And I'm sincerely, I'm, I'm happy. And I would just like to ask one question. Even though most of the issues you have discussed here today uh, seem to have uh, answered my question, but I still would like to put the f question forward. Mm -hmm. The issue of uh, the 200 Chibo girls that are being held hostage in Nigeria, mm -hmm. I would like to know, because I'm really, really concerned, uh, if there's anything going on between U.S. Department of Defense or USIP in that regard, and if there's nothing going on, is there any way Nigeria can collaborate with America in that regard? Thank you. So that's a very good question. Um, one thing I, I will not and cannot get into is anything we're doing currently operationally. Um, it's just something we don't talk about. But I will say stability and the, the Department of Defense and the U.S. is taking the actions of Boko Haram very, very seriously. And, and that's all I'm going to say. But yes, it's a serious, serious threat and it's something we are very worried about. Okay? And that, I think that was it. Uh, by the way, thank you folks for what you're doing. And it is great to come out here and see a young crowd. Thank you very much, Al. Thank you. All right, go back. Enjoy the rest of your lunch, but we will reconvene to start promptly at 2 o'clock, the colloquy between Jane Hall Lute and Vince Cerf. So make sure you're in there for that. You don't want to miss it.
right, let's try to keep on schedule here. Welcome back from lunch. It is just such an honor to have this podium so I can introduce Melanie Greenberg, um, the president and CEO of the Alliance for Peace. Yeah, you can clap. I don't know anyone who has been more selfless or more effective at promoting the professionalism and the growth of this still young field of conflict resolution. I know that someday, Melanie, Harvard Business School is going to be doing a case study of your leadership here. And I am not exaggerating that at all. So with that, let me turn it over to Melanie, who's going to take us through the day. Thank you. And Sheldon, I'll get to embarrass you when I introduce you after this panel. But I'm Melanie Greenberg, president, as Sheldon said, of the Alliance for Peacebuilding a network of 85 peacebuilding organizations working in 153 countries around the world. I'm also very honored to be the co-chair of the steering committee with Bernard Amade of today's Peace Tech Summit and also co-chair co of the data sharing working group of the roundtable. And I feel so passionately about the connections between peacebuilding and technology and the work that Sheldon has done. Because peace, as you know, is more than just the absence of war. And peace building is more than just people coming around a peace table and shaking hands. And what struck me so much this morning was that we talked about peace in many different contexts. And actually, sometimes peace wasn't even mentioned. We were talking about agriculture, environment, entrepreneurship. But in a highly networked world, this is where peace is happening. The real excitement of the field is how to bridge peace and these other sectors, all of which we know come together to create societies that are resilient enough to resolve conflict, which is always with us, through consensus building, through problem solving, rather than through deadly violence. And technology is crucial for all of that. Um, I was in Togo recently meeting with young peace builders who self-identify as peace builders. But in fact, what they do is work on water issues at the village level, at education, on women's empowerment. But they see that work as peace. And what was equally extraordinary is that they were using a lot of the technology that we talked about this morning, from SMS and cell phones to, to mapping to um, using Google to find you know, new ways of thinking about their work. But for them, they don't see it as something radical. For them, it's like picking up a fork or using a shovel. The tools are there, and they use them. And that's very relevant for this panel, which has a very interesting title of Peace Building Meets Technology, Imagination, and Necessity. But in fact, all of those are coming together in this generation that are using tools. They're highly imaginative, yet they're working out of the most dire necessity of how to end deadly violence in their own societies, whether from the bottom up or from the top down. So it is my great pleasure to introduce this panel, which has great personal meaning for me, as well as substantive meaning. Uh, the first, Robert Rosigliano, who will be moderating. I've known Rob for at least 20 years. Rob chairs the Alliance for Peacebuilding board, was one of the founders of the Alliance for Peacebuilding, and is one of the great builders in our field. When he ran Conflict Management Group at Harvard, a spinoff of Harvard's negotiation program, um, he merged that with Mercy Corps, the large development organization. And it was one of the first mergers that brought peace building and conflict resolution together with development, which has now become really the paradigm for the field. You can't have one without the other. As I mentioned, he founded uh, the Alliance for Peace Building. He is now head of a revolutionary program at the University of Wisconsin that brings hard scientists and social scientists students together to study sustainable peace building. And he has a wonderful book on the subject called Making Peace Last. Um, so Rob, thank you very much for moderating this panel. Uh, Jane Hall Lute has been one of my great heroes throughout my career. We actually met at Stanford more than 25 years ago when I was... <laughs> less than 25 years ago. Less, much less, time work. Uh, well, Jane was blazing through her PhD before going on to work on war termination with Norman Schwarzkopf. Um, I got to know her through my husband, Lawrence, who was a political science graduate student at the same time. And Jane would just start a conversation by saying, 
I'm just a simple soldier. And you knew that what came out of her mouth next was going to be the most profound thing that would change the whole scope of the conversation. That's very nice. Um, I then worked with Jane at the Carnegie Commission for Preventing Deadly Conflict, where again, uh, with David Hamburg, reshaped the whole idea of how our field thinks about conflict prevention, realizing it's not just uh, process, but also structure. At the UN Foundation, she helped change the thinking of how we integrate peace building into programs with women, programs in innovation. And then at the United Nations itself, as running their peacekeeping, uh, as being uh, number two at their peace peacekeeping operations unit, and then as Assistant Secretary for Peace Building. And finally, the Department of Homeland Security. I always felt comfortable knowing that Jane, in this situation that was looking at the direst consequences for our country, at the worst of the worst of uh, potential terrorist attacks, was always bringing peace building values to that job. So I slept well at night knowing that you were there. Oh, thank you. And finally, Vince Cerf. I feel, Vin, and we just met, like introducing Mr. Gutenberg at a printing convention <laughs> or the Wright brothers at an aviation convention. Um, it was very hard for me to wrap my mind around how do we talk about one of the fathers of the internet. And it occurred to me last night as I was at my son's last back to school night where the chemistry teacher and the math teacher both said we've thrown out textbooks. We like to go on the internet and find problems that are going to excite the kids. We just don't do teaching the same way anymore. Um, to these peace builders in Togo who are using the internet in ways that would have been unimaginable uh, 15 or 20 years ago. So I hope that you feel in this uh, discussion today and meeting members of the, of the peace building community how grateful we are for all you have done academically in your work at Google in shaping this technology that is really defining our age. Um, so with that, thank you and I look forward to the discussion. Thank you. So, um, I've already made one critical decision here, which is I, uh, Vin handed me his card and it says Chief P uh, Internet, Internet Evangelist, Evangelist at, uh, at Google. And I thought, well, as chair of the Alliance for Peace Building, I can make the unilateral decision to change Melanie's title from President and CEO to Chief Peace Building Evangelist. Yeah, I think amen. that's a much right. better. Yeah. Good. 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 Thank you. Great. We're done. We got one. Chalk one up. Okay. Um, well. So uh, I wanted to um, let you know the, the sort of um, choreography of, of today's panel will be um, so, some opening statements by Vint and Jane, and then some discussion amongst the three of us, and then we'll open it up to questions from folks here in the auditorium, but also people online. Uh, and I, before I, I turn it over, I wanted to just give one sort of observation that hit me as we went through the, the morning um, and the various panels that we had, and it has to do with what's up on the screen here and a possible um, incompatibility, which is in you know, the technology world, and I hope I'm not telling you anything you don't already know, and I'm, uh, I hope I'm getting it at least right, is you, you, you hear about speed all the time. It's like how, how fast can we get to market? We want to fail fast. We, we want to aggregate information, curate it, get it out to as many people as fast as, as fast as we can, rapid prototyping. And then in the peace building world, um, you know, people may be thinking in sort of longer time frames. So the, the, the word durable up there, which maybe is purposely shaded a little bit to, um, for that reason, yeah. is there a conflict and, and to what degree is there between just, if we're trying to talk about how to get these worlds together and, and mutually empowering each other, is there some fundamental incompatibility between how we think and the cycles at which we work um, and, and what are the, the opportunities and the promise that, that you all see? So I'm hoping we'll cover some of that uh, territory over the course of our discussion, but maybe if we start with just your sort of opening thoughts when you think about technology and peace building and the relationship between them. Uh, did we flip a coin earlier? I don't know if we, uh, yeah, she did. Vint, you get to go first. Are you sure? Did you flip a coin? In my mind. I yeah, I, oh. Jane won. We should take you to uh, Las Vegas with us. <laughs> Uh, well, I, first of all, it's a special honor to appear on the stage with these two, especially with Jane. Let me tell you about Jane. This is a person who knows why she has opinions, and it's not common uh, in the administration to have somebody who has an opinion and then can explain why she has that opinion and where it came from, so I have a lot of respect for that. Uh, second, with regard to your conundrum, let me explain that making things happen sometimes takes a lot of time, even in the engineering world. Despite all of this, you know, internet time and rush to this, that, and the other, 
when Bob Kahn and I wrote the first spec for internet, it was 1974. We didn't get to turn it on into operational form until 1983. It took nine years. The interplanetary internet's taken 15 years, and it's now finally functioning. But some of these things just take time. Let me start out by observing that you can't solve these kinds of problems, peace building, peacemaking, creation of peace, and uh, the um, conditions under which peace can be maintained or even created without understanding what the origins of conflict are. And sometimes it has to do with resources, sometimes it has to do with ideology, sometimes it's as simple as you're in charge and I'm not and I don't like that. That's a tough one, because there's not necessarily a good argument that lets you reverse that view that I should stay in charge, and we see this all the time. So that's one point. Understanding the origins of conflict is essential to figuring out if there's a way to defuse uh, the conflict. The second thing is that we are faced with the politics of poverty versus the politics of plenty. And in my world, trying to create plenty to avoid the politics of poverty to, uh, or the, you know, the, the stress between abundance and scarcity, that's a big deal. Trying to create abundance where it isn't uh, is really important. And finally, uh, I think, Jane, you and I should try in the course of this conversation to help these people understand the difference between safety and security because we've had a lot of discussion about the difference between those two terms, and, and I thought you articulated it extremely well in your time as Deputy Secretary of Homeland Security, uh, recognizing that the title of the organization was almost wrong given what it was you were charged to do. So I'm going to stop there and hand over to my distinguished colleague. So, th thanks, Vint. It, it's also a special uh, pleasure for me not only to be at USIP, my doctor father, Alexander George, uh, was a fellow here uh, for several years. Um, and Melanie is, is not only one of the kindest people on earth, one of the smartest people I know, um, has, has been a pioneer. I love your suggestion, Rob. You are chief peace building evangelist. Um, I'm going to stake out uh, what may prove to be some controversial ground on two fronts. Uh, I think we are witnessing the intersection of two very powerful trends that is probably changing the role of government in our lives. Um, and that intersection, uh, and that the, because the role of government in our lives will be changing how we approach the prospects for peaceful coexistence, um, that, that there are implications for that. So the two trends, one is a trend of growth and one is a trend of decay. The trend of growth is what I call the, the global cyber awakening, mm -hmm. which is the social consequences of the penetration of the internet. It's not the same thing, it's the social consequences mm -hmm. of the penetration mm -hmm. of the internet. In 1996, 15 or 16 million of us were online, today 3 billion. That's yeah. pretty substantial yeah. growth. Yeah. Um, you know, the big money is on the O3B, the other 3 billion. Um, it will not take them 20 years to, to get, get online the way it took the first half of the world. We are, all, we are connected to each other and to ideas and to possibilities and to power in ways we were never before. And when I say we, I mean we the people. Um, it's extraordinary, this explosion of awareness of other and of empowerment. We like it and we want more. And it's, and it's just a massively accelerating, powerful trend uh, and I call it the global cyber awakening. Um, and this for a population in the world that is already healthier, wealthier, more mobile, more educated than it ever before in history, notwithstanding the problems we have. This is enormous individual empowerment on a scale I don't think we have ever seen. And it's smashing into a trend of decay, which is the near total collapse of trust in public sector institutions, and it's global. People everywhere around the world are angry at their institutions. They don't like banks, they don't like business, they don't like the media, they don't like markets. Many of them don't like their governments, and they're angry about it. There's a great deal of anger, whether it's manifest in the Occupy movement, demonstrations in Rio, in Istanbul, anywhere you like around the world. This is broad-based social anger. Um, and it's targeting the public institutions of our lives about which and in which we have lost faith. 
So we have an enormous trend of growth uh, in the global cyber awakening, an enormous trend of decay in the near total collapse of trust in public sector institutions. Um, and I think there's going to be consequences mm -hmm. for the role of government in our lives. Yeah. So I spend a lot of time these days talking about cybersecurity. I tell people there are only three interesting questions when it comes to cybersecurity. I'm not a technologist, that's why there are only three. <laughs> <laughs> Question number one is how do we architect systems we can trust from components we can't? Yep. Question number two, how do we maintain the integrity of our information and our identities in an open mm -hmm. internet? Mm -hmm. And question number three is what will the role of government be? in all of this. Now why is this an interesting question? Because Vint mentioned security. Governments are used to being the dominant players, in fact they're used to being the monopolists in the security space. We assign security to governments. We want safe streets, governments you run the police. We want a safe country, governments you run the military. So governments are used to being the monopolists in this space and they are in physical space, but they're not in cyberspace. And they're not because governments don't have the power that matters. They're the dominant players in security and physical space because they have the power to protect us. But it's the power to connect us that constitutes power in cyberspace, and governments are just market participants here. So I think in the backdrop of the very important, I think, and interesting things that Vint laid out uh, on the table, a little bit of role reversal here in terms of character of conflict, um, I think this is a strategic and tectonic shift um, in the way geography matters, in the way geopolitics matters. You mind if, yeah, if we, uh, something, this is really interesting. Government had a very important role to play in creating the connectedness that we now both enjoy and fear. So government did have a role to play, but uh, Jane's right, it has now gone well beyond government. The internet is owned and operated 95 or 99 percent by the private sector. So this is, it's a correct observation. Uh, the other thing that's very scary about uh, this kind of technology is that uh, it is uh, apolitical to first order and therefore can be used for a bunch of different reasons, including really harmful ones. And we're seeing the power of that connectivity and communications uh, in some of the actions by ISIS uh, in you know, YouTube and online videos, which are horrendous and scary, and they, they hit us as if they were next door because of this uh, lack of distance. The network makes us feel like everything is happening in our own backyard, which creates a great deal of angst uh, for a lot of people, I think. You know, ISIS has gotten strong because they can, you know, people are coming from everywhere. They will go anywhere because they feel as though they belong nowhere. Mm -hmm. Wow. So what is the role of government in solving this problem? So, so let me ask you if, to step back even from, from that, and maybe, maybe plumb, look in, in, the, in, the, um, in the vein of trying to plumbing the depths of the promise. What, Jane, when you were talking about the, the, the nature and the order of the change the, in that growth phase, it, it strikes me that we talk a lot about as technologies sort of ex helping us do, if you will, mar things that we do marginally better, like we're faster in knowing about uh, movements of refugees, we're faster in knowing about activities of armed groups or whatever it is. Um, so there's that, there's that t potential for technology to sort of make a very significant contribution to doing the stuff we know, right now we know we need to do, but do it better. Versus the capacity, our capacity, to kind of reimagine just what the task is and what the promise is. So it's, it's um, is the limiting factor our, just the ability of the technology, the, the, the state of the technology, or is it more the, our ability, our human ability? to sort of re fundamentally rethink how we should be organizing ourselves, because as, as you both were talking about, if the nature of government is fundamentally changing, you know, that, that's a really profound opportunity to reimagine how we relate and how we organize ourselves. So, so how do you see that, that, that challenge? You suppose well, this is a failure of imagination? A failure yeah. of imagination. I, I would say um, it depends on how you narrate the problem. I mean, to me, the value proposition of government is to establish threshold conditions for security, well-being, and justice. You know, that's just sort of the going in proposition. Don't you love it the way that just rules <laughs> right out? It's, wow. Well, but what we see now is how many people find, can find an, a measure of security or answer to their concerns about security by going online? I mean, nobody mm -hmm. interacts with their government unless they have to. <laughs> 
unless they have to. It's like the Department of Motor Vehicles. <laughs> Virginia's got a great DMV, I'm just yeah, here to say. Yeah. <laughs> um, Pick a number. So, so let's put the problem at the center. If you want to prevent the emergence of mass violence, I mean, I listened to Vin um, when he laid out the problem, and of course he's right. On the other hand, we have a lot of mythologies about violent conflict. I mean, calling a conflict religious or talking about poverty as the source of conflict may tell you about why there's disagreement. It's not telling you anything about why people are killing each other mm -hmm. over those disagreements. Mm -hmm. So if point. you want to prevent the emergence of mass violence, it's a separate problem from trying to prevent the spread or contagion mm -hmm. of violence, which is a separate problem from trying to prevent the reemergence of violence once peace has been achieved. Is there a role for technology in helping us solve each of these problems? I think so. The problem is that not that we don't know, it's that we don't like the action implications of what we do know. Do you think that the, uh, the technology has legitimized or allows people to legitimize violence? Everybody's doing it, it must be okay. I, I don't know, I'm not or, saying Or that, that there's, really. anybody can get their narrative out there. So, so they're, 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 everybody has a narrative and, and if we, does that give legitimacy to I think there's no, there's no question about it. What you'll find are fellow travelers. I mean, you know, we have, it, it, I think one of the things the internet has done is it completely disintegrated the notion of a minority. I mean, because you can find virtual company um, on for any issue and for any perspective on any issue. Well, to the extent that the minority in the past would have had difficulty finding voice, the internet is an amplifier. Right. Not only does it make the voice louder, but it also draws other people in who have, would not otherwise have known that they had fellow travelers who were, had the same view. So that's a good point. You know, I, I think one of the things that we've thought about our international institutions, certainly over the course of my lifetime, is that they function to be a check on unilateral action. Right? We'll put, we'll put ourselves all in a club, all in a group, and we'll keep an eye on each other, but we share principles, and so we have kind of a predictable bandwidth of behavior, and so it will be a check on unilateralism. But what we've seen instead is precisely what you've described, is that they've become amplifiers of unilateralism. Um, and that's, it's kind of, I think, not intended. I don't think we know what institutions now mean in the age of, of instant access to others who think like us. So there was a time when uh Esther Dyson made the observation that the antidote for bad information was not censorship, but more information. And that sounds pretty good on the surface, but I am beginning to wonder, the more information makes it sometimes harder to find the information, and so even if it's there, uh, I guess we should let's hear it for good search engines, but then we have the other problem that we, <laughs> we get the, the bubble effect, uh, the filter effect, where you find the stuff that is of interest to you and reinforces your own view and you don't see the other stuff, so you never discover there's a different argument that would have changed your mind. So this is, uh, I, we definitely do not have technology as the deus ex machina in this story. It may be a tool, but it may not be the thing that saves us unless our imaginations allow us to use it in ways that solve this problem. If pushing, pushing into the area that you, you mentioned, Vint, at the beginning, around the, so we look at the uh, the, the general sort of accepted drivers of conflict, or the traditional drivers of conflict, and we were to push into that realm and say, well, where is it that technology can be of service to those that would like to see conflict go in the constructive path as opposed to the destructive path? You mentioned if, if, um, if, if the internet can be an amplifier for unilateralism, it sort of bodes against mm -hmm. the, as, as an amplifier for collaboration, but can it be how, or how can it redefine what happens at that early stage of, well, of conflict? Democratization of access to information has to count for something. Uh, the, the notion of misunderstandings, take genetically modified uh, you know, uh, crops. There's a lot of misunderstanding about this. People sometimes imagine that there's some guy tinkering with the molecules and they forget about the fact that crossbreeding does exactly that. It's just that you might be able to do it in a more you know, uh, targeted way, not take quite so long to get there. There are bad sides to that too, it's like the uh, genetically modified uh, crops that don't have seeds or the seeds don't work unless you supply a certain additional thing and therefore you have monopoly rents on the availability of the seeds. So it, you know, this is the awful thing about technology is that uh, it has these, the proclivity to be used and abused. 
and there's nothing about it that prevents that. It, it's, it's failure of imagination and failure of commitment to try to bend those technologies to positive ends, and that's where we, I would like to spend my time, not necessarily in this uh, discussion, but I mean just generally speaking, take the technology and push it in the direction of benefit. Are there some examples that strike you along those lines? Mitch? Well, think about water, for example. Riparian rights have been the source of huge you know, debate all in the West in the U.S., and of course it will be so elsewhere. We know that uh, fresh water supplies have become uh, seriously deficient in many parts of the world. You can imagine someday that the super tank oil tankers of today will become the super water tankers of tomorrow. If we find a technology that allows us to produce an abundance of fresh water, that would make a huge difference. So some of you may be following graphene, you know, this funny stuff, the, the, the buckyball that unfolds into this flat sheet, it's a single atom. If you take two sheets of graphene and you put them not quite aligned, it turns out, at least in the lab, you can filter out everything except the H2O. Uh, and it goes through hmm. like a, you know, uh, you know, very quickly because it's such a thin membrane. Uh, so I mean, there are ideas like that that could make a dramatic difference to places that otherwise would have conflict. So one might ask, well, what else do we have conflict over? What can technology do to undo that uh, conflict by providing abundance instead of you know, scarcity? So that's another example. Electricity would be another good one. Right. So I'm, I'm very uh, attracted and interested into these, no, these ideas. I, I'm not sure we have a failure of imagination. I think there's nothing more exciting than the millennial generation right now. To me, they are the greatest generation. I mean, and, and they, they question everything. They accept nothing. They're courageous. They're other regarding. They're inventive. There's, I think what we're failing to do is make space. Um, there's plenty of imagination out there, and, and that I, again and again I'm struck by, God, how come this wasn't invented before? You know, you see great new things popping up all the time. It's so exciting. Um, but, but our generation needs to make space for this imagination that's coming up in problem solving. So it's our failure of imagination, it, it, well, not theirs. Well, I wouldn't say that, not you. You, you did enough imagining for the rest of mankind with, the, <laughs> with that little three, three node, four node drawing that you and Bob put together. Um, I, I think if you come back to this problem of violent conflict, I'm worried about violent conflict. If, and Vince absolutely right. There are ways to ward off paths towards violence. I mean, it's not this inexorable march. I mean, war is not the weather. You know, but we behave as if it were. You know, oh, it's going to rain. Oh, we're going to get wet. Oh, it's, war is going to break out. Oh, well. I mean, that's nuts. War is not the weather. So how do we prevent, I mean, it's this toxic cocktail of things that come together and solutions like this introduced in timely ways, making space so people can have some confidence in a trial. Um, that's, I, I think, at that, that's true prevention, where you're really preventing the outbreak um, you know, I mean, what's your theory of the case? Why do people kill each other over their differences? I think you need two, two clusters of variables to come together. You need a group that's susceptible to being led to a fight, which is a pretty low bar. Yeah. And you need leaders determined to have a fight. If you just have the group, I mean, you, they may riot, but they're not going to engage in a systematic campaign of slaughter unless they're led. Um, war is a phenomenon of leadership. Violent conflict you know, on a sustained basis is a phenomenon of leadership. Um, I'm not sure we have a technological what, answer for that. No. What role do you think despair plays in all of this? I think what makes a group susceptible to being led to a fight? The intersection of deprivation and discrimination will make a group susceptible. I mean, it's not just the case that poor people kill each other. Rich people will kill each other, too, as we know. Um, That's because you're in charge and I'm not, and I don't like that. But, but it's, it's, this, it's this, you know, why do these young men, mostly young men, join us? They feel like they belong nowhere. Um, you know, they're, in, in many cases, you know, of those that have come to this country, for example, they're in, uh, you know, first or second generation, you know, communities. They're very insular. We need to break down barriers that isolate communities. Um, they don't feel like they belong in the old world and they're not accepted by the new world. It's, a, it's, it's an overly glib answer to, a, to what is at root a very difficult problem. So e economics has to play a role here too. I mean, if you think for just a second about people who have no income, there's no G GDP, there's no jobs, you, know, you, can't, you can't even meet the um, expectations uh, as a person 
in a society in the absence of you know some kind of capacity. So uh, jobs must play a role. GDP must play a role. Investment plays a role. And the big problem here is that if I was asked to invest in a place which is in conflict. The reaction I have is, well, wait a minute, let me get this straight. You want me to put X millions of dollars here and it's going to get blown up tomorrow. Why would I do that? And so creating conditions in which investment in infrastructure and other capabilities is feasible and sensible is part of the, of the challenge of overcoming some of these conditions. You know, what we're, we're witnessing and, you know, and we're living in an era where governments have lost the corner on the market on the three key things that used to be, distinguish them. The control of lethality, the control of capital, and the control of rulemaking. And now, where has that power gone? I mean, it has not gone to the United Nations. It's, it has gone into individual hands. So you have private entrepreneurs who are wealthier than the vast majority of countries on the planet. Yeah, individual it's, yeah, persons. Yeah, really stunning. Something, um, that disparity has to tell us something and, and maybe even bode not well, uh, depending on how it's used. So I have to give some credit to Bill Gates, who's done an amazingly good job of taking the fortune he has created and doing something constructive with it. And I feel compelled to, to credit Ted Turner, who was the first of the newest generation. Um, when he gave a billion dollars to the UN, it was a third of his wealth. Um, and, and this is the kind of engage, social engagement that you'd like to see among the most privileged um, of us. But when you, when you think about this, what then should, how do we address, what, what responsibility should we give individuals of this, of this capacity? Should we make you know, a high net worth individuals responsible for preventing or resolving violent conflict? Well, it seems like the, the um, it, we, we, when we, we look at especially the, now in the, the trend to looking at all these situations as these complex adaptive dynamic systems and the role of self-organization is always sort of seen as being the key lever for, for change, whether for the good or for the ill. What is, the, what is your experience with, with uh, the, the various technological capacities we have to abet that the sort of self-organization to the good, whether it's at the, the very high levels, it may be a UN private sector kind of collaboration, or it's in a village or uh, an, urban, an urban area. You, this is really an interesting observation for me. In my world, where technology engineering standards are so important, watching this self-organizing bottom-up process by which ideas become codified and are made widely and freely available, um, there's a, I, it must be a sort of social belief Maybe this comes out of the academic world because that's where the Internet Engineering Task Force originated in a bunch of engineers in colleges and universities that were sponsored by DARPA to do the development of ARPANET and the Internet. And their, their coin of the realm was sharing information. There was, no, there was no notion of you have to pay me for this idea. Uh, and so we gave it away because that was how you did things. And I was proud of the fact that Bob and I just gave away the Internet design and the expectation that if anybody could actually figure out how to build a piece of this and find somebody to connect to, this thing would just kind of grow uh, in an you organic were right. way. Exactly. And that seemed like the right thing to do because it was, the infrastructure didn't do anything, it enabled things. And it's the enabling part that's so powerful. So this self-organizing notion of benefit by everybody sharing, this it sounds like co-ops, it reminds me of barn raising. You know, where everybody participates because they all benefit later. Uh, all of that stuff is partly based on the expectation that if I do something now, I will have a benefit sometime in the future. People who are faced with nothing, faced with, with no expectations, have no desire to wait for anything. I, I remember being in London in the early 1970s and queuing up to get something. Maybe it was a meal. And I noticed and then a few weeks later, I was in Tehran in 1975, and I watched the way people got on the plane in Maribad. They just, you know, they all had seats. They didn't understand that, that everybody had a seat, and they just jammed themselves into the aircraft. And I remember thinking, okay, this is the difference between people who have the expectation that there will be some for them at the end, and expectations of people that there won't be enough for everybody, so I need to get mine now. And that led me frequently to this politics of poverty versus scarcity, or, or versus uh, plenty. So um, how, do we, how do we reinforce this notion 
that actually sharing stuff is, is the way, it's like sharing information is wonderful because it does, never exhausts itself. There's plenty of it. Yeah, it's right, and it's an inexhaustible supply. I mean, one of the things that has struck me is the global cyber awakening is forcing governments to treat their publics as an asset, not an obstacle to problem solving. That's interesting. Um, and, you know, governments are kind of falling into one of three categories, in my view. There are, and again, this is a reflection of, I guess, the, the time I, I spend now in, in the cyber community and talking about, there are governments who fear threats in cyberspace from outside their borders. There are governments who fear threats in cyberspace from inside their borders. And there are governments who really aren't preoccupied with threats at all, but are pretty sure there's a lot of money to be made and they have not <laughs> figured out a way to cash in. In part because, again, governments have not figured out the, the potency, the magic of data liquidity. In fact, I mean, governments are still in some level stuck in 1947 where they think important information is hard to get. You know, and so you have to kind of go. Isn't this like the people who think that they say information is power and I'm hanging on to all my information and I'm not sharing with you because it makes me more powerful? And, you know, my community says, wait a minute, information sharing is power. It's, it's by yeah, sharing it's the sharing. information That's that you right. create power. It's, it's a non, right. it's a non uh, zero sum game yeah. there, right? Yes, exactly. It's non rivals. Rivalrous. So let me ask you to. to address some issue you brought up, Jane, which is around, I mean, are those that are um, in the category of an ISIS or groups like that actually doing a better job of using technology to organize, to attract, to get their message out than those who are trying to feed more people, generate more power, bridge gaps between Yeah, well, the bars, groups. I mean, the bar, there is, what's the, where's the bar? There is no bar. I mean, what they've done is, is find that they've mobilized, again, mostly angry young men. They, they, they're a particular organization with a particular taste for violence that attracts a particular type of person, again, who will come from everywhere to go anywhere. Um, and have they done a better job? Uh, I, I'm not sure. That's, that's sort of not the question. I, I, I would rather you have asked me. I would say... Ask, answer the um, question I should have asked. Yeah. This is going... I mean, all violence is some manifestation of lawlessness. Right? Mm -hmm. It's either no order, it's contested order, or it's alternative order. Take your pick. I mean, you can categorize all violence into one set of this. And this is going on in the face of an obvious capacity to act. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And an equally obvious apparent inability to organize for the action that's necessary. So why is that the case and how can technology... I mean, you, we have private individuals who can mobilize satellite assets to take pictures of refugee movements, of burned villages, of, of violent group tracking, whether it's in the Sahel or Sudan or, or South Sudan or anywhere else. Why aren't governments doing the same kind of thing to mobilize the outrage? What are the effective measures that stop this violence? Um, those are, those are the, the questions that we have, I think, as a public, a right to expect some answers. And the question comes down to doing. Again, it's not that we don't know. It's that we don't like the action implications of what we do know. Say a little more about that, Jane. What, what don't we like about the action implications? You have to do it. If you, know, if you know about it, you have to take action. You have to do something about it. Look, and you know, we, we talked for a long time on the work on preventing, violent, preventing deadly conflict with mm -hmm. David Hamburg and Cy Vance and that Melanie referred to. It did change the dialogue in our field. When, when I first started doing this work in 1994, people laughed at me. I said, Jane, there's always been violent conflict, you know? Have you lost your way? I mean, what's going on? Hmm. And, and I remember being struck by that. Now you can't talk about violent conflict without talking about whether and how it might have been prevented and who should, have done the, who should do the work, you know? And, and we talk about triggers, you know? What's gonna, you know, we wanna know what's gonna trigger us to act. Look, a trigger is a policy choice. You choose. Whether or not 200 young girls in Nigeria being captured by Boko Haram and imprisoned for all effect is going to cause you to act or not. So trigger is a policy choice. Again, here, what technology has done, what information sharing has done, what, this, what the social engagement with this technology has done has narrowed the, the room for governments to do nothing with impunity. So this raises a really interesting point. Uh, it's related to the action question. You have to go back and ask, what are the incentives 
that lead you to one choice or another. And unless you understand incentives of the various actors in these plays, you can't really understand what leads to their actions. So we, I think we need to bore, you know, bore in deeper now on what the incentives are. I'll give you an example. Um, and this may not be uh, politically correct to say, but I'm going to say it anyway. Um, think about Hamas for a moment and think about the apparent fact that they were losing a certain amount of their uh, authority and, uh, and um, ability to um, uh, control the situation. And one view of, of this is that in order to regain that uh, ability to uh, take authoritarian measures, uh, you trigger a response from the party that you need to point to and say they are the threat and you need me to protect you. So you trigger something that causes a response that you can then use to say you need me to protect you from those guys. And this, this sort of incentive to maintain the threat in order for you to retain power or some other thing you want uh, is part of the incentive matrix that leads to some kinds of actions. And I think unless we understand that kind of thing, we won't understand what tactics make sense to diffuse it. So Paul Collier, um, known to many in this room, the scholar um, in the UK, you know, written very interesting, uh, done very interesting research on, you know, why do incipient rebellions become full-fledged insurgencies? Because young men join them. So at some level, if you want to understand you know, this is to your point, you know, you look at the microeconomic decision making of the potential rebel. Um, mm -hmm. But that I don't think carries you the whole way, of course. I mean, so this is, you know, more to your point. Um, I, I agree that, it, you know, incentives matter, you know, but when you want to do something, any excuse will do. When you don't want to do something, any excuse will do. So it's, it's a, can so, we construct incentives? So I want to go back to your uh, observation about millennials for a moment. I'm not sure that I have the right generation here, but um, my son uh, participated in something called Utopia in Four Movements. It was a performance thing. And it talked about these grand visions that didn't quite work out. One of them was Esperanto. Uh, another one was communism. You know, a third one was Cuba. Uh, and a fourth one was the biggest mall, shopping mall in the world in China. Uh, and the guy that built it was very, you know, wealthy uh, entrepreneur. And they told him, you should build roads to get there or nobody will go there. And he <laughs> didn't build any roads, so there's this giant mall and it's empty. So uh, they, he and his partners um, conveyed this uh, through sound, commentary, video and the like. And in, in the end, I said, well, so what was your point? And he said, well, every one of the people who were involved in these efforts had a vision that was bigger than themselves, and they wanted to commit themselves to this big vision, like the Esperanto case, if everybody spoke the same language, surely the world would be more peaceful. That's sort of like saying that the telegraph would make the world more peaceful, or the internet would make the world more peaceful. But so they had this vision that they committed themselves to, and his comment was, in the 21st century, he's not seeing people with positive visions that are drawing people together. Uh, and that the absence of that uh, constructive, larger than yourself objective may be contributing to some of the problems we're having. People want to be part of something bigger than themselves to know that their efforts get amplified by everything else and that amplification cuts both ways. Mm. I want to I want to open an, open our conversation up to the audience. I wanted to just give you one more question if you if you want to take it up, which is, is there um, a uh, priority, uh, an action, an issue that you think would help most unlock the potential for technologists and peace builders to come together in a constructive way, whether it's to address incentives or to address structures like governance or whatever it is. Is there, is there something that stands out to you as being a priority for us? I have some ideas. Go, but, no. Well, you know, you can't really solve problems unless you understand the nature of the problem and the possible nature of solution. I mean, that's just a platitude, obviously. But what I want to get at is that information can help a lot. And measurement and observation, the accumulation of data and its analysis 
understanding how why things interact the way they do and how you can change those things. To give you a concrete example, when you look at a virus, for example, well, take Ebola. Uh, if you know how viruses reproduce and you understand what the sequence of events is and you know that there's a way to interfere with that, it's all that information is needed in order to figure out where to stick the monkey wrench in the gear. And so the idea that we provide people with enough knowledge, enough measured information to, and, uh, and modeling to understand what opportunity they have to change the outcome can be really powerful. But we have to harness our ability to understand and model phenomena, whether it's social phenomena or, or um, you know, mechanical and natural phenomena, in order to figure out how to respond. So the technology community and the, and the scientific and research community can contribute most by helping people understand why, you know, what's going on and why, and what things you could do to make a difference. Right. I, I think the, the this is not going to be a spectacular answer. I think that, the, again, the answer resides somewhere in making space. Um, when I was at Homeland Security, I, we had what was called Cyber Wednesdays. We'd have a three-hour meeting every Wednesday morning. Um, rain or shine, you know, do routine things routinely. One of my things I like to live by, and we had this on Cyber Wednesdays. And the, the, the format of the meeting was always the same. The first hour was a tour de top. Everybody, and it became must-see TV. I mean, because everybody wanted to know what everybody else was saying about everybody. <laughs> Um, and the second hour was a deep dive into a particular subject. Um, for example, you know, you, you know, using technology at the border or some other problem that, that we were trying to solve. And the third hour um, was for the young people in Department of Homeland Security working on interesting things to come present to the cyber leadership of the department. It was known as the third hour. Um, and they, they, they kind of, you know, jostled to, to get in, to get slotted for that third hour. And we would sit there for, you know, one young woman um, invented the app for tracking food trucks in DC. <laughs> I mean, it's very cool. I mean, that's the other thing you need. So you, so you need to make space um, to become aware of what's, what's going on. If you don't do it as a boss, um, you're, it's, not gonna, it's not gonna get done because people are, are buried under, you know, a ton of their own work. <coughs> and Vince's absolutely right. They wanna connect to meaning. It's why they come into public service, for that connection to meaning. Um, but if they work for a jerk, <laughs> you know, it's kind of over. And so you, you can't be that jerk. I mean, you've got to create space for, for these ideas really to grab hold. That to me, and, and bringing technologists into the conversation because they do things policymakers do not. Policymakers say, what problem are we trying to solve? And they put the problem in and they're trying to solve this problem, solve this problem. I mean, <coughs> technologists and engineers do that, but de they also do things like Vint did, which is they sit there and they say, well, wouldn't it be cool if? You know, wouldn't it be cool if we could carry all our music around in our hand? Yeah, that'd be pretty cool. You know, okay, policymakers don't usually go, <coughs> wouldn't it be cool if? I've, not, I've, I've been in policy a long time. We don't have that conversation. <laughs> Great. Um, so if nothing else comes out of this, we know the key is don't be a jerk. Right? <laughs> um, so let me open up to the, the, to the audience. Folks have life. questions for, for, for Vint and for Jim. <laughs> there are microphones. Um, we also know we, we, I think we have some questions. There's a hand up already. In we the have back. a hand up already, yeah. Great. The volume's not on. How many engineers does it take to turn on a microphone? That's <laughs> yeah, still not working. No. Please speak loudly. Now for our next you know, I was a signal officer in the Army for a long time. It's your worst nightmare. Yeah. <laughs> mm. So what is it easier to organize around people or issues when it comes to using technology? Yeah, and what's the tendency? What's the tendency? Actually, I don't think that that's necessary. I think that sounds like one of those false dichotomies. So let me try to give you an example. Do you remember the ice bucket? The big thing for ALS? That was all about an issue, people, and this crazy action of dumping ice all over yourself. 
And I don't know about you, but I got challenged multiple times <laughs> during the course of this thing. And uh, after a while, I got tired of doing the ice bucket, so I just wrote a check. I was thinking, uh, I was thinking more of, uh, let's say, uh, a decent living wage, uh, something a little more uh, abstract, but uh, meaningful to a, a political consumer. I think personifying an issue is powerful. And a, an issue by itself is less motivating than a person that you resonate with, that you relate to, that you respect, that, that either personifies or articulates that issue. And so for me, it's almost always about people. And it, even though it's bound to an issue, people really seem to count in this space especially. I don't know how you see uh, I absolutely thing. agree. I, I think it's a false dichotomy, but it's a really an interesting way to frame the problem. I think people are very, because people want to connect to meaning, they associate with ideas. Um, but then after a while, their energy dissipates unless they are led. Um, there, is, there is something magical about, the, about connecting leadership to issues that causes action. I mean, you can prevent deadly conflict with a rave, I suppose. Um, but I, I think you you're immeasurably increase your odds if it organizes you know, with leadership and whether that leadership tends to get personified. I mean, in the Arab Spring, you know, Tahrir Square, they were looking, I mean, not only was the international community looking, who is the leader here, yes, but the people themselves, the exactly. So did yeah. Twitter, I mean, but who would be the face you know, to carry this movement forward around whom people could rally because they were, they took on the responsibilities. And that's what leadership is. It's about responsibility. It's not about authority. It's not about power. It's about responsibility. I think you need both. What's the most powerful discovery you can ever imagine? It's very simple. I am not alone. And when you discover you're not alone, you are empowered. And that's these media really help you with that discovery process. Gentlemen Thank you. Here, yeah. we, have, we have to Tip. get you a. Is it a non-working microphone? Are we giving? Tip, there's a microphone. Just try it. Okay. I'll go next. Um, this is Finn. This is really for you. When I look back at your career to the degree I know it, you have worked at only at places where Jane's question, "Wouldn't it be cool if?" is the operating question. So let me ask that question to you in your current role where you work with very creative people. What contribution can the IT community, not Google, but the IT community as a whole play to help us do our job better as I'm Melanie's deputy evangelist for peace building? So uh, actually I don't even know whether we said what, wouldn't it be cool if it was more like what if you could X? So. Uh, this is going to sound corny as hell, but I really believe it. If you look at Google's motto, organize the world's information and make it accessible and useful, we really believe that. I really believe that. I think it's stunning to imagine that, you know, barring some restraints like, well, somehow it's copyright or you have to pay for it, the idea that I could get access to the entire brain power and knowledge of the whole world, all the knowledge that we have at my fingertips, if I could just find it, that's the most beguiling notion. And the accessibility part, by the way, is equally important to me. I'm hearing impaired, I have friends who are blind or have motor problems. Accessible here doesn't mean just being able to get to it, but getting, at, getting to it despite these various uh, you know, impairments or interference. But I still believe that's one of the most powerful memes in our 21st century. And if, if we could make that really true, think of how empowering that can be. You don't have to wait, you don't have to, you know, there are no barriers to your ability to discover what people know and then apply it. So I'm, I mean, that's, like I say, it sounds corny, but I really believe it. So I, I love it. So I'm got, don't be a jerk, and if you, it's okay to be corny if you really believe it. <laughs> <laughs> You know, I used to, um, when, again, when I was at DHS, I would, I would walk around and I would talk to the senior leadership in the various components um, that we have, and I would, I would always ask them, what's at the top of your if only list? And don't tell me more money, okay? Let's just take that one off. Just tell me if only, if only what? Because, you know, when you're the number two in the department, the story goes, you have some authority to change a few things. But it's a very empowering question, actually. But it's also a responsibilizing mm -hmm. question. Mm -hmm. Suddenly they have to think about, oh my gosh, if only uh, 
And, and they often didn't know what would be at the top of their if-only list. And, are, what, and what are you doing about it? And That's you, the next tough one, right? Well, once you get them warmed up, you know. So, so I think, you know, there's, I'm going to try and flip this whole conversation on our own heads here and, and ask you, what percentage of your problems would go away if you could cherry pick mm -hmm. the team you worked with? Ooh. And put in place by name exactly whom, who you wanted to be in each position. What percentage of your problems would go away? 95? 96? 97% of your problems? This sounds like an auction. It's, and what am I bid for 98? It's, it's, right. But it's when you think about it that way, then suddenly you know, you're not looking for the technological solution. You're, it's, a, it's this interaction, as Vince said at the top, you know, of people and ideas and things. Um, that I think comes into this. I mean, we know what a durable piece is, right? What are the elements? You know, representative governance, market economic activity that gives opportunity to the greatest number, robust civil society based on the rule of law. We know what the pieces are. You know, it's the, it's the, the architecting and the maintenance and the... This sounds like a great title for a book or a paper, putting the pieces of peace together. Yeah, putting the pieces of peace together. Great. Another question? Hi. Missing peace. Um, will you be on my team? <laughs> <laughs> you said I got to pick. I pick you. <laughs> um, my name is Sally Smith. I started an organization called the Nexus Fund uh, to end genocide and mass atrocities a couple of years ago. Just a really low-key organization. Um, and we believe in supporting civil society um, to help solve their own problems um, mm -hmm. by giving them the help that they need as they tell us they need it, uh, not as we think that they need it. Um, and my question for you is uh, around innovation and technology because like USIP, the Nexus Fund is interested in making connections between what we see as a gap, the people on the ground who have needs that could potentially be met with technological solutions, and then you know what I just generally refer to as technologists in Silicon Valley who have the technology available, and from my limited conversations with those kinds of companies like Google, are interested in helping, uh, but may not have uh, what I have called a tech Sherpa mm -hmm. to help them reach mm -hmm. the people on mm -hmm. the ground to provide those solutions, or at least to help those people build their own solutions. So I, my question is really to you and, and or to either of you of how can we best do that? How can we best play the role of Tech Sherpa and getting and asking these people in Silicon Valley and it, it, even if I may, um, for the wealth piece as well, you know, is there is there a desire in Silicon Valley to contribute some of that wealth to technology building in um, conflict zones or prevention areas? So Thank the you. answer is absolutely yes. Uh, I can't. I won't speak for any one company, not even for Google in this uh, instance. But um, you know about Code for America as an example. This is a, an effort to get people to help solve problems that could be solved uh, by software. Um, a related notion here is lowering barriers to exercising your ability to solve problems. So finding ways of producing infrastructure that is widely accessible. An example of this is mobile phone. And the applications, bazillions of them now, that are, uh, have been implemented for them. The reason that that has worked is that we've standardized the interfaces, the application programming interface. The people who write the applications on the mobile don't know anything about how does the mobile actually work. And they don't have to. That's the important part. They lowered the barrier to your ability to implement something, to try something out. And if you, you want to remove, um, barriers to exploration and experimentation. You want to remove the risk. So um, those sorts of things Silicon Valley can do. The maker movement is another example of this sort of thing. There are some kids in this area at a place called Nova Labs who are using 3D printers to build more 3D printers. They build the parts from the 3D printer and then they put the, you know, it's like the sorcerer's apprentice and you're kind of worried <laughs> about that. Um, but that's an important movement, by the way. And this is, this is uh, you know, in the business world, there's this notion of jujitsu business tactics where you take your opponent's momentum and you use it against them. Well, in the positive sense, kids are getting very excited about concrete results of what they're doing. I mean, the fact that you could make something and you could hold it and say, I made that, 
is a lot more satisfying than you wrote a piece of code and nobody can see it because it's just sort of floating out there someplace. So um, I have this, this sense that, that in our current world, we have technology that's removing barriers to solving problems or, or exploring solutions to problems. And even, and it's, you know, what is the right thing here? It makes it cheap to fail. And that's good because it's okay to fail. It's terrible not to try anything. It's okay to fail as long as, A, you learn something from it and you don't keep doing the same thing over and over again like the Einstein definition of insanity. So, uh, although this doesn't solve all problems, these themes, I think, are really important guidelines to tactics that you want to introduce for enabling people to solve more problems. So I, th I think there is value in the high payoff intervention. I mean, what is it? I mean, we suffer in our field, um, as what my colleague Tony Sager at the Council on Cybersecurity talks about, when we talk about cybersecurity, he says, we are, you know, we're suffering from the fog of more. You know, we've got more, 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 more. You know, more offerings, technology, checklists, all kinds of things. We suffer from the same thing to a certain extent in the peace building world, the fog of more. You know, what are the high payoff interventions? There are two. Educate young women, employ young men. The rest is commentary. Oh, that's really good. She's um, just full of these incredible sound bites. Man, it's amazing. I hope somebody takes This is my notes. field. <laughs> Melanie said we've known each other a long time. Um, those are the high payoff interventions, you know? And so everybody, to a certain extent, in our world, you know, governments are competing not only with each other, not only with groups within, they're competing with the non-governmental world as well. It's, and it's, and it's, it's really contested space. So who, to whom should societies turn? They're, you know, we're, I mean, I've heard of your organization. It's really incredibly creative and interesting. I, I love what's going on out there in the world today. Why aren't governments wrapping their arms around more of this, making space for these kinds of initiatives? It's not, governments can't do all that needs doing. Mm -hmm. And all that needs doing can't be done alone. And you have to treat people however they organize, whether it's a, a, a small NGO or a, a movement around an idea, um, you know, whose, whose time has come. You know, Governments have a role to play here, and we shouldn't let them off the hook. Before we take another question from the audience, I want to see, check in on the folks who are monitoring Twitter, if there's any online um, questions. I, I sense there is one. This is so tightly woven, there are no questions. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, the, the bad thing about getting a no answer to your question is, does that mean nobody's paying attention? That's really painful. People are paying attention, I promise. Um, we had some questions on um, Twitter about tools like Google Translate. So I want to know, are efforts like Google Translate or the broader effort to catalog all of human knowledge as audacious as Esperanto? And what are the implications if we fail? I didn't hear all uh, of So go uh, Google tra Translate. Oh, Google, okay. No, um, yes. And the, and the aspiration of, yeah. to harness all the world's knowledge, is it really as audacious? I mean, is, it, is that really the agenda? I think it is. I mean, look, Google is also a business, and it, it's in, in the business to make money, and its stock price shows that. But the, what's astonishing about this is that it's allowed us to do things that a lot of other companies would never consider doing. I mean, we've got what Larry Page calls moonshots, like the self-driving cars and the contact lens that measures uh, the level of sugar in the tears of your eyes and relates that to the blood sugar level so you don't have to keep sticking your finger. Uh, we, you know, Calico, the company that wants to figure out why we die and how do we stop that. Uh, yeah, I mean, we won't get there, but it might extend life. But these are all crazy ideas, and Larry likes that because he has the wherewithal because of the business model that, that the company has. But the, the company really believes that getting information out there in people's hands is important. So Google Translate's an interesting um, example. It's by no means perfect. Those of you who speak anything other than English uh, will recognize that the translation from anything into English and in Google Translate is often amusing. Um, <laughs> it's better than what it was in the 60s. So I was at Stanford and we were trying, we poured a Russian English dictionary into the computer thinking, boy, this is easy. And we stuck in out of sight, out of mind. And it translated into Russian and came back invisible idiot. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> okay, maybe we have some work to do here. That works at some level. But. That is great. That's a great story. Oh, my gosh. So, so uh, we've, we've taken advantage of statistics and large corpora full of you know, duplicate documents in two different languages. We've even gone to the you know, business of going through multiple languages to get from one translation to another. And it, nobody's going to be ever perfect at this space, at least not in the near term. But it helps you get gist, at least, and, and figure out, do I really want to dig deeper in? Do I want to find a better translation and so on? Uh, so I, I really, the, the company really believes in this idea, and it's invested very, very heavily in a lot of these technologies in, in uh, aid of that belief. You know, I've been um, thinking for a long time that there are only five things that I can think of that claim a billion, the active affiliation of a billion or more people on the planet. You know, being Indian, being Chinese, being Catholic, being Muslim, and being on Facebook. Um, <laughs> And, and, Is that Yahoo's, some religion? and Yahoo's not far behind. And, and, and Yahoo and Facebook know a lot more about their subscribers than any government or those religions know about their, their populations. And so we know a lot about people online, but we know them mostly as consumers. Uh, I think that's beginning to change. I think we're beginning to know them now as citizens. Um, and so the organization is in your citizen identity. How much of your online experience do you do as a citizen? You do a lot of it as a consumer. That's you do some of it mm -hmm. as, a, as a mom, dad, student, sister, brother, worker. How much of it do you do as a citizen? In the rest of the world, they do a lot. They do a lot as citizens online. Um, we need to pay attention to that. There's, we need to embrace the notion that publics are becoming much more actively involved. I love Vince, um, what he said earlier when he said, the democratization of access to information has got to count for something. Whether we want it to or not, it will. Um, and I, I think there's just a ton to grab onto here. Are these audacious ideas? They are. I mean, at some level, and I'm not an economist, but it seems to me that, that Facebook is offering a different economic model than one that most of our societies are used to. I mean, most of our societies are kind of based on the notion of family, you know, as the basic economic model. Right? Well, Facebook has introduced the friendship as a different economic model, and Google has introduced you as an, as an economic model because it pivots around you. I mean, it's a really interesting change in perspective on how we relate to each other um, and to the structures that we've set up and that we've been living in. You know, I'd, I wonder if we're not witnessing sort of the, a, a transitional era you know, some say we're seeing the change in the nature of money. We're seeing the change in the nature of government. Um. So Jane, Jane has, has really hit on something that I resonate with very strongly. This notion of online citizenship uh, is fascinating to me. I mean, you think about civil society, you think about the technology world, think about government and so on. These are all segments of our society. The question is, how do they manifest in this online environment? There's a term that's used in my world called netizen, and you know, the, a person who is a citizen of the net. Uh, but I think uh, Jane's point here is really worth scrutinizing. How can we enable online citizenship in a way that is constructive and productive? It's not just a question of the government telling you what to do. And I, I have to say, I was very amused uh, watching the American um, uh, members of Congress discover the internet. The first thing they discovered was, wow, this is a way for me to tell my constituents everything that I'm doing. Then they discovered it was a two-way medium. <laughs> said, you mean they actually can talk back? And said, yes, uh, Congressman, that's, that's right. Um, so this, this idea that Jane has planted now, which is to look outside of the U.S. at how this online citizenship is manifesting, is probably a very worthwhile thing for us to understand and then ask, how can I enable that more effectively? What else can I enable about this onlineness as a citizen uh, in uh, a, a society? Th think about the um, uh, Rousseau and the social contract. I went back and reread that I, in, in translation. My French isn't that good. Uh, but I was very excited about the idea that there is such a notion as a contract. I will give up some of my freedom in exchange for certain safeties and, uh, and uh, conditions. Um, 
of course, I don't want to give up too much, and there's a big argument about where that line should be. But this idea of, of social citizenry online uh, bears some serious examination. So thank you for bringing that up. So one of the things that, that I just, in your example, in your response around the Google Translate, which may be another um, uh, attitude that, that we, the technology world may bring into the peace building world, just like the, the what if list that you, that you, you mentioned, Jane, is the, is the nonlinearity mm -hmm. of strategy. Mm -hmm. So the, the idea of we're gonna set a goal out here, we, we're pretty sure we're not gonna get there. We're not gonna stop people from dying. But we only get to a whole bunch of other good places. And how a lot of times I think in our field, in the peace building field, we, we, we tend to want to confine ourselves to only those things we know we can do and think of it all as being a one, two, three, four when we know it's actually not going to yeah, work out that way. This is such a good point. There's a, a, so a question in the audience. Yeah, Lynn. It's Lynn. Yeah. So with the velocity of change and all the things that are happening, some subset of the people are going to get this and thrive in it and whatever. There's going to be another subset that just isn't going to. And as things are changing so rapidly and this group kind of gets left behind, what do you do with them? How do you compensate essentially for the digital disenfranchisement, if you will, perhaps by their own choice, but nonetheless not feeling part of this new world? So uh, this, this reminds me of uh, something that came up in an AARP meeting. Uh, it was, um, the, the, the assertion was that us old folks don't know how to use technology. And my reaction to this was, I have news for you, some of us invented it. <laughs> so. Um, <laughs> That's a great line. <laughs> However, to be fair, you know, we were a lot younger at the time that this was going on. So I think Lynn's question is very uh, legitimate. Uh, I'm going to argue that this is a potentially false meme. It's a very attractive argument to make. Everybody kind of gets it. Wow, things are running really faster and you can't run that fast, so you're going to be left behind. And yet I see how quickly people have grabbed the, the use of new technology. Smartphones are only eight years old, and they are in the hands of a lot of people of all ages. Uh, a lot of these things are designed with interfaces that are intentionally simple to use. Technologists have a responsibility to make these things accessible to everybody, and we don't always do a great job of that. But you know, being able to poke a button because it's got somebody's picture on it and it makes a phone call, that's a perfectly reasonable thing to do. Uh, and some of the contact systems get really close to that. I don't know if your contact list and your mobile has a little picture of whoever it is and you, you poke that and it makes a phone call. So you're right that things are moving very quickly, but I keep thinking, okay, it's 1900. Let's think about this for a minute. It's 1900 and what's happening? Well. Somewhere around 1898 or 1895, somebody discovered uh, radiation, right? You know, uranium. And then in 1898, uh, automobiles start popping up in some weird places. And three years from now, the Wright brothers are going to fly a thing that's heavier than air. Five years from now, Einstein's going to blow us all up with his unbelievable four papers, little short, you know, two, three page things that utterly changed the view of physics. And then, of course, the, uh, the physicists uh, come along and uh, the quantum guys come along, they blow up Einstein, and then the quantum guys get blown up by uh, the guys who are doing string theory. Uh, I would venture to, you know, there's television, there's radio, I mean, all those things were happening after 1900 in an agrarian society. And so I think of myself, put, I try to project myself back, and I think, holy moly, what would I have felt about the rate of change, the pace, the, the utterly impossible things that I was seeing, jets and television and so on. I'm not persuaded yet that everything is running faster than it was before. I think that the pace of technological change is, is very much the way it has been, and we've all managed to adapt to it for the most part. So this is so interesting. I, I was listening to someone the other day said, you know, all of us actually should be dead. Um, you know, all of us who like came of age in the 60s should be dead <laughs> because of, you know, either through nuclear confrontation or smoking oh. <laughs> or polluting our water and, you know, the you know, spread of unchecked diseases and things like that. And somehow we're not. Um, th so there is this constant catching up. You know, there, there, there is a correction that's going, that's going on. 
Um, I was had a very interesting conversation in Europe recently with colleagues over the Snowden um, revelations. And they said to me, you know, why aren't Americans outraged? You know, you know, the difference between the Europeans and the Americans is that the Europeans are outraged. I said, there's plenty of outraged Americans, number one. Number two, most of us believe our system will correct itself. I mean, you know, there are proven to be some excesses. Our system will correct itself. And they said, yeah, that's the difference. We don't have that faith in our governments. <laughs> when our governments move to extremes, they stay there. It's fascinating. That's there is no corrective. So it's not just, so we have, Lynn, only one set of problems are the people who are left behind. There's people who are leading the way we need to worry about as well. You know, the Scottish vote shows that that system is at least self-correcting. 55 to 45, it's a little scary. On the other hand, it was the plebiscite, it was the people who helped to introduce the correction factor. And a pretty gracious acceptance of the reality of the vote. A question up here. Um, my Native American father always told me, if you want peace, work for justice. Now you can, you can see why a Native American would think justice was an issue. But um, I also think that justice is in the eyes of the beholder. Mm. You know, if you see all those rich people who don't pay taxes, or you see all those people who don't believe in your religion or whatever it is. And I, I just want to know what you think about the relationship between justice and peace and how you think social media might help with that. Well, lack of justice will surely interfere with the peace. Um, I think I want to make one comment about technology and justice. Uh, it's been drilled into me by a good friend of mine, Don Horowitz, who's a former Superior Court judge in the state of Washington, that access to justice may be denied unless you have access to the internet and its technology and the information that's available. We don't want anyone to be denied access to justice because they don't have access to the information that could be available to them. And so uh, your question triggers uh, in, for me anyway, a kind of imperative that says at least with regard to information that's needed to achieve justice, we have to assure equality of access. And if that means investing in infrastructure to do that, uh, then it's in, incumbent upon us to do that. Jane may have a much more profound thing no, to say. No, I, I, I um, you know, this is something that's it's at the heart, obviously, of a durable peace. It's a, it's a sense that most of the time we get most of the issues mostly right. Um, and it's, it, justice isn't, isn't a state of nature. I mean, it's, an, it's a conversation. It's a negotiation. It's an, it's an evolution. It's, a, it's society coming to grips with its sameness and its differences. I mean, we talk about the rule of law all the time, sort of in, interchangeably with the notion of justice. They are separate. But our, our, our notion of, you know, justice um, is, you know, it's, it's not currently a jump ball. I mean, I think there's a, there is a, a great deal of the, institution of the institutionalization of the rule of law that's given us a, a finally a, an ability to have a conversation about justice. What are those things? I mean, it's, it's a corpus of laws that have been le legitimately derived, widely promulgated, understood, and accepted. It's a set of institutions to uphold the law. Um, and it's a transparent process through which, you know, which is sort of an energy absorbing institution for disputes. So, you know, we have alternate ways of resolving our differences in, and we call that justice being done. Um, is, it, is it right all the time? Justice doesn't equal right, doesn't, doesn't equal just. I mean, it's, there are, I don't think there are easy answers. I think it's deeply embedded in a notion of a durable peace that there are processes for just resolution of disputes. One of the most um, insidious factors that in, in, impede, uh, in, impede the creation of, an, of conditions for peace is impunity. Is, you know, mm -hmm. there are factions mm -hmm. who can act with impunity. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so certainly your question brings out the heart of, of a durable peace, which is the presence of of what a society can roughly call justice uh, so, for its members. 
So I have uh, a, an example that I just saw on YouTube, right? It was two chimpanzees uh, and, a, and the keeper. Um, what it goes to is the notion of justice and fairness and the fact that this is not just a human artifact. Okay, so here's the, here's the deal. The, uh, the zookeeper hands uh, one of the chimpanzees a little food pellet. Okay, and he hands the other one a food pellet and they both eat the food pellet. That's all cool. Then the next time, he hands one of the chimpanzees a grape and the other one he hands a food pellet. And, you know, that works the first time. And then he does it again. He keeps giving grapes to the one chimpanzee and these crappy little food pellets to the other guy. And eventually the other chimpanzee is throwing the food pellets back at them. This chimpanzee has some sense of fairness. It's not just that he should get the food pellet when the other guy gets the grapes. And so he was reacting really badly to that. And I thought, wow, that tells us something about how core in our psyches and our, you know, the way our brains work, that this notion of fairness must be buried really, really deep, which is why I think we all resonate with the notion of justice. So, but I think it's really important to understand who, who are you with respect to the, the issue in dispute? You know, Vint mentioned earlier that you're not gonna solve conflict unless you get to the root causes. You know, I've got kids. I've solved lots of conflicts without understanding the root causes. <laughs> you know? I don't, and, and what do I say? I don't care why you are fighting. Stop. Stop. Okay? So, so... You have to be able to enforce that, though, because otherwise... And I'm confident, I've been confident in my ability to do so, but... But... But, <laughs> but, but I think, it, and frankly, function, our, our search is outsiders to a conflict. We, 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 we develop opinions on the justness of a solution um, when, frankly, we have neither the equities or the incentives or the comparative advantage for an, even an opinion on the justness of underlying solutions to a conflict. But can we create the conditions so that the parties themselves can address it? That's, I think, our greater role. It's also, I mean, coming back to just how technology and information can help us yep. actually in a way, either amplify in, that injustice that, or yeah. enable the, the finding of that just solution. We've got time for one more quick question. Why don't we, we've got one up right up here. Here we are. Hi. Um, so uh, my name is Jessica Deer, and I am founded an organization called Social Media Exchange, and we're based and work in the Middle East. And so throughout, it's a fascinating conversation. But throughout, I keep hearing governments, 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 as if all governments act the same and all governments are, um, you know, have come to some agreement about rule of law. And I can state pretty categorically that that is not the case in the region where we work, especially with regard to digital rights, with freedom of expression and privacy, things that are very um, important in the online space that we're talking about, in the peace and the technology space. And specifically, um, there have been, with, with regard to cybersecurity and sort of the conversation around that, in the Middle East in the past three years, there have been um, at least a dozen either draft or laws passed um, that are doing exactly what you were saying. They can't monopolize um, cyber um, control in cyberspace. They, they're trying and they are doing it through cybercrime laws, through things. And so what's interesting, and the, and the question I want to pose is actually a much bigger question, which is cybercrime is this sort of manifestation of the globalization of law somehow and and the idea that we're moving to another paradigm of of um, of law of rule of law when we're talking about cyberspace so I'm wondering what the implications you think are for a couple of things one sovereignty and governments responsibilities to hold other governments accountable for creating peace for intergovernmental institutions responsibility for holding other governments accountable and i ask this because i was reading recently or and i and i believe this strongly having worked a lot in the region um, that it's it's an impossible situation to ask activists to advocate only on their own for these rights when these rights are, when, when all the tools that they need to be able to do this advocacy are being uh, stripped away. So how can we, as these big corporations, big governments, intergovernmental institutions, um, sort of go with this trend of, of all things changing? So we saved the, the quickest question for the last one. <laughs> yeah, right. Um, 
Maybe I'll go and then give Vint yeah. the last word. Okay. Uh, I, I would say a, a, couple, of, a couple of things. Um, I, I talked about the global cyber awakening. Um, I, Vin has spoken before about the power of the internet. I mean, governments are moving in all over the, the planet to try and take back the internet in some way. I mean, you know, it, it's, and it's not restricted to that region. I mean, it's happening sort of everywhere. You know, that's the bad news. The good news is there's 193 members of the United Nations. No two of them are approaching it in the same way. So it's, but they're all, they're all moving into the game in some significant way. They will alter the landscape as governments move in with the power and authority that governments have, they will alter the landscape of the internet. But I talked earlier about the global cyber awakening and it's happening against the backdrop of four very powerful norms that I think have been moving through the global population for 150 years. The norm of inclusivity, transparency, reciprocity, and accountability. Inclusivity, nothing about me without me. People are demanding to be included again and again and again. And if I'm not, I don't have voice, there will be people around the world who will give me voice. Mm -hmm. um, that's a very powerful norm. People want in on the action. I mean, that's in part what the, the Arab Spring was all about. Nothing about us without us anymore. I mean, transparency. And it's not that everybody gets to know everything about everything all the time. It's, it's how, is, how is, what are the processes? I want to be able to see how you arrived at your decision. Mm -hmm. Because it's no longer enough for me to be presented with, with a decision. I need to know how it was made. I, mm -hmm. And so transparency, very powerful norm. Reciprocity. If you're going to make me do it, are you going to make him do it? Mm -hmm. and, if, and if you get to do that, do I get to do that as well? Very powerful. And accountability. I mean, we are seeing levels of accountability. Countries are now not only accountable to each other, but for the past 20 years, easily, they've been accountable to each other for what's going in, on inside their countries, mm -hmm. which some people say sovereignty is changing. To me, sovereignty is exactly what it's always been. Not what you say you are, but what we say you are. Mm -hmm. Sometimes in spite of what you say you are. So, I, I mean, yes, is, is the work getting easier because of technology? Yes, it's also getting harder. Wow. Well, it would be hard to add a lot to that, so let me try just a bit. Uh, first of all, I think in the, with regard to cyberspace, we are in a post-Westphalian environment. The things that happen on the Internet have impact wherever the Internet goes, and it doesn't stop at any borders. In fact, the design was intended, intentionally done to be borderless. Um, so this causes us to uh, need cooperation and agreement about what harms occur on the net because the perpetrator may be in one jurisdiction and the victim in another. To the extent that we can do anything about redressing harms that occur in this online environment, we're going to need multilateral agreements among countries to respond. And if we don't do that, it will be very, very hard to do anything about it. That's why you see all these various cyber attacks coming from countries that don't actually have a great deal of uh, or willingness to deal with the problem. A lot of attacks come from China, they come from Russia, they come from the Ukraine, uh, and they probably come from the U.S. too. Uh, and the problem here is that we don't have agreements to deal with that problem. So uh, I also believe that this is not just a government problem to deal with. You use the word cyber crime, I want to be very careful about the term because not all harms that occur in the net are necessarily crimes. And more important, just because it happened on the net doesn't cr create the crime. I mean, if I commit fraud, it's fraud, regardless of what means I use to, uh, to commit it. But there is a shared responsibility here for dealing with these harms and problems that arise. If you, are, if you choose bad passwords and people crack into your account and then do harms with it, you're partly at fault for that. You should have been more aware of, or we should have helped you be more aware of how to do a better job with passwords or provide you with something else like two-factor authentication. The people who write the software that has bugs, they have a responsibility to not, not make the bugs or fix the bugs. The people who should be you know, doing updates on their software who don't do that are also responsible. This is almost like um, uh, public health in a way. If you're infected and your machine, even if you didn't cause the infection, but your machine is infected and you're now going around doing nothing about it, then you're like typhoid Mary, you're causing a bad problem. 
we need, in the technology world, we need to help people actually act on that view. It's not that we just point the finger at you and say, your machine's infected, so you know, you're, you're all at fault. And you're saying, what should I do? And you should get a good answer back to that, as opposed to, we don't know, too bad, but you're infected, so you're bad. So we have a lot of work to do, I think, in this space to make it more, um, more settled than the Wild West. And so we do need the rule of law in this space. And it's not entirely settled at this point. So thank you both tremendously. I mean, for any number of insights, I'm sure I know I've taken, I know our audience has taken. I, I particularly am grateful for the, the inspiration, the insight around the notion of creating these spaces to bring people, technology, and imagination together. I just was really impressed in a lot of what you said. That really seemed to be the key. And I'm also happy that I think Sheldon is going to say a little bit about that when he talks about the Peace Tech Lab. Before we get to that, please join me in thanking Vint Cerf and Dan Holtby. I want to join Rob in our thanks for this absolutely fascinating and deep and insightful conversation. I have to say I felt sorry for any of the USIP interns who might have been in charge of the Twitter feed for this, for trying to, <laughs> to capture this as we went along. So, so thank you all so much. And this is really the moment that I've been waiting for all day which is to introduce Sheldon Himmelfarb, though many of us in this room know and love him, the breadth and the depth of the conversation today, the people that you've had in the room, the um, intersections of all these different fields are just a little taste of what will come in the Peace Tech Lab. And I just want, before Sheldon comes up, to thank him for this vision that for the last at least five years, he has been talking to so many communities, corporations, governments, activists, entrepreneurs, scholars. And I was really struck this morning by the idea of a white space or a third space. And our field needs that. These ideas are so important. And yes, often they do proliferate in wonderful ways around the world as we've seen. But our field needs a dedicated space where we can test these ideas in a safe way build the connections we've been talking about, hammer out the new kinds of principles around sovereignty, accountability, reciprocity that our panel here was just talking about. And Sheldon has this in his mind. He's been uh, perfectly, I think, equipped through the course of his career to do this. Um, as uh, a scholar at Oxford, he has uh, studied and academia. He has been in one of the most creative companies, um, um, the corporate advisor, corporate, yes, executive board, uh, helping catalyze the change that they've made, uh, was at Search for Common Ground, one of the most innovative uh, peace building organizations, and then here at USIP. And the creativity of all those spaces is in large part due to Sheldon. So um, he will come and talk with you about the Peace Tech Lab. This is something I think will be crucial for the peace building field. I feel deeply responsible personally to making this happen. Um, Sheldon also said to let you know that uh, we won't have further questions, that he will really be inspiring us with his vision, but there will be ways to continue this conversation. Um, certainly through USIP, did you say there'd be a URL coming up? There'll be a URL. I would mention the publication Building Peace, which is a joint publication of AFP and USIP. The current issue that came out uh, just yesterday is on conflicts of the future, many of which we talked about today. The next issue is on peace building and technology. So many of the ideas we've talked about that will come up in the first stages of the lab have a place there. So Sheldon, it's with great gratitude and love and respect and admiration that I welcome you to talk about the Peace Tech Lab. Thank you so, so much, Melanie, for that introduction. I just wish my mom were here to hear it. Um, before I talk about the lab, I want to uh, make sure I, we, since while we're all still together, thank a couple of people who really made today's you know, it takes a lot of people to make an event like this happen. And um, let me begin with thanking all of our guests and our moderators who did such a terrific job all day. Thank you very, very much. And our partner, National Academy of Engineers, 
uh, Engineering. Proctor Reed has been our thought partner from the beginning for the last really five years with the roundtable as well as today's event. So thank you, Proctor. And at USIP, the folks that really organized today, Fred Tipson, Kelly Victor French, Nancy Payne, and then they had the help from the whole team. So it was a big team effort. Thank you all. Um, so it's been a long and rich day, and this is going to be the last piece of it. Um, at its conclusion, as Melanie said, I'll give you a, a, a way of getting in touch with us to ask more questions. I know you're going to have questions. To give us your suggestions. This is, as you heard from Steve Hadley, the chairman of our board at the top of the day, it was just uh, recently, in the end of July, that our board approved uh, uh, one of the few resolutions it's ever approved in its history to create the Peace Tech Lab as a spin-off from USIP. Um, so we've got a lot of support there, but it's still very much a work in progress. I'm going to put some ideas out here. I hope they're provocative, thought-provoking, and we'll hear from you. So keep your ideas and thoughts coming. But I am going to try to get us out of here in time for Friday happy hour. And in the same spirit as our lightning rounds this morning, meet Ground Views a citizen journalism website created by this man, Sanjana, the first attempt in Sri Lanka to create a way for citizens to share their views on the war, call out humanitarian emergencies and security conditions, and debate alternatives. Meet again Rachel Brown, who's right here, who was here today. Yes, Rachel Brown created Peace Text at, at Sisi Niamani, um, which uses, as you heard today, mobile messaging to help stop deadly violence in communities in Kenya. Meet Luino Robillard, who's using crowdsourced mapping in Haiti's Cité Soleil slums to place solar-powered lights strategically to reduce gender and gang violence. And Dishad, who you also met earlier. I don't know if Dishad's still here today. Dishad is the brilliant mind behind AIMTA, the um, a mobile app that tracks the trajectory of missiles um, and sends out a warning to those in its path. Meet the Enough Project, if you haven't heard it, you probably have, because it's funded in part by George Clooney and it used satellite imagery to track John Jawid terror in Darfur region of Sudan. And the Lord's, Res and the Lord's Resistance Army Tracker, the LRA Tracker, being used in Congo to try and catch Joseph Kony. Meet Yala, an online network of Israeli and Palestinian youth to promote peaceful problem solving. Meet Aggie, who was created by this guy, Michael Best, a social media aggregator and monitoring software countering hate speech and election violence in Africa. Meet Frontline SMS and Ken Banks, who created this tool to reach populations in danger, Frontline SMS, via text message. This is Peace Tech. Innovations in data, in technology, and in media, born out of the danger of violent conflicts. Innovate or be silenced. Innovate or be shelled. Innovate or be imprisoned. Innovate or die. Conflict has often been a crucible for innovation. The internet, for goodness sakes, was born out of DARPA in the Department of Defense. But this burst of innovation that I tried to capture in that run, in the run that we had at the start of the day, this burst of innovation in new approaches to tackling age-old drivers of violence is, as I think you heard in that panel as well, it's unprecedented in human history. So you'd think that these would be the best of times in our field, but they are most certainly not. From Ukraine to Afghanistan, from Iraq to Gaza, Conflict reigns, and nearly every recent study on the role of technology in preventing or resolving its causes is ambivalent at best. So this was a recent NDI study um, of nine countries, the use of technology for civic participation, its conclusion, little data available on the impacts. Another study by IPI, terrific study on conflict, in, uh, conflict prevention and technology, potential rather than results. Another study by Transparency International recently about the use of ICTs for uh, corruption, tackling corruption. Little evidence, but positive signs. Why is this? What's needed to increase the real impact 
of peace tech in conflict zones. As the nation's center for conflict, uh, conflict resolution and peace building, we at USIP, we have a responsibility, indeed we've got this charge from Congress that I mentioned at the start of the day, to answer that question. So for more than five years, our team here at USIP, and it really has been a team effort, working in Iraq, in Afghanistan, in South Sudan, in Burma, with experts and activists alike, and their answers to this question, how can peace tech be more impactful, have provided the inspiration for USIP's new Peace Tech Lab and the four pillars on which it will be based. Convene, connect, build, and inspire. Let me break these down. Convene. Conflict, we know, is about complex human dynamics, which are often culturally specific. So we've heard time and time again that effective solutions require deep local knowledge of the conflict, the geography, and the technology environment. So the Peace Tech Lab needs to be a model of radical collaboration across disciplines, across technology platforms, and across generations. Engineers and technologists working every day alongside experts on peace building. Data scientists working alongside social scientists. It will have Peace Tech fellows from the conflict zones themselves and a young engineers program to ensure intergenerational collaboration. So we're making sure we're drawing upon the talents of young people like this. This is Marion Bechtel, a 17 year old, who drew upon her piano lessons to come up with a new way to find landmines using sonar. Young people relate differently to technology. And I don't know if any of you saw this study not too long ago by, I think it was commissioned by Intel. It's fascinating. It talked about how people over 25, on average, ring the doorbell with their forefinger. And people under 25, on average, ring the doorbell with their thumb. The dominant digit is changing. But it also talks, it speaks volumes about the different ways the next generation, and I know this from coming home every day to my kids, how they connect with technology is totally different from other generations. The next pillar of the lab is connect. Speed matters, as you see from those stunning numbers that are coming up. And the probability of reaching nonviolent solutions instead of military ones are highest in what's called the early gestation phase of a conflict. So imagine the lab as a data hub, having partnerships with social media and big data companies, developing early warning mechanisms that can alert our in-country partners to imminent threats and life-saving information so they can take early action. And USIP has a huge network of in-country partners it's developed over the last 30 years, as do so many of the organizations that we've heard about today. So that's the vision for the lab's open situation room exchange. You heard about it earlier from Noel. The town, this town is full of closed situation rooms in government, right? White House has one, DOD has one, State Department has one. Ours has to be an open, working, 24-7 operation that monitors tweets, YouTube uploads, most importantly, proactively connects with our civil society partners in the field over video Skype, whether it's WhatsApp or chat or whatever platform works best. Because we live today in a world where the internet gets uploads from battle zones before the generals themselves know about it. And the lab needs to be connected to that dynamic nature of conflict with a working rhythm as urgent as war itself if we are going to really provide timely assistance in our field. But we also know we're going to need private sector know-how to get there because I'm, that's where big data has been influencing decision making for well over a decade. We have so far to go to catch up in our field. So we need to make sure we're bringing the private sector know-how into our work with big data. Which brings me to a third attribute of the lab and that is the build piece. So unlike most tech developers in the West, the lab has to be focused, like a laser, on building solutions for those 1G, low bandwidth, low power, and dangerous environments where, violent, where violence occurs. We heard time and time again how local technologists, the hackers and the coders in conflict zones, are frustrated with technology they really can't use. Sometimes 
It's a lack of documentation in local languages. We heard a little bit about that this morning. And sometimes it's that smartphone app in a dumb phone world. Right now, too much peace tech gets built without intimate knowledge of those local constraints. So imagine bringing together a mobile phone specialist from Motorola, an election specialist from Afghanistan to collaborate on using USIP's Preventing Election Violence curriculum and turning it into a mobile phone application for voter ed. And what we learned doing this for Afghanistan, we know we can then apply in Burma or in Nigeria or the next election in a conflict zone because we know that elections are often flashpoints for violence. We understand that as one of the causes of violence. And this needs to set the lab apart from other innovation labs around the world. Instead of creating new to the world tools, bending electrons like they do in so many other of the new innovation labs, we need to be looking for gaps that can be filled by adopting, mashing up, hacking off the self, low cost consumer technologies for local consumption. And we'll also be nurturing other builders to do exactly the same by providing startup grants as well as space for incubating peace tech startups who can prototype this in with this input we can provide from the field. Finally, the fourth pillar of the peace tech lab, and really our most important one, really, the North Star for what we're going to be doing, and kind of the subtext from so much of what was talked about here today. That's inspire, as in inspire an industry. Or put another way, we need to scale this work far beyond the projects that we've got listed there, the projects that we showed earlier, that we had earlier in the lightning rounds. As one of our leading activists in this field, Hel Helena Puge put it, co-founder of the Build Peace Conference, she wrote, pilot projects are popular and common in, tech for the, in, in the tech for peace field. Great for uncovering new ideas, but most don't have rigorous measures and often lack the support to scale up. So how do we change this and scale up to realize the potential impact of peace tech? Let me suggest that the answer is not where you'd expect. It was about 100 years ago that the US government turned for help to the private sector and specifically to research labs like those pioneered by Thomas Edison, George Westinghouse, because the tools of national defense, from automatic firearms and mechanized armor to aircraft and missiles, they required increasingly specialized knowledge and technology in order to build them. And the defense industry was born. But today's conflicts require a different kind of strategy and a different kind of specialized knowledge. And if you don't believe me, listen to what the guys who are fighting these wars are saying. Secretary Gates, we must focus our energies beyond the guns and steels, a steel of the military. Admiral Mullen, US foreign policy is still too dominated by the military, too dependent upon the generals and admirals. General Petraeus, any conceivable operation in the future is still going to have to support the establishment of local governance, rule of law capability, foster economic development, counter corruption, train host nation security forces, and reintegrate reconcilable belligerents. These leaders and many others are asking really tough questions, important questions, about why we're spending over $2 trillion in Iraq and Afghanistan, and that's really a fairly conservative estimate, and not getting the results we all want. They know that conflicts are increasingly localized, fragmented, and culturally specific, and yet, how do we seek to resolve them? Some say, follow the money. $500 billion for defense, 46.2 billion for both diplomacy and development. Whoa, 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 whoa. Don't forget the annual appropriations of the nation's Global Conflict Management Center, USIP. Did you, see, did you catch that? Did you see the move? If you, if you blinked, you might have missed our 39, 39 million there. As a nation, our predominant method of conflict resolution is still war tech. And it hasn't been working. The alternative, as Secretary Gates and Admiral Mullins suggest, 
is to shift our focus beyond the guns and steel to a strategy like P-TECH, Peace Tech, that is, a much lower investment of capital than conventional war fighting. That's built by entrepreneurs themselves from the conflict zones. That's self-organized and mobilized by sheer necessity. And that's adaptable and deployable and rapidly deployable according to changing local conditions. Now, some of you might think that what I'm suggesting here is that we redirect monies from the defense budget into things like the Peace Tech Lab, and I am not, though I wouldn't say no to a billion or two. Um, and I'm quite sure, by the way, that by demonstrating greater success in preventing conflict as a field than we have to date through initiatives like the Peace Tech Lab, that we will attract greater government funding and grow the pie for the peace tech field in general. I'm sure of that. But more government funding is not a viable strategy in today's world. Actually, we're suggesting something really different, that we develop the peace tech lab from the very start in order to learn from what DOD has done with unparalleled success, and that is they spawned an industry. What can we learn from one of the most enduring partnerships in history between the military and the private sector in order to inspire this, the peace tech industry. Why, for example, did governments continue to invest in private sector defense contractors even after the major wars were over? One reason I already mentioned it was that specialized technology that was required, but the other factor was even more powerful. And again, it's kind of been the subtext of a lot of things people have said today. Because the defense industry became a major employer in nearly every part of America. And when an industry puts people to work, governments and corporations, large and small, invest in it. So let's think of the Peace Tech Lab as a way to inspire an industry where people innovate and build products that both save lives and alleviate unemployment, which as you've heard today is currently of epidemic proportions in most conflict zones, particularly among young men. Creating such an industry obviously begins like any other, that is identifying critical needs and the buyers who are willing to pay for the products and services that meet those needs. So what kinds of critical needs do Peace Tech products and services meet, right? This is all about buyers and sellers. And what I said earlier, the three big business lines would be tech, media, and data. So data, think about that. The conflict zone data the lab collects in order to analyze and better anticipate violence during the elections in, say, Nigeria or Congo. That information has a great deal of value to companies like Shell or Chevron that are doing business there, or in HP and Intel who need to know about their supply chains and getting minerals out of the ground. When it comes to tech, the peace tech industry might create mobile dev devices that can protect local activists from the prying eyes of dictators. In fact, we're already seeing some really, really innovative um, in, uh, products coming out of the peace tech field to do that. You may have heard of the Librio tablet, the Guardian project uh, developed the Librio tablet to allow activists to surf the web anonymously and safely. Why not think about making those products available in Best Buy? Media. The peace tech field has already launched a number of successful TV and radio shows. Just ask Search for Common Ground about their hit show Nashimalo in the Balkans or the team in Kenya. USIP has One Village, A Thousand Voices, our radio drama in Afghanistan that's doing very well, and Sawa Shabab in South Sudan. And we've got a reality TV show in Iraq. Why not think about marketing strategies behind them, just like those used by other nonprofit media companies that are intent on social change and making money? Sesame Workshops come to mind. National Geographic is another. I could go on and on because these three business lines have countless products and services within them and customers who are willing to pay for them. We just haven't thought about it this way yet. And that's one of the things we will be doing in the lab. 
So, now you see our plan for world domination, and it begins with a Peace Tech Lab that's designed specifically to bolster the impact of the Peace Tech potential that we know, we all know is there. A lab that's designed for, specifically for the nature of conflict today, a world where anyone can send information around the globe with a push of a, glut, uh, with a, push of a button using those cell phones that it are nearly ubiquitous. Even in Afghanistan, where there's 65% illiteracy, 72% cell phone penetration. Folks have been talking about that all day. A world where not only are mobile phones ubiquitous, but the barriers to entrepreneurship are, fa are falling. You heard about the use of Kickstarter to raise money. Uh, I saw a $35,000 Kickstarter campaign to start a hackerspace in Baghdad. A lab that's designed for, sorry, a lab that's designed for those four principles. Convene for radical collaboration, connect for speed and agility, build for local adoption, and inspire a global industry. We actually have a good foundation. The team here has already begun to build the largest online network of young Iraqi peace builders to design. They've also worked on designing tools to crowd map attacks on journalists. They're working with local Burmese to develop systems to track and counter hate speech. But we know we have a long way to go to scale this kind of work as we've been describing. And we're going to need a lot of help to do that. So we invite you, go to that URL, um, you'll be able to see how to get in touch with us to provide your input, to provide your ideas, to ask questions, contact us about the Peace Tech Lab. As I said, we need you to join us in creating the Peace Tech Lab as well as in starting to create a global industry. Thank you all for listening. Thank you all for being here. It's been a long day, I know that. Thank you all for being here today. And with that, I hope I'm going to get you out for happy hour. Thanks very much. <laughs>